Section 33 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors. Section 33. Selected Excerpts, by Ferdinand Brunetier. Ferdinand Brunetier, 1849, by Adolf Cohn. Ferdinand Brunetier, the celebrated French literary critic, was born in Toulon, the great military Mediterranean seaport of France, in the year 1849. His studies were begun in the college of his native city, and continued in Paris in the Lycée Louis Le Grand, where in the class of philosophy he came under Professor Émile Charles, by whose original and profound, though decidedly sad way of thinking, he was powerfully influenced. His own ambition then was to become a teacher in the University of France, an ambition which seemed unlikely to be ever realised, as he failed to secure admission to the celebrated École Normale Supérieure in the competitive examination which leads up to that school. Strangely enough, about fifteen years later, he was, though not in possession of any very high university degree, appointed to the professorship of French literature in the school which he had been unable to enter as a scholar, and his appointment received the hearty endorsement of all the leading educational authorities in France. For several years, after leaving the lycée Louis Le Grand, while completing his literary outfit by wonderfully extensive reading, Ferdinand Brunetier lived on stray orders for work for publishers. He seldom succeeded in getting these, and when he got any they were seldom filled. Thus he happened to be commissioned by the firm of Germain, Bellier and Company, to write a history of Russia, which never was, and to all appearances never will be written. The event which determined the direction of his career was the acceptance by the Revue des Deux Mondes in 1875 of an article upon contemporary French novelists. François Boulot, the energetic and imperious founder and editor of the world-famed French bi-monthly, felt that he had found in the young critic the man whom French literary circles had been waiting for, and who was to be saint Beuve's successor. And François Boulot was a man who seldom made mistakes. French literary criticism was just then at a very low ebb. saint Beuve had been dead about five years. His own contemporaries, Edmond Scherer, for instance, were getting old and discouraged. The new generation seemed to be turning unanimously in consequence of the disasters of the Franco-German War and of the Revolution of September 1870 to military or political activity. The only form of literature which had power to attract young writers was the novel, which they could fill with the description of all the passions then agitating the public mind. That a man of real intellectual strength should then give his undivided attention to pure literature seemed a most unlikely phenomenon. But all had to acknowledge that the unlikely had happened soon after Ferdinand Brunetier had become the regularly literary critic of the Revue des Deux Mondes. Fortunately, the new critic did not undertake to walk in the footsteps of saint Beuve. In the art of presenting to the reader the marrow of a writer's work, of making the writer himself known by the description of his surroundings, the narrative of his life, 
the study of the forces by which he was influenced, the illustrious author of the Causerie du Lundi remains to this day without a rival or a continuator. Ferdinand Brunetier had a different conception of the duties of a literary critic. The one fault with which thoughtful readers were apt to charge Saint-Beuve was that he failed to pass judgment upon the works and writers, and this failure was often, and not altogether unjustly, ascribed to a certain weakness in his grasp of principles, a certain faint-heartedness whenever it became necessary to take sides. Any one who studies Brunetier can easily see that from the start his chief concern was to make it impossible for any one to charge him with the same fault. He came in with a set of principles which he has since upheld with remarkable steadfastness and courage. In an age when nearly every one was turning to the future and advocating the doctrine and the necessity of progress, when the chief fear of most men was that they should appear too much afraid of change, Brunetier proclaimed time and again that there was no safety for any nation or set of men except in a staunch adherence to tradition. He bade his readers turn their minds away from the current literature of the day and take hold of the exemplars of excellence handed down to us by the great men of the past. Together with tradition, he upheld authority, and therefore preferred to all others the period in which French literature and society had most willingly submitted to authority, that is, the seventeenth century and the reign of Louis the Fourteenth. When compelled to speak of the literature of the day, he did it in no uncertain tones. His book, The Naturalistic Novel, consists of a series of articles in which he studies Zola and his school, upholding the old doctrine that there are things in life which must be kept out of the domain of art, and cannot be therein introduced without lowering the ideal of man. Between the naturalistic and the idealistic novel, he unhesitatingly declares for the latter, and places Georges Sand far above the author of La Sommoire but the great success of his labours cannot be said to have been due solely or even mainly to the principles he advocated. Other critics have appeared since M. Jules Lemaitre and Anatole France, for instance, who antagonise almost everything that he defends, and defend almost everything that he antagonises, and whose success has hardly been inferior to his. Neither is it due to any charm in his style. Brunetier's sentences are compact, indeed strongly knit together, but decidedly heavy, and at times even clumsy. What he has to say he always says strongly, but not gracefully. He has a remarkable appreciation of the value of the words of the French language, but his arrangement of them is seldom free from mannerisms. What, then, has made him the foremost literary critic of the present day? The answer is knowledge and sincerity. No writer of the present day, save perhaps Anatole France, is so accurately informed of every fact that bears upon literary history. Every argument he brings forward is supported by an array of incontrovertible facts that is simply appalling. No one can argue with him who does not first subject himself to the severest kind of training go through a mass of tedious reading, become familiar with dates to the point of handling them as nimbly as a bank clerk handles the figures of a checklist. And all this comes forward in Brunetier's articles in the most natural, we had almost said casual, way. The fact takes its place unheralded in the reasoning. It is there because it has to be there, not because the writer wishes to make a display of his wonderful knowledge, and thus it happens that Ferdinand Brunetier's literary articles are perhaps the most instructive ones ever written in the French language. They are, moreover, admirably trustworthy. It would never come to this author's mind to hide a fact that goes against any of his theories. He feels so sure of being in the right that he is always willing to give his opponents all that they can possibly claim. 
Of late years, moreover, it must be acknowledged that Brunetier's mind has given signs of remarkable broadening. Under the influence of the doctrine of evolution, he has undertaken to class all literary facts, as the great naturalists of the day have classed the facts of physiology, and to show that literary forms spring from each other by way of transformation, in the same way as do the forms of animal or vegetable life. Already three works have been produced by him since he entered upon this new line of development. A history of literary criticism in France, which forms the first and hitherto only published volume of a large work, The Evolution of Literary Forms, a work on the French drama, The Periods of the French Theatre, and a treatise on modern French poetry, The Evolution of French Lyric Poetry during the nineteenth century. The second and last of these were first delivered by their author from the professor's chair or the lecturer's platform, where he has managed to display some of the greatest gifts of the public speaker. Most of M. Brunetier's literary articles have been collected in book form under the following titles. Questions of Criticism, two volumes. History and Criticism, three volumes. Critical Studies on the History of French Literature, six volumes. The Naturalistic Novel, one volume. At various times, remarkable addresses have been delivered by him on public occasions, in which he has often represented the French Academy since his election to that illustrious body. Unfortunately, his productive literary activity has slackened of late. In 1895, he was called to the editorship of the Revue des Deux Mondes, and since his assumption of this responsible editorial position, he has published only two or three articles bearing upon moral and educational questions. To pass final judgment upon a man whose development is far from completed is an almost impossible task. Still, it may be said that with the exception of saint Beuve's Casarie du Lundi, and nouveau lundi nothing exists that can teach the reader so much about the history of french literature as brunetier's works the doctrinal side to which the author himself undoubtedly attaches the greatest importance will strike the reader as often very questionable too often brunetier seems in his judgments to be quite unconsciously actuated by a dislike of the accepted opinion of the present day his love of the past bears a look of defiance of the present, not calculated to win the reader's assent. But even this does not go without its good side. It gives to Brunetier's judgments a unity which is seldom, if ever, found in the works of those whose chief labours have been spent in the often ungrateful task of making a hurried public acquainted with the uninterrupted stream of literary production. Taine and Prince Napoleon For the last five or six months, since it has been known that a prince, nephew, cousin, and son of emperors or kings, formerly very powerful, had proposed to answer the libel, as he calls it, written by Monsieur Taine about Napoleon, we have been awaiting this reply with an impatience, a curiosity, or which were equally justified although for very different reasons, by M. Taine's reputation, by the glorious name of his antagonist, by the greatness, and finally, the national interest of the subject. The book has just appeared, and if we can say without flattery that it is revealed to us in the Prince, a writer whose existence we had not suspected, it is because we must at once add that neither in its manner nor in its matter is the book itself what it might have been. Prince Napoleon did not wish to write a life of Napoleon, and nobody expected that of him, for after all, and for twenty different reasons, even had he wished it, he could not have done it. But to Monsieur Taine's Napoleon, since he did not find in him the true Napoleon, since he declared him to be as much against nature as against history, he could and we expected that he would have opposed his own Napoleon. 
by the side of the inventions of a writer whose judgment had been misled and whose conscience had been obscured by passion these are his own words he could have restored as he promised in his introduction the man and his work in their living reality and in our imaginations on which m taine's harsh and morose workmanship had engraven the features of a modern malatesta or modern Swatze, he could at last substitute for them as the inheritor of the name and the dynastic claims the image of the founder of contemporary france of the god of war unfortunately instead of doing so it is m taine himself it is his analytical method it is the witnesses whom m taine chose as his authorities that prince napoleon preferred to assail as a scholar in an academy who descants upon the importance of the genuineness of a text and moreover with a freedom of utterance and a pertness of expression which on any occasion i should venture to pronounce decidedly insulting for it is a misfortune of princes when they do us the honour of discussing with us that they must observe a moderation a reserve a courtesy greater even than our own it will therefore be unanimously thought that it ill became prince napoleon to address m taine in a tone which m taine would decline to use in his answer out of respect for the very name which he is accused of slandering it will be thought also that it ill became him when speaking of mio de melito for instance or of many other servants of the imperial government to seem to ignore that princes also are under an obligation to those who have served them well perhaps even it may be thought that it poorly became him when discussing or contradicting the memoirs of madame de remusin to forget under what auspices of the remains of his uncle the emperor were years ago carried in his city of paris but what will be thought especially is that he had something else to do than to split hairs in discussion of evidences that he had something far better to say more peremptory and to the point and more literary besides than to call m taine names to hurl at him the epithets of entomologist materialist pessimist destroyer of reputations iconoclast and to class him as a déboulonneur among those who in eighteen seventy one pulled down the colonne vendome not undoubtedly that m taine and we said so ourselves more than once with perfect freedom if spending much patience and conscientiousness in his search for documents has always displayed as much critical spirit and discrimination in the use he made of them we cannot understand why in his napoleon he accepted the testimony of bourrien for instance any more than recently in his revolution that of georges duval or again in his ancien regime that of the notorious Sulavik m taine's documents as a rule are not used by him as a foundation for his argument no he first takes his position and then he consults his library or he goes to the original records with the hope of finding those documents that will support his reasoning but granting that we must own that though different from m taine's prince napoleon's historical method is not much better that though in the different manner and in the different direction it is neither less partial nor less passionate and here is a proof of it prince napoleon blames m taine for quoting eight times bourrien's memoirs and then letting his feelings loose he takes advantage of the occasion and cruelly besmirches bourrien's name does he tell the truth or not is he right at the bottom i do not know anything about it i do not wish to know anything i do not need it since i know from other sources that bourrien's memoirs are hardly less spurious than say the souvenirs of the marquise de crequy 
or the memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan. But if these so-called memoirs are really not his, what has Borian himself to do here? And suppose the former secretary of the First Consul to have been, instead of the shameless embezzler whom Prince Napoleon so fully and so uselessly describes to us, the most honest man in the world, would the memoirs be any more reliable, since it is a fact that he wrote nothing? And now I cannot but wonder at the tone in which those who contradict M. Taine, and especially Prince Napoleon himself, condescend to tell him that he lacks that which would be needed in order to speak of Napoleon or the Revolution. But who is it, then, that has what is needed in order to judge Napoleon? Frederick the Great, or Catherine the Second, perhaps, has Napoleon himself desired his peers, or, in other words, those who, born as he was for war and government, can only admire, justify, and glorify themselves in him. And who will judge the revolution? Danton, we suppose, or Robespierre, that is, the men who were the revolution itself. No, the real judge will be the average opinion of men, the force that will create, modify, correct this average opinion, the historians will be, and among the historians of our time, in spite of Prince Napoleon, it will be Monsieur Taine for a large share. The Literatures of France, England, and Germany Twice, at least, in the course of their long history, it is known that the literature and even the language of France has exerted over the whole of Europe an influence whose universal character other languages perhaps more harmonious, Italian, for instance, and other literatures more original in certain respects, like English literature, have never possessed. It is in a purely French form that our medieval poems, our chansons de geste, our romances of the round table, our fableaux themselves, whencesoever they came, Germany or Tuscany, England or Brittany, Asia or Greece, conquered, fascinated, charmed from one end of Europe to the other, the imaginations of the Middle Ages. The amorous languor on the subtlety of our courteous poetry are breathed no less by the madrigals of Shakespeare himself than by Petrarch's sonnets, and after such a long lapse of time we still discover something that comes from us even in the Wagnerian drama, for instance in Parsifal or in Tristan and Isolde. A long time later, in a Europe belonging entirely to classicism, from the beginning of the seventeenth to the end of the eighteenth century, during one hundred and fifty years or even longer, French literature possessed a real sovereignty in Italy, in Spain, in England, and in Germany. Do not the names of Algarotti, Bettinelli, Baccaria, Filengieri almost belong to France? What shall I say of the famous Gottschett? Shall I recall the fact that in his victorious struggle against Voltaire, Lessing had to call in Diderot's assistance? And who ignores that if Rivarol wrote his discourse upon the universality of the French language, it can be charged neither to his vanity nor to our national vanity, since he was himself half Italian, and the subject had been proposed by the Academy of Berlin. All sorts of reasons have been given for this universality of French literature, some were statistical, if I may say so, some geographical, political, linguistic, but the true one, the good one, is different. It must be found in the supremely sociable character of the literature itself. If at that time our great writers were understood and appreciated by everybody. It is because they were addressing everybody, or better, because they were speaking to all concerning the interests of all. They were attracted neither by exceptions nor by peculiarities. 
they cared to treat only of man in general or as is also said of the universal man restrained by the ties of human society and their very success shows that below all that distinguishes say an italian from a german this universal man whose reality has so often been discussed persists and lives and though constantly changing never loses his own likeness in comparison with the literature of france thus defined and characterized by its sociable spirit the literature of england is an individualistic literature let us put aside as should be done the generation of congreve and wycherley perhaps also the generation of pope and addison to which however we ought not to forget that swift also belonged it seems that an englishman never writes except in order to give to himself the external sensation of his own personality thence his humour which may be defined as the expression of the pleasure he feels in thinking like nobody else thence in england the plenteousness the wealth the amplitude of the lyric vein it being granted that individualism is the very spring of lyric poetry and that an ode or an elegy is as it were the involuntary surging the outflowing of what is most intimate most secret most peculiar in the poet's soul thence also the eccentricity of all the great english writers when compared with the rest of the nation as though they became conscious of themselves only by distinguishing themselves from those who claim to differ from them least but is it not possible to otherwise characterize the literature of england it will be easily conceived that i dare not assert such a thing all i say here is that i cannot better express the differences which distinguish that literature from our own that is also all i claim in stating that the essential character of the literature of germany is that it is philosophical the philosophers there are poets and the poets are philosophers goethe is to be found no more or no less in his theory of colours or in his metamorphosis of plants than in his divan or his faust and lyrism if i may use this trite expression is overflowing in schleiermacher's theology and in schelling's philosophy is this not perhaps at least one of the reasons of the inferiority of the german drama it is surely the reason of the depth and scope of germanic poetry even in the masterpieces of german literature it seems that there is mixed something indistinct or rather mysterious suggestive in the extreme which leads us to thought by the channel of the dream but who has not been struck by what under a barbarous terminology there is of attractive and as such of eminently poetical of realistic and at the same time idealistic in the great systems of kant and fichte hegel and schopenhauer assuredly nothing is further removed from the character of our french literature we can here understand what the germans mean when they charge us with a lack of depth let them forgive us if we do not blame their literature for not being the same as ours for it is good that it be thus and for five or six hundred years this it is that has made the greatness not only of european literature but of western civilization itself i mean that which all the great nations after slowly elaborating it as it were in their national isolation have afterwards deposited in the common treasury of the human race thus to this one we owe the sense of mystery and we might say the revelation of what is beautiful in that which remains obscure and cannot be grasped to another we owe the sense of art and what may be called the appreciation of the power of form a third one has handed to us what was most heroic in the conception of chivalrous honour and to another finally we owe it that we know what is both most ferocious and noblest most wholesome and most to be feared in human pride 
the share that belongs to us Frenchmen was, in the meanwhile, to bind, to fuse together, and as it were to unify, under the idea of the general society of mankind, the contradictory and even hostile elements that may have existed in all that. No matter whether our inventions and ideas were by their origin, a Latin or Romance, Celtic or Gallic Germanic even, if you please, the whole of Europe had borrowed them from us in order to adapt them to the genius of its different races, before readmitting them in our turn, before adopting them after they had been thus transformed, we asked only that they should be able to serve the progress of reason and of humanity. What was troublous in them was clarified, what was corrupting we corrected, what was local we generalized, what was excessive we brought down to the proportions of mankind. Have we not sometimes also lessened their grandeur and altered their purity? If Corneille has undoubtedly brought nearer to us the still somewhat barbaric heroes of Guillaume de Castro, La Fontaine, when imitating the author of the Decameron, has made him more indecent than he is in his own language, and if the Italians have no right to assail Moliere for borrowing somewhat from them, the English may well complain that Voltaire failed to understand Shakespeare. But it is true, none the less, that in disengaging from the particular man of the North or the South, this idea of a universal man, for which we have been so often reviled, if any one of the modern literatures has breathed in its entirety the spirit of the public wheel and of civilization, it is the literature of France, and this ideal cannot possibly be as empty as has too often been asserted, since, as I endeavoured to show, from Lisbon to Stockholm, and from Archangel to Naples, it is its manifestations that foreigners have loved to come across in the masterpieces, or better, in the whole sequence of the history of our literature. End of section 33Section 34 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 34. Selected Works by Giordano Bruno. Giordano Bruno, 1548 to 1600. Filippo Bruno, known as Giordano Bruno, was born at Nola, near Naples, in 1548. This was eight years after the death of Copernicus, whose system he eagerly espoused, and ten years before the birth of Bacon, with whom he associated in England. Of an ardent poetic temperament, he entered the Dominican order in Naples at the early age of sixteen doubtless attracted to conventional life by the opportunities of study it offered to an eager intellect. Bruno had been in the monastery nearly thirteen years when he was accused of heresy in attacking some of the dogmas of the church. He fled first to Rome and then to northern Italy, where he wandered about for three seasons from city to city, teaching and writing. In 1579 he arrived at Geneva, then the stronghold of the Calvinists. Coming into conflict with the authorities there on account of his religious opinions, he was thrown into prison. He escaped and went to Toulouse, at that time the literary centre of southern France, where he lectured for a year on Aristotle. His restless spirit, however, drove him on to Paris. Here he was made professor extraordinary at the Sorbonne. Although his teachings were almost directly opposed to the philosophic tenets of the time, attacking the current dogmas, and Aristotle, the idol of the schoolmen, Yet such was the power of Bruno's eloquence and the charm of his manner that crowds flocked to his lecture room, and he became one of the most popular foreign teachers the university had known. Under pretense of expounding the writings of Thomas Aquinas, he set forth his own philosophy. He also spoke much on the art of memory, amplifying the writings of Raymond Lully, and these principles, formulated by the monk of the 13th century, 
and taken up again by the freethinkers of the 16th, are the basis of all the present-day mnemonics. But Bruno went even further. He attracted the attention of King Henry III of France, who in 1583 introduced him to the French ambassador to England, Castelnuovo di Montvissier. Going to London, he spent three years in the family of this nobleman, more as friend than dependent. They were the happiest, or at least the most restful years of his stormy life. England was just then entering on the glorious epoch of her Elizabethan literature. Bruno came into the brilliant court circles, meeting even the Queen, who cordially welcomed all men of culture, especially the Italians. The astute monk reciprocated her goodwill by paying her the customary tribute of flattery. He won the friendship of Sir Philip Sidney, to whom he dedicated two of his books, and enjoyed the acquaintance of Spencer, Sir Fulkerville, Dyer, Harvey, Sir William Temple, Bacon, and other wits and poets of the day. At that time, somewhere about 1580, Shakespeare was still serving his apprenticeship as playwright, and had perhaps less claim on the notice of the observant foreigner than his elder contemporaries. London was still a small town where the news of the day spread rapidly, and where, no doubt, strangers were as eagerly discussed as they are now within narrow town limits. Bruno's daring speculations could not remain the exclusive property of his own coterie. And as Shakespeare had the faculty of absorbing all new ideas afloat in the air, he would hardly have escaped the influence of the teacher who proclaimed in proud self-confidence that he was come to arouse men out of their theological stagnation. His influence on Bacon is more evident, because of their friendly associations. Bruno lectured at Oxford, but the English university found less favor in his eyes than English court life. Pedantry had indeed set its fatal mark on scholarship, not only on the continent, but in England. Aristotle was still the god of the pedants of that age, and dissent from his teaching was heavily punished, for the dry dust of learning blinded the eyes of the scholastics to new truths. Bruno, the knight-errant of these truths, devoted all his life to scourging pedantry, and dissented in toto from the idol of the schools. No wonder he and Oxford did not agree together. He wittily calls her the widow of sound learning, and again, a constellation of pedantic, obstinate ignorance and presumption, mixed with a clownish incivility that would tax the patience of Job. He lashed the shortcomings of English learning in La Cena delle Ceneri, Ash Wednesday conversation. But Bruno's roving spirit, and perhaps also his heterodox tendencies, drove him at last from England, and for the next five years he roamed about Germany leading the life of the wandering scholars of the time, always involved in conflicts and controversies with the authorities, always antagonistic to public opinion. Flying in the face of the most cherished traditions, he underwent the common experience of all prophets. The minds he was bent on awakening refused to be aroused. Finally, he was invited by Zwone Mocenigo of Venice to teach him the higher and secret learning. The Venetians supposed that Bruno, with more than human erudition, possessed the art of conveying knowledge into the heads of dullards. Disappointed in this expectation, he quarrelled with his teacher, and in a spirit of revenge, picked out of Bruno's writings a mass of testimony sufficient to convict him of heresy. This he turned over to the Inquisitor at Venice. Bruno was arrested, convicted, and sent to the Inquisition in Rome. When called upon there to recant, he replied, I ought not to recant, and I will not recant. He was accordingly confined in prison for seven years, then sentenced to death. On hearing the warrant, he said, It may be that you fear more to deliver this judgment than I to bear it. On February 17, 1600, he was burned at the stake in the Campo dei Fiori at Rome. He remained steadfast to the end, saying, I die a martyr, and willingly. His ashes were cast into the Tiber. 259 years afterwards, his statue was unveiled on the very spot where he suffered, and the Italian government is bringing out, 1896, the first complete edition, the national edition of his works. In their substance, Bruno's writings belong to philosophy rather than to literature, although they are still interesting both historically and biographically as an index of the character of the man and of the temper of the time. Many of the works have either perished or, are hidden away in inaccessible archives. For two hundred years they were tabooed, and as late as 1836 forbidden to be shown in the public library of Dresden. He published twenty-five works in Latin and Italian, and left many others incomplete, for in all his wanderings he was continually writing, as the work of the great key, 
the exploration of the thirty seals, etc. The first extant work is Il Candelaggio, the taper, a comedy which in its license of language and manner vividly reflects the time. In the dedication he discloses his philosophy. Time takes away everything and gives everything. The Spaccio della Bestia Triunfante, expulsion of the triumphant beast, the most celebrated of his works, is an attack on the superstitions of the day, a curious medley of learning, imagination and buffoonery. Degli eroici furori, the heroic enthusiasts, is the most interesting to modern readers, and in its majestic exaltation and poetic imagery is a true product of Italian culture. Bruno was evidently a man of vast intellect and of immense erudition. His philosophic speculations comprehended not only the ancient thought and that current at his time, but also reached out toward the future and the result of modern science. He perceived some of the facts which were later formulated in the theory of evolution. The mind of man differs from that of lower animals and of plants not in quality, but only in quantity. Each individual is the resultant of innumerable individuals. Each species is the starting point for the next. No individual is the same today as yesterday. Not only in this divination of coming truth is he modern, but also in his methods of investigation. Reason was to him the guide to truth. In a study of him, Luce says, Bruno was a true Neapolitan child, as ardent as its soil, as capricious as its varied climate. There was a restless energy which fitted him to become the preacher of a new crusade urging him to throw a haughty defiance in the face of every authority in every country, an energy which closed his wild adventurous career at the stake. He was distinguished also by a rich fancy, a varied humor, and a chivalrous gallantry, which constantly remind us that the intellectual athlete is an Italian, and an Italian of the 16th century. A Discourse of Poets From The Heroic Enthusiasts Cicada Say, what do you mean by those who vaunt themselves of myrtle and laurel? Tansilo. Those may and do boast of the myrtle who sing of love. If they bear themselves nobly, they may wear a crown of that plant consecrated to Venus, of which they know the potency. Those may boast of the laurel who sing worthily of things pertaining to heroes, substituting heroic souls for speculative and moral philosophy praising them and setting them as mirrors and exemplars for political and civil actions. Cicada. There are then many species of poets and crowns. Tansilo. Not only as many as there are muses, but a great many more. For although genius is to be met with, yet certain modes and species of human ingenuity cannot be thus classified. Cicada. There are certain schoolmen who barely allow Homer to be a poet, and set down Virgil, Ovid, Marshall, Hesiod, Lucretius, and many others as versifiers, judging them by the rules of poetry of Aristotle. Tanzillo? Know for certain, my brother, that such as these are beasts. They do not consider that those rules serve principally as a frame for the Homeric poetry, and for others similar to it, and they set up one as a great poet, high as Homer, and disallow those of other vein and art and enthusiasm, who in their various kinds are equal, similar, or greater. Cicada, so that Homer was not a poet who depended upon rules, but was the cause of the rules, which serve for those who are more apt at imitation than invention, and they have been used by him who, being no poet, yet knew how to take the rules of Homeric poetry into service, so as to become not a poet or a Homer, but one who apes the muse of others. Tansilo, thou dost well conclude that poetry is not born in rules, or only slightly and accidentally so. The rules are derived from the poetry, and there are as many kinds and sorts of true rules as there are kinds and sorts of true poets. Cicada, how then are the true poets to be known? Tansilo, by the singing of their verses. In that singing they give delight, or they edify, or they edify and delight together. Cicada. To whom then are the rules of Aristotle useful? Tansilo. To him who, unlike Homer, Hesiod, Orpheus, and others, could not sing without the rules of Aristotle, and who, having no muse of his own, would coquette with that of Homer. Cicada. Then they are wrong, those stupid pedants of our days, 
who exclude from the number of poets those who do not use words or metaphors conformable to or whose principles are not in union with those of homer and virgil or because they do not observe the custom of invocation or because they weave one history or tale with another or because they finish the song with an epilogue on what has been said and a prelude on what is to be said and many other kinds of criticism and censure from whence it seems they would imply that they themselves if the fancy took them could be the true poets and yet in fact they are no other than worms that know not how to do anything well but are born only to gnaw and befoul the studies and labours of others and not being able to attain celebrity by their own virtue and ingenuity seek to put themselves in the front by hook or by crook through the defects and errors of others Tanzillo? there are as many sorts of poets as there are sentiments and ideas and to these it is possible to adapt garlands not only of every species of plant but also of other kinds of material so the crowns of poets are made not only of myrtle and of laurel but of vine leaves for the white wine verses and of ivy for the bacchanals of olive for sacrifice and laws of poplar of elm and of corn for agriculture of cypress for funerals and innumerable others for other occasions and if it please you also of the material signified by a good fellow when he exclaimed o friar leek o poetaster that in milan didst buckle on thy wreath composed of salad sausage and the pepper caster cicada now surely he of diverse moods which he exhibits in various ways may cover himself with the branches of different plants and may hold discourse worthily with the muses for they are his aura or comforter his anchor or support and his harbour to which he retires in times of labour of agitation and of storm hence he cries o mountain of Parnassus, where i abide muses with whom i converse fountain of helicon where i am nourished mountain that affords me a quiet dwelling-place muses that inspire me with profound doctrines fountain that cleanseth me mountain on whose ascent my heart uprises muses that in discourse revive my spirits fountain whose arbors cool my brows change my death into life my cypress to laurels and my hells into heavens that is give me immortality make me a poet render me illustrious Tanzilo? well because to those whom heaven favours the greatest evils turn to greatest good for needs or necessities bring forth labours and studies and these most often bring the glory of immortal splendour Chicada? for to die in one age makes us live in all the rest canticle of the shining ones a tribute to english women from the nolan nothing i envy jovi from this thy sky spake neptune thus and raised his lofty crest god of the waves said jovi thy pride runs high what more wouldst add to own thy stern behest thou spake the god dost rule the fiery span the circling spheres the glittering shafts of day greater am i who in the realm of man rule thames with all his nymphs in fair array in this my breast i hold the fruitful land the vasty reaches of the trembling sea and what in night's bright dome or days shall stand before these radiant maids who dwell with me not thine said jovi god of the watery mound to exceed my lot but thou my lot shall share thy heavenly maids among my stars i'll count and thou shalt own the stars beyond compare the song of the nine singers the first sings and plays the scissor o cliffs and rocks o thorny woods o shore o hills and dales o valleys rivers seas how do your new discovered beauties please o nymph tis yours the guerdon rare if now the open skies shine fair o happy wanderings well spent and o'er the second sings and plays to his mandolin o happy wanderings well spent and o'er say then o circe these heroic tears these griefs endured through tedious months and years were as a grace divine bestowed if now our weary travail is no more the third sings and plays to his lyre if now our weary travail is no more if this sweet haven be our destined rest then naught remains but to be blessed to thank our god for all his gifts who from our eyes the veil uplifts where shines the light upon the heavenly shore 
the fourth sings to the viol. Where shines the light upon the heavenly shore? O blindness, dearer far than others' sight! O sweeter grief than earth's most sweet delight! For ye have led the erring soul by gradual steps to this fair goal, and through the darkness into light we soar. The fifth sings to a Spanish timbrel. And through the darkness into light we soar. To full fruition all high thought is brought, with such brave patience that even we at least the only path can see, and in his noblest work our God adore. The six sings to a lute. And in his noblest work our God adore. God does not will joy should to joy succeed, nor ill shall be of other ill the seed. But in his hand the wheel of fate turns, now depressed and now elate, evolving day from night for evermore. The seven sings to the Irish harp. Evolving day from night for evermore. And as yon robe of glorious nightly fire pales when the morning beams to noon aspire, thus he who rules with law eternal, creating order fair diurnal, casts down the proud and doth exalt the poor. The eighth place with a violin bow. Cast down the proud and doth exalt the poor, and with an equal hand maintains the boundless worlds which he sustains, and scatters all our finite sense at thought of his omnipotence clouded a while to be revealed once more the ninth place upon the rebeck clouded a while to be revealed once more thus neither doubt nor fear avails over all the incomparable end prevails over fair champagne and mountain over river brink and fountain and over the shocks of seas and perils of the shore translation of isa blagden of immensity from fifth life of Giordano Bruno. This thou, O spirit, dost within my soul this weekly thought with thine own life amend. Rejoicing, dost thy rapid pinions lend me, and dost wing me to that lofty goal where secret portals ope and fetters break. And thou dost grant me, by thy grace complete, fortune to spurn and death. O high retreat, which few attain and fewer yet forsake girdled with gates of brass in every part prisoned and bound in vain tis mine to rise through sparkling fields of air to pierce the skies sped and accoutred by no doubting heart till raised on clouds of contemplation vast light leader law creator i attain at last life well lost winged by desire and thee o oh dear delight as still the vast and succoring air i tread so mounting still on swift opinions bed i scorn the world and heaven receives my flight and if the end of icarus be nigh i will submit for i shall know no pain and falling dead to earth shall rise again what lowly life with such high death can vie then speaks my heart from out the upper air whither dost lead me sorrow and despair attend the rash and thus i make reply fear thou no fall nor lofty ruin sent safely divide the clouds and die content when such proud death is dealt thee from on high parnassus within o heart this you my chief parnassus are where for my safety i must ever climb my winged thoughts are muses who from far bring gifts of beauty to the court of time and helicon that fair unwasted rill springs newly in my tears upon the earth and by those streams and nymphs and by that hill it pleased the gods to give a poet birth no favouring hand that comes of lofty race no priestly unction nor the grand of kings can on me lay such lustre and such grace nor add such heritage for one who sings has a crowned head and by the sacred bay his heart his thoughts his tears are consecrate alway Compensation. The moth beholds not death as forth he flies into the splendor of the living flame. The heart athirst to crystal water hies, nor heeds the shaft, nor fears the hunter's aim. The timid bird, returning from above to join his mate, deems not the net is nigh. Unto the light, the fount, and to my love, seeing the flame, the shaft, the chains, I fly so high a torch love lighted in the skies consumes my soul 
And with this bow divine Of piercing sweetness, what terrestrial vies? This net of dear delight does prison mine, And I to life's last day have this desire, Be mine thine arrows, love, and mine thy fire. Life for Song Come, muse, O oh muse, so often scorned by me, The hope of sorrow and the balm of care. Give to me speech and song, that I may be Unchid by grief. Grant me such graces rare, As other ministering souls may never see, Who boast thy laurel and thy myrtle wear. I know no joy wherein thou hast not part, My speeding wind, my anchor, and my goal. Come, fair Parnassus, lift thou up my heart, Come, Helican, renew my thirsty soul. A cypress crown, O muse, is thine to give, And pain eternal. Take this weary frame, touch me with fire, And this my death shall live, on all men's lips, And in undying fame. End of section 34section thirty five of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section thirty five william cullen bryant seventeen ninety four to eighteen seventy eight by George Parsons Lathrop. Distinguished as he was by the lofty qualities of his verse, William Cullen Bryant held a place almost unique in American literature by the union of his activity as a poet with his eminence as a citizen and an influential journalist throughout an uncommonly long career. Two traits still further define the peculiarity of his position, his precocious development and the evenness and sustained vigor of all his poetic work from the beginning to the end. He began writing verse at the age of eight. At ten he made contributions in this kind to the Country Gazette, and produced a finished and effective rhymed address, read at his school examination, which became popular for recitation. And in his thirteenth year, during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, he composed a political satire of the embargo. This being published, was at first supposed by many to be the work of a man, attracted much attention and praise, and passed into a second edition with other shorter pieces. But these, while well wrought in the formal eighteenth-century fashion, showed no special originality. It was with Thanatopsis, written in 1811, when he was only seventeen, that his career as a poet of original and assured strength began. Thanatopsis was an inspiration of the primeval woods of America, of the scenes that surrounded the writer in youth, at the same time, it expressed with striking independence and power a fresh conception of the universality of death in the natural order. As has been well said, it takes the idea of death out of its theological aspects and restores it to its proper place in the vast scheme of things. This in itself was a mark of genius in a youth of his time and place. Another American poet, Stoddard, calls it the greatest poem ever written by so young a man. The author's son-in-law and biographer, Park Godwin, remarks upon it aptly. For the first time on this continent a poem was written designed to general admiration and enduring fame. And this indeed is a very significant point, that it began the history of true poetry in the United States, a fact which further secured to Bryant his exceptional place. The poem remains a classic of the English language, and the author himself never surpassed the high mark attained in it. Although the balanced and lasting nature of his faculty is shown in a pendant to this poem, which he created in his old age and entitled The Flood of Years. The last is equal to the first in dignity and finish, but is less original, and has never gained a similar fame. Another consideration regarding Bryant is that, representing a modern development of poetry under American inspiration, he was also a descendant of the early Massachusetts colonists, being connected with the Pilgrim Fathers through three ancestral lines. Born at Cummington, Massachusetts, November 3rd, 1794, the son of a stalwart but studious country physician of literary tastes, he inherited the strong religious feeling of this ancestry, which was united in him with a deep and sensitive love of nature. This led him to reflect in his poems the strength and beauty of American landscape, vividly as it had never before been mirrored, and the blending of serious thought and innate piety 
with the sentiment for nature so reflected gave a new and impressive result like many other long-lived men bryant suffered from delicate health in the earlier third of his life there was a tendency to consumption in his otherwise vigorous family stock he read much and was interested in greek literature and somewhat influenced by it but he also lived a great deal in the open air rejoiced in the boisterous games and excursions in the woods with his brothers and sisters and took long rambles alone among the hills and wild groves being then as always afterwards an untiring walker after a stay of only seven months at williams college he studied law which he practiced for some eight years in plainfield and great barrington in the last named village he was elected a tithing man charged with the duty of keeping order in the churches and enforcing the observance of sunday chosen town clerk soon afterwards at a salary of five dollars a year he kept the records of the town with his own hand for five years and also served as justice of the peace with power to hear cases in a lower court these biographical items are of value as showing his close relation to the self-government of the people in its simpler forms and his early practical familiarity with the duties of a trusted citizen meanwhile however he kept on writing at intervals and in eighteen twenty one read before the phi beta kappa society at harvard a long poem the ages a kind of composition more in favor at that period than in later days being a general review of the progress of man in knowledge and virtue with the passage of time it has not held its own as against some of his other poems although it long enjoyed a high reputation but its success on its original hearing was the cause of his bringing together his first volume of poems hardly more than a pamphlet in the same year it made him famous with the reading public of the united states and won some recognition in england in this little book were contained besides the ages and thanatopsis several pieces which have kept their hold upon popular taste such as the well-known lines to a waterfowl and the inscription for the entrance to a wood the year of its publication also brought into the world cooper's the spy irving's sketchbook in bracebridge hall with various other significant volumes including channing's early essays and daniel webster's great plymouth oration it was evident that a native literature was dawning brightly and as bryant's productions now came into demand and he had never liked the profession of law he quitted it and went to new york in eighteen twenty five there to seek a living by his pen as a literary adventurer the adventure led to ultimate triumph but not until after a long term of dark prospects and hard struggles even in his latest years bryant used to declare that his favorite among his poems although it is one of the least known was green river perhaps because it recalled the scenes of young manhood when he was about entering the law and contrasted the peacefulness of that stream with the life in which he would be forced to drudge for the dregs of men and scrawl strange words with the barbarous pen and mingle among the jostling crowd where the sons of strife are subtle and loud this might be applied to much of his experience in new york where he edited the new york review and became one of the editors then a proprietor and finally chief editor of the evening post a great part of his energies now for many years was given to his journalistic function and to the active outspoken discussion of important political questions often in trying crises and at the cost of harsh unpopularity success financial as well as moral came to him within the next quarter century during which laborious interval he had likewise maintained his interest in work in pure literature and produced new poems from time to time in various editions from this point on until his death june twelfth eighteen seventy eight in his eighty-fourth year he was the central and commanding figure in the enlarging literary world of new york his newspaper had gained a potent reputation and had brought to bear upon public affairs strong influence of the highest sort its editorial course and tone as well as the earnest and patriotic part taken by bryant in popular questions and national affairs without political ambition or office-holding had established him as one of the most distinguished citizens of the metropolis no less than its most renowned poet his presence and cooperation were indispensable in all great public functions or humanitarian and intellectual movements in eighteen sixty four his seventieth birthday was celebrated at the century club with extraordinary honors in eighteen seventy five again the two houses of the state legislature at albany paid him the compliment unprecedented in the annals of american authorship of inviting him to a reception given to him in their official capacity another mark of the abounding esteem in which he was held among his fellow-citizens 
was the presentation to him in 1876 of a rich silver vase, commemorative of his life and works. He was now a wealthy man, yet his habits of life remained essentially unchanged. His tastes were simple, his love of nature was still ardent, his literary and editorial industry unflagging. Besides his poems, Bryant wrote two short stories for Tales of the Glauber Spa and published Letters of a Traveler in 1850, and as a result of three journeys to Europe and the Orient, together with various public addresses. His style as a writer of prose is clear, calm, dignified, and denotes exact observation and a wide range of interests. So, too, his editorial articles in the Evening Post, some of which have been preserved in his collected writings, are couched in serene and forcible English, with nothing of the sensational or the colloquial about them. They were a fitting medium of expression for his firm conscientiousness and integrity as a journalist. But it is as a poet, and especially by a few distinctive compositions, that Bryant will be most widely and deeply held in remembrance. In the midst of the exacting business of his career as an editor, and many public or social demands upon his time, he found opportunity to familiarize himself with portions of German and Spanish poetry, which he translated, and to maintain, in the quietude of his country home in Roslyn, Long Island, his old acquaintance with the Greek and Latin classics. From this continued study there resulted naturally in 1870 his elaborate translation of Homer's Iliad, which was followed by that of the Odyssey in 1871. These scholarly works, cast in strong and polished blank verse, won high praise from American critics and even achieved a popular success, although they were not warmly acclaimed in England. Among literarians they are still regarded as in a manner standards of their kind. Bryant, in his long march of over sixty-five years across the literary field, was witness to many new developments in poetic writing, in both his own and in other countries. But while he perceived the splendor and color and rich novelty of these, he held in his own work to the plain theory and practice which had guided him from the start. The best poetry, he still believed, that which takes the strongest hold of the general mind, not in one age only, but in all ages, is that which is always simple and always luminous. He did not embody in impassioned forms the sufferings, emotions, or problems of the human kind, but was disposed to generalize them, as in the journey of life, the hymn of the city, and the song of the sower. It is characteristic that two of the longer poems, Sella and The Little People of the Snow, which are narratives, deal with legends of an individual human life merging itself with the inner life of nature, under the form of imaginary beings who dwell in the snow or in water. On the other hand, one of his eulogists observes that although some of his contemporaries went much beyond him in fullness of insight and nearness to the great conflicts of the age, he has certainly not been surpassed, perhaps not been approached, by any writer since Wordsworth, in that majestic repose and that self-reliant simplicity which characterized the morning stars of song. In our country's call, however, one hears the ring of true martial enthusiasm, and there is a deep patriotic fervor in O Mother of a Mighty Race. The noble and sympathetic homage paid to the typical womanhood of a genuine woman of every day, in the conqueror's grave, reveals also great underlying warmth and sensitiveness of feeling. Robert of Lincoln and the planting of the apple tree are both touched by a lighter mood of joy in nature, which supplies a contrast to his usual pensiveness. Bryant's venerable aspect in old age, with erect form, white hair, and flowing snowy beard, give him a resemblance to Homer. There was something Homeric about his influence upon the literature of his country, in the dignity in which he invested the poetic art and the poet's relation to the people. George Parsons Lathrop All Bryant's poems were originally published by D. Appleton and Company. End of section 35 Recording by Chris Pyle Section 36 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section number 36. Poems by William Cullen Bryant. Thanatopsis. To him, who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks a various language, 
for his gayer hours she has a voice of gladness and a smile and eloquence of beauty and she glides in his darker musings with a mild and healing sympathy that steals away their sharpness ere he is aware when thoughts of the last bitter hour come like a blight over thy spirit and sad images of the stern agony and shroud and pall and breathless darkness and the narrow house make thee to shudder and grow sick at heart go forth under the open sky and list to nature's teachings while from all around earth and her waters and the depths of air comes a still voice yet a few days and thee the all-beholding sun shall see no more in all his course nor yet in the cold ground where thy pale form was laid with many tears nor in the embrace of ocean shall exist thy image earth that nourished thee shall claim thy growth to be resolved to earth again and lost each human trace surrendering up thine individual being shalt thou go to mix forever with the elements to be a brother to the insensible rock and to the sluggish clod which the rude swain turns with his share and treads upon the oak shall send his roots abroad and pierce thy mould yet not to thine eternal resting-place shalt thou retire alone nor couldst thou wish couch more magnificent thou shalt lie down with patriarchs of the infant world with kings the powerful of the earth the wise the good fair forms and hoary seers of ages past all in one mighty sepulchre the hills rock ribbed and ancient as the sun the vale stretching in pensive quietness between the venerable woods rivers that move in majesty and the complaining brooks that make the meadows green and poured round all old ocean's gray and melancholy waste are but the solemn decorations all of the great tomb of man the golden sun the planets all the infinite host of heaven are shining on the sad abodes of death through the still lapse of ages all that tread the globe are but a handful to the tribes that slumber in its bosom take the wings of morning pierce the bark and wilderness or lose thyself in the continuous woods where rolls the oregon and hears no sound save his own dashings yet the dead are there and millions in those solitudes since first the flight of years began have laid them down in their last sleep the dead reign there alone so shalt thou rest and what if thou withdraw in silence from the living and no friend take note of thy departure all that breathe will share thy destiny the gay will laugh when thou art gone the solemn brood of care plod on and each one as before will chase his favorite phantom yet all these shall leave their mirth and their employments and shall come and make their bed with thee as the long train of ages glides away the sons of men the youth in life's fresh spring and he who goes in the full strength of years matron and maid the speechless babe and the gray-headed man shall one by one be gathered to thy side by those who in their turn shall follow them so live that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable caravan which moves to that mysterious realm where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death thou go not like the quarry slave at night scourged to his dungeon but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams the crowded street let me move slowly through the street filled with an ever-shifting train amid the sound of steps that beat the murmuring walks like autumn rain how fast the flitting figures come the mild the fierce the stony face some bright with thoughtless smiles and some where secret tears have lost their trace they pass to toil to strife to rest to halls in which the feast is spread to chambers where the funeral guest in silence sits beside the dead and some to happy homes repair where children pressing cheek to cheek with mute caresses shall declare the tenderness they cannot speak and some who walk in calmness here shall shudder as they reach the door where one who made their dwelling dear its flower its light is seen no more youth with pale cheek and slender frame and dreams of greatness in thine eye ghost thou to build an early name or early in the task to die keen son of trade with eager brow who is now fluttering in thy snare thy golden fortunes tower they now or melt the glittering spires in air 
who of this crowd to-night shall tread the dance till daylight gleam again who sorrow o'er the untimely dead who writhe and throes of mortal pain some famine struck shall think how long the cold dark hours how slow the light and some who flaunt amid the throng shall hide in dens of shame to-night each where his tasks or pleasures call they pass and heed each other not there is who heeds who holds them all in his large love and boundless thought these struggling tides of life that seem in wayward aimless course to tend are eddies of the mighty stream that rolls to its appointed end the death of the flowers the melancholy days are come the saddest of the year of wailing winds and naked woods and meadows brown and sear heaped in the hollows of the grove the autumn leaves lie dead they rustle to the eddying gust and to the rabbit's tread the robin and the wren are flown and from the shrubs the jay and from the woodtop calls the crow through all the gloomy day where are the flowers the fair young flowers that lately sprang and stood in brighter light and softer airs a beauteous sisterhood alas they all are in their graves the gentle race of flowers are lying in their lowly beds with the fair and good of ours the rain is falling where they lie but in the cold november rain calls not from out the gloomy earth the lovely ones again the wind flower and the violet they perished long ago and the briar rose and the orchis died amid the summer glow but on the hills the goldenrod and the aster in the wood and the yellow sunflower by the brook in autumn beauty stood till fell the frost from the clear cold heaven as falls the plague on men and the brightness of their smile was gone from upland glade and glen and now when comes the cold mild day as still such days will come to call the squirrel and the bee from out their winter home when the sound of dropping nuts is heard though all the trees are still and twinkle in the smoky light the waters of the rill the south wind searches for the flowers whose fragrance late he bore and sighs to find them in the wood and by the stream no more and then i think of one who in her youthful beauty died the fair meek blossom that grew up and faded by my side in the cold moist earth we laid her when the forest cast the leaf and we wept that one so lovely should have a life so brief yet not unmeet it was that one like that young friend of ours so gentle and so beautiful should perish with the flowers the conqueror's grave within this lowly grave a conqueror lies and yet the monument proclaims it not nor round the sleeper's name hath chisel wrought the emblems of a fame that never dies ivy and amaranth in a graceful sheath twined with the laurel's fair imperial leaf a simple name alone to the great world unknown is graven here and wild flowers rising round meek meadows sweet and violets of the ground lean lovingly against the humble stone here in the quiet earth they laid apart no man of iron mould and bloody hands who sought to wreck upon the cowering lands the passions that consumed his restless heart but one of tender spirit and delicate frame gentlest and mean in mind of gentle womankind timidly shrinking from the breath of blame one in whose eyes the smile of kindness made its haunts like flowers by sunny brooks in may yet at the thought of others pain a shade of sweeter sadness chased the smile away nor deemed that when the hand that moulders here was raised in menace realms were chilled with fear and armies mustered at the sign as when clouds rise on clouds before the rainy east gray captains leading bands of veteran men and fiery youths to be the vultures feast not thus were waged the mighty wars that gave the victory to her who fills this grave alone her task was wrought alone the battle fought through that long strife her constant hope was stayed on god alone nor looked for other aid she met the hosts of sorrow with a look that altered not beneath the frown they wore and soon the lowering brood were tamed and took meekly her gentle rule and frowned no more her soft hand put aside the assaults of wrath and calmly broke in twain the fiery shafts of pain and rent the nets of passion from her path 
by that victorious hand despair was slain with love she vanquished hate and overcame evil with good in her great master's name her glory is not of this shadowy state glory that with the fleeting season dies but when she entered at the sapphire gate what joy was radiant in celestial eyes how heaven's bright depths with sounding welcomes rung and flowers of heaven by shining hands were flung and he who long before pain scorn and sorrow bore the mighty sufferer with aspect sweet smiled on the timid stranger from his seat he who returning glorious from the grave dragged death disarmed in chains a crouching slave see as i linger here the sun grows low cool airs are murmuring that the night is near o gentle sleeper from the grave i go consoled through sad and hope and yet in fear brief is the time i know the warfare scarce begun yet all may win the triumphs thou hast won still flows the fount whose waters strengthen thee the victors names are yet too few to fill heaven's mighty roll the glorious armory that ministered to thee is open still the battlefield once this soft turf this rivulet sands were trampled by a hurrying crowd and fiery hearts and armed hands encountered in the battle cloud ah never shall the land forget how gushed the life-blood of her brave gushed warm with hope and courage yet upon the soil they sought to save now all is calm and fresh and still alone the chirp of flitting bird and talk of children on the hill and bell of wandering kine are heard no solemn host goes trailing by the black-mouthed gun and staggering wane men start not at the battle cry oh be it never heard again soon rested those who fought but thou who minglest in the harder strife for truths which men receive not now thy warfare only ends with life a friendless warfare lingering long through weary day and weary year a wild and many weapon throng hang on thy front and flank and rear yet nerve thy spirit to the proof and blench not at thy chosen lot the timid good may stand aloof the sage may frown yet faint thou not nor heed the shaft who surely casts the foul and hissing bolt of scorn for with thy side shall dwell at last the victory of endurance born truth crushed to earth shall rise again the eternal years of god are hers but error wounded writhes in pain and dies among his worshippers yea though thou lie upon the dust when they who help thee flee in fear die full of hope and manly trust like those who fell in battle here another hand thy sword shall wield another hand the standard wave till from the trumpet's mouth is pealed the blast of triumph o'er thy grave to a waterfowl whither midst falling dew while glow the heavens with the last steps of day far through their rosy depths dost thou pursue thy solitary way vainly the fowler's eye might mark thy distant flight to do thee wrong as darkly painted on the crimson sky thy figure floats along seek'st thou the plashy brink of weedy lake on marge of river wide or where the rocking billows rise and sink on the chafed ocean side there is a power whose care teaches thy way along that pathless coast the desert and illimitable air lone wandering but not lost all day thy wings have fanned and that far height the cold thin atmosphere yet stoop not weary to the welcome land though the dark night is near and soon that toil shall end soon shalt thou find a summer home and rest and scream among thy fellows reeds shall bend soon o'er thy sheltered nest thou art gone the abyss of heaven hath swallowed up thy form yet on my heart deeply has sunk the lesson thou hast given and shall not soon depart he who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight in the long way that i must tread alone will lead my steps aright robert of lincoln merrily swinging on briar and weed near to the nest of his little dame over the mountainside or mead robert of lincoln is telling his name bobolink bobolink spink spank spink snug and safe in that nest of ours hidden among the summer flowers chee 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 
Robert of Lincoln is gaily dressed, wearing a bright black wedding coat. White are his shoulders, and white his crest. Hear him call in his merry note, Bobolink, Bobolink, Spink, Spank, Spink. Look what a nice new coat is mine, sure there was never a bird so fine. Chee, chee, chee. Robert of Lincoln's Quaker wife, pretty and quiet, with plain brown wings, passing at home a patient life, broods in the grass while her husband sings, Bobolink, Bobolink, Spink, Spank, Spink. Brood, kind creature, you need not fear, thieves and robbers while I am here. Chee, chee, chee. Modest and shy as a nun is she, one weak chirp is her only note. Braggart and prince of braggarts is he, pouring boasts from his little throat. Bobolink, bobolink, spink, spank, spink. Never was I afraid of man. Catch me, cowardly knaves, if you can. Chee, chee, chee. Six white eggs on a bed of hay, fleck with purple, a pretty sight. There as the mother sits all day, Robert is singing with all his might. Bobolink, bobolink, spink, spank, spink. Nice good wife that never goes out, keeping house while I frolic about. Chee, chee, chee. Soon as the little ones chip the shell, six wide mouths are open for food. Robert of Lincoln bestirs him well, gathering seeds for the hungry brood. Bobolink, bobolink, spink, spank, spink. This new life is likely to be hard for a gay young fellow like me. Chee, chee, chee. Robert of Lincoln at length is made, sober with work and silent with care. Off is his holiday garment laid, half forgotten that merry air. Bobolink, bobolink, spink, spank, spink. Nobody knows but my mate and I, where our nest and our nestlings lie. Chee, chee, chee. Summer wanes, the children are grown. Fun and frolic no more he knows. Robert of Lincoln's a humdrum crone. Off he flies and we sing as he goes. Bobolink, bobolink, spink, spank, spink. When you can pipe that merry old strain, Robert of Lincoln, come back again. Chee, chee, chee. 1855. June. I gazed upon the glorious sky and the green mountains round, and thought that when I came to lie at rest within the ground, twere pleasant that in flowery June, when brooks send up a cheerful tune, and groves a joyous sound, the sexton's hand my grave to make, the rich green mountain turf shall break. A cell within the frozen mould, a coffin borne through sleet, and icy clods above it rolled, while fierce the tempest beat. Away, I will not think of these. Blue be the sky and soft the breeze, earth green beneath the feet, and be the damp mould gently pressed into my narrow place of rest. There through the long, long summer hours the golden light shall lie, and thick young herbs and groups of flowers stand in their beauty by. The oriole shall build and tell his love tale close beside my cell. The idle butterfly shall rest him there, and there be heard the housewife bee and hummingbird. And what if cheerful shouts at noon come from the village scent, or songs of maids beneath the moon with fairy laughter blent? And what if, in the evening light, betrothed lovers walk in sight of my low monument? I would the lovely scene around might know no sadder sight nor sound. I know that I no more shall see the season's glorious show, nor would its brightness shine for me, nor its wild music flow. But if, around my place of sleep, the friends I love should come to weep, they might not haste to go. Soft airs and song and light and bloom shall keep them lingering by my tomb. These to their softened hearts should bear the thought of what has been, and speak of one who cannot share the gladness of the scene whose part in all the pomp that fills the circuit of the summer hills is that his grave is green, and deeply would their hearts rejoice to hear again his living voice. To the fringed gentian. Thou blossom bright with autumn dew, and colored with the heaven's own blue, that openest when the quiet light succeeds the keen and frosty night. Thou comest not when violets lean o'er wandering brooks and springs unseen, or columbines in purple dress nod o'er the ground bird's hidden nest. Thou waitest late and comest alone when woods are bare and birds are flown and frost and shortening days portend the aged year is near his end then doth thy sweet and quiet eye look through its fringes to the sky 
blue blue as if that sky let fall a flower from its cerulean wall i would that thus when i shall see the hour of death draw near to me hope blossoming within my heart may look to heaven as i depart the future life how shall i know thee in the sphere which keeps the disembodied spirits of the dead when all of thee the time could wither sleeps and perishes among the dust we tread for i shall feel the sting of ceaseless pain if there i meet thy gentle presence not nor hear the voice i love nor read again in thy serenest eyes the tender thought will not thy own meek heart demand me there that heart whose fondest throbs to me were given my name on earth was ever in thy prayer and wilt thou never utter it in heaven in meadows fanned by heaven's life-breathing wind in the resplendence of that glorious sphere and larger movements of the unfettered mind wilt thou forget the love that joined us here the love that lived through all the stormy past and meekly with my harsher nature bore and deeper grew and tenderer to the last shall it expire with life and be no more a happier lot than mine and larger light await thee there for thou hast bowed thy will in cheerful homage to the rule of right and lovest all and renderest good for ill for me the sordid cares in which i dwell shrink and consume my heart as heat the scroll and wrath has left its scar that fire of hell has left its frightful scar upon my soul yet though thou wearest the glory of the sky wilt thou not keep the same beloved name the same fair thoughtful brow and gentle eye lovelier in heaven's sweet climate yet the same shalt thou not teach me in that calmer home the wisdom that i learned so ill in this the wisdom which is love till i become thy fit companion in that land of bliss to the past thou unrelenting past stern are the fetters round thy dark domain and fetters sure and fast hold all that enter thy unbreathing reign far in thy realm withdrawn old empires sit in sullenness and gloom and glorious ages gone lie deep within the shadows of thy womb childhood with all its mirth youth manhood age that draws us to the ground and last man's life on earth glide to thy dim dominions and are bound thou hast my better years thou hast my earlier friends the good the kind yielded to thee with tears the venerable form the exalted mind my spirit yearns to bring the lost ones back yearns with desire intense and struggles hard to wring thy bolts apart and pluck thy captives thence in vain thy gates deny all passage save to those who hence depart nor to the streaming eye thou givest them back nor to the broken heart in thy abysses high beauty and excellence unknown to thee earth's wonder and her pride are gathered as the waters to the sea labors of good to man unpublished charity unbroken faith love that midst grief began and grew with years and faltered not in death full many a mighty name lurks in thy depths unuttered unrevered with thee are silent fame forgotten arts and wisdom disappeared thine for a space are they yet thou shalt yield thy treasures up at last thy gates shall yet give way thy bolts shall fall inexorable past all that of good and fair has gone into thy womb from earliest time shall then come forth to wear the glory and the beauty of its prime they have not perished no kind words remembered voices once so sweet smiles radiant long ago and features the great soul's apparent seat all shall come back each tie of pure affection shall be knit again alone shall evil die and sorrow dwell a prisoner in thy reign and then shall i behold him by whose kind paternal side i sprung and her who still and cold fills the next grave the beautiful and young end of section thirty six recording by chris pyle section thirty seven of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit 
LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 37. The Position of Women in the United States, from the American Commonwealth, by James Bryce. James Bryce, born 1838. James Bryce was born at Belfast, Ireland, of Scotch and Irish parents. He studied at the University of Glasgow, and later at Oxford, where he graduated with high honours in 1862, and where, after some years of legal practice, he was appointed Regius Professor of Civil Law in 1870. He had already established a high reputation as an original and accurate historical scholar by his prize essay on the Holy Roman Empire, 1864, which passed through many editions, was translated into German, French, and Italian, and remains today a standard work and the best-known work on the subject, Edward A. Freeman said, on the appearance of the work, that it had raised the author at once to the rank of a great historian. It has done more than any other treatise to clarify the vague notions of historians as to the significance of the imperial idea in the Middle Ages, and its importance as a factor in German and Italian politics and it is safe to say that there is scarcely a recent history of the period that does not show traces of its influence. The scope of this work, being juristic and philosophical, it does not admit of much historical narrative, and the style is lucid but not brilliant. It is not in fact as a historian that Mr. Bryce is best known, but rather as a jurist, a politician, and a student of institutions. The most striking characteristic of the man is his versatility, a quality which in his case has not been accompanied by its usual defects, for his achievements in one field seem to have made him no less conscientious in others, while they have given him that breadth of view which is more essential than any special training to the critic of men and affairs. For the ten years that followed his Oxford appointment, he contributed frequently to the magazines on geographical, social, and political topics. His vacations he spent in travel and in mountain climbing, of which he gave an interesting narrative in Transcaucasia and Ararat, 1877. In 1880 he entered active politics and was elected to Parliament in the Liberal interest. He has continued steadfast in his support of the Liberal Party and of Mr. Gladstone, whose Home Rule policy he has heartily seconded. In 1886 he became Gladstone's Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and in 1894 was appointed President of the Board of Trade. The work by which he is best known in this country, the American Commonwealth, 1888, is the fruit of his observations during three visits to the United States and of many years of study. It is generally conceded to be the best critical analysis of American institutions ever made by a foreign author. Inferior in point of style to de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, it far surpasses that book in amplitude, breadth of view, acuteness of observation, and minuteness of information, besides being half a century later in date, and therefore able to set down accomplished facts where the earlier observer could only make forecasts. His extensive knowledge of foreign countries, by divesting him of insular prejudice, fitted him to handle his theme with impartiality, and his experience in the practical workings of British institutions gave him an insight into the practical defects and benefits of ours. That he has a keen eye for defects is obvious, 
but his tone is invariably sympathetic so much so in fact that goldwin smith has accused him of being somewhat hard on england in some of his comparisons the faults of the book pertain rather to the manner than to the matter he does not mislead but sometimes wearies and in some portions of the work the frequent repetitions the massing of details and the absence of compact statement tend to obscure the general drift of his argument and to add unduly to the bulkiness of his volumes the position of women in the united states from the american commonwealth social intercourse between youths and maidens is everywhere more easy and unrestrained than in england or germany not to speak of france yet there are considerable differences between the eastern cities whose usages have begun to approximate to those of europe and other parts of the country in the rural districts and generally all over the west young men and girls are permitted to walk together drive together go out to parties and even to public entertainments together without the presence of any third person who can be supposed to be looking after or taking charge of the girl so a girl may if she pleases keep up a correspondence with a young man nor will her parents think of interfering she will have her own friends who when they call at her house ask for her and are received by her it may be alone because they are not deemed to be necessarily the friends of her parents also nor even of her sisters in the cities of the atlantic states it is now thought scarcely correct for a young man to take a young lady out for a solitary drive and in few sets would he be permitted to escort her alone to the theatre but girls still go without chaperones to dances the hostess being deemed to act as chaperone for all her guests and as regards both correspondence and the right to have one's own circle of acquaintances the usage even of new york or boston allows more liberty than does that of london or edinburgh it was at one time and it may possibly still be not uncommon for a group of young people who know one another well to make up an autumn party in the woods they choose some mountain and forest region such as the adirondack wilderness west of lake champlain engage three or four guides embark with guns and fishing rods tents blankets and a stock of groceries and pass in boats up the rivers and across the lakes of this wild country through sixty or seventy miles of trackless forest to their chosen camping ground at the foot of some tall rock that rises from the still crystal of the lake here they build their bark hut and spread their beds of the elastic and fragrant hemlock boughs the youths roam about during the day tracking the deer the girls read and work and bake the corn cakes at night there is a merry gathering round the fire or a row in the soft moonlight on these expeditions brothers will take their sisters and cousins who bring perhaps some lady friends with them the brothers friends will come too and all will live together in a fraternal way for weeks or months though no elderly relative or married lady be of the party there can be no doubt that the pleasure of life is sensibly increased by the greater freedom which transatlantic custom permits and as the americans insist that no bad results have followed one notes with regret that freedom declines in the places which deem themselves most civilized american girls have been so far as a stranger can ascertain less disposed to what are called fast ways than girls of the corresponding classes in england 
and exercise in this respect a pretty rigorous censorship over one another. But when two young people find pleasure in one another's company, they can see as much of each other as they please, can talk and walk together frequently, can show that they are mutually interested, and yet need have little fear of being misunderstood either by one another or by the rest of the world. It is all a matter of custom. In the West, custom sanctions this easy friendship. In the Atlantic cities, so soon as people have come to find something exceptional in it, constraint is felt, and a conventional etiquette, like that of the old world, begins to replace the innocent simplicity of the older time the test of whose merit may be gathered from the universal persuasion in america that happy marriages are in the middle and upper ranks more common than in europe and that this is due to the ampler opportunities which young men and women have of learning one another's characters and habits before becoming betrothed most girls have a larger range of intimate acquaintances than girls have in europe intercourse is franker there is less difference between the manners of home and the manners of general society the conclusions of a stranger are in such matters of no value so i can only repeat that i have never met any judicious american lady who however well she knew the old world did not think that the new world customs conduced more both to the pleasantness of life before marriage and to constancy and concord after it in no country are women and especially young women so much made of the world is at their feet society seems organized for the purpose of providing enjoyment for them parents uncles aunts elderly friends even brothers are ready to make their comfort and convenience bend to the girl's wishes the wife has fewer opportunities for reigning over the world of amusements because except among the richest people she has more to do in household management than in england owing to the scarcity of servants but she holds in her own house a more prominent if not a more substantially powerful position than in england or even in france with the german hausfrau who is too often content to be a mere housewife there is of course no comparison the best proof of the superior place american ladies occupy is to be found in the notions they profess to entertain of the relations of an english married pair they talk of the english wife as little better than a slave declaring that when they stay with English friends, or receive an English couple in America, they see the wife always deferring to the husband, and the husband always assuming that his pleasure and convenience are to prevail. The European wife, they admit, often gets her own way, but she gets it by tactful arts, by flattery, or wheedling, or playing on the man's weaknesses whereas in America the husband's duty and desire is to gratify the wife and render to her those services which the English tyrant exacts from his consort. One may often hear an American matron commiserate a friend who has married in Europe, while the daughters declare in chorus that they will never follow the example. Laughable as all this may seem to English women, it is perfectly true that the theory as well as the practice of conjugal life is not the same in America as in England. There are overbearing husbands in America, but they are more condemned by the opinion of the neighbourhood than in England. There are exacting wives in England, but their husbands are more pitied than would be the case in America. In neither country can one say that the principle of perfect equality reigns, 
for in america the balance inclines nearly though not quite as much in favour of the wife as it does in england in favour of the husband no one man can have a sufficiently large acquaintance in both countries to entitle his individual opinion on the results to much weight so far as i have been able to collect views from those observers who have lived in both countries they are in favour of the american practice perhaps because the theory it is based on departs less from pure equality than does that of england these observers do not mean that the recognition of women as equals or superiors makes them any better or sweeter or wiser than english women but rather that the principle of equality by correcting the characteristic faults of men and especially their selfishness and vanity is more conducive to the concord and happiness of a home they conceive that to make the wife feel her independence and responsibility more strongly than she does in europe tends to brace and expand her character while conjugal affection usually stronger in her than in the husband inasmuch as there are fewer competing interests saves her from abusing the precedence yielded to her this seems to be true but i have heard others maintain that the american system since it does not require the wife habitually to forego her own wishes tends if not to make her self-indulgent and capricious yet slightly to impair the more delicate charms of character as it is written it is more blessed to give than to receive a european cannot spend an evening in an american drawing-room without perceiving that the attitude of men to women is not that with which he is familiar at home the average european man has usually a slight sense of condescension when he talks to a woman on serious subjects even if she is his superior in intellect in character in social rank he thinks that as a man he is her superior and consciously or unconsciously talks down to her she is too much accustomed to this to resent it unless it becomes tastelessly palpable such a notion does not cross an american's mind he talks to a woman just as he would to a man of course with more deference of manner and with a proper regard to the topics likely to interest her but giving her his intellectual best addressing her as a person whose opinion is understood by both to be worth as much as his own similarly an american lady does not expect to have conversation made to her it is just as much her duty or pleasure to lead it as the man's is and more often than not she takes the burden from him darting along with a gay vivacity which puts to shame his slower wits it need hardly be said that in all cases where the two sexes come into competition for comfort the provision is made first for women in railroads the end car of the train being that furthest removed from the smoke of the locomotive is often reserved for them though men accompanying a lady are allowed to enter it and at hotels their sitting-room is the best and sometimes the only available public room ladyless guests being driven to the bar or the hall in omnibuses and horse-cars tram-cars it was formerly the custom for a gentleman to rise and offer his seat to a lady if there were no vacant place this is now less universally done in new york and boston and i think also in san francisco i have seen the men keep their seats when ladies entered and i recollect one occasion when the offer of a seat to a lady was declined by her on the ground that as she had chosen to enter a full car she ought to take the consequences 
it was i was told in boston a feeling of this kind that had led to the discontinuance of the old courtesy when ladies constantly pressed into the already crowded vehicles the men who could not secure the enforcement of the regulations against overcrowding tried to protect themselves by refusing to rise it is sometimes said that the privileges yielded to american women have disposed them to claim as a right what was only a courtesy and have told unfavourably upon their manners i know of several instances besides this one of the horse-cars which might seem to support the criticism but cannot on the whole think it well founded the better-bred women do not presume on their sex and the area of good breeding is always widening it need hardly be said that the community at large gains by the softening and restraining influence which the reverence for womanhood diffuses nothing so quickly incenses the people as any insult offered to a woman wife beating and indeed any kind of rough violence offered to women is far less common among the rudest class than it is in england field work or work at the pit mouth of mines is seldom or never done by women in america and the american traveller who in some parts of europe finds women performing severe manual labour is revolted by the sight in a way which europeans find surprising in the farther west that is to say beyond the mississippi in the rocky mountain and pacific states one is much struck by what seems the absence of the humblest class of women the trains are full of poorly dressed and sometimes though less frequently rough-mannered men one discovers no women whose dress or air marks them out as the wives daughters or sisters of these men and wonders whether the male population is celibate and if so why there are so many women closer observation shows that the wives daughters and sisters are there only their attire and manner are those of what europeans would call middle class and not working class people this is partly due to the fact that western men affect a rough dress still one may say that the remark is often made that the masses of the american people correspond to the middle class of europe it is more true of the women than of the men and is more true of them in the rural districts and in the west than it is of the inhabitants of atlantic cities i remember to have been dawdling in a bookstore in a small town in oregon when a lady entered to inquire if a monthly magazine whose name was unknown to me had yet arrived when she was gone I asked the salesman who she was, and what was the periodical she wanted. He answered that she was the wife of a railway workman, that the magazine was a journal of fashions, and that the demand for such journals was large and constant among women of the wage-earning class in the town. This set me to observing female dress more closely, and it turned out to be perfectly true that the women in these little towns were following the Parisian fashions very closely, and were in fact ahead of the majority of English ladies belonging to the professional and mercantile classes. Of course, in such a town as I refer to, there are no domestic servants except in the hotels, indeed almost the only domestic service to be had in the pacific states was till very recently that of chinese so these votaries of fashion did all their own housework and looked after their own babies three causes combine to create among american women an average of literary taste and influence higher than that of women in any european country these are the educational facilities they enjoy, the recognition of the equality of the sexes in the whole social and intellectual sphere, and the leisure which they possess as compared with men. 
in a country where men are incessantly occupied at their business or profession the function of keeping up the level of culture devolves upon women it is safe in their hands they are quick and keen-witted less fond of open-air life and physical exertion than english women are and obliged by the climate to pass a greater part of their time under shelter from the cold of winter and the sun of summer for music and for the pictorial arts they do not yet seem to have formed so strong a taste as for literature partly perhaps owing to the fact that in america the opportunities of seeing and hearing masterpieces except indeed operas are rarer than in europe but they are eager and assiduous readers of all such books and periodicals as do not presuppose special knowledge in some branch of science or learning while the number who have devoted themselves to some special study and attained proficiency in it is large the fondness for sentiment especially moral and domestic sentiment which is often observed as characterizing american taste in literature seems to be mainly due to the influence of women for they form not only the larger part of the reading public but an independent-minded part not disposed to adopt the canons laid down by men and their preferences count for more in the opinions and predilections of the whole nation than is the case in england similarly the number of women who write is infinitely larger in america than in europe fiction essays and poetry are naturally their favorite provinces in poetry more particularly many whose names are quite unknown in europe have attained widespread fame some one may ask how far the differences between the position of women in america and their position in europe are due to democracy or if not to this then to what other cause they are due to democratic feeling in so far as they spring from the notion that all men are free and equal possessed of certain inalienable rights and owing certain corresponding duties this root idea of democracy cannot stop at defining men as male human beings any more than it could ultimately stop at defining them as white human beings for many years the americans believed in equality with the pride of discoverers as well as with the fervor of apostles accustomed to apply it to all sorts and conditions of men they were naturally the first to apply it to women also not indeed as respects politics but in all the social as well as legal relations of life democracy is in america more respectful of the individual less disposed to infringe his freedom or subject him to any sort of legal or family control than it has shown itself in continental europe and this regard for the individual inured to the benefit of women of the other causes that have worked in the same direction two may be mentioned one is the usage of the congregationalist presbyterian and baptist churches under which a woman who is a member of the congregation has the same rights in choosing a deacon elder or pastor as a man has another is the fact that among the westward moving settlers women were at first few in number and were therefore treated with special respect the habit then formed was retained as the communities grew and propagated itself all over the country what have been the results on the character and usefulness of women themselves favorable they have opened to them a wider life and more variety of career while the special graces of the feminine character do not appear to have suffered there has been produced a sort of independence and a capacity for self-help which are increasingly valuable as the number of unmarried women increases more resources are open to an american woman who has to lead a solitary life not merely in the way of employment but for the occupation of her mind and tastes than to a european spinster or widow 
while her education has not rendered the American wife less competent for the discharge of household duties. How has the nation at large been affected by the development of this new type of womanhood, or rather perhaps of this variation on the English type? If women have on the whole gained, it is clear that the nation gains through them. As mothers, they mould the character of their children, while the function of forming the habits of society and determining its moral tone rests greatly in their hands. But there is reason to think that the influence of the American system tells directly for good upon men as well as upon the whole community. Men gain in being brought to treat women as equals rather than as graceful playthings or useful drudges. The respect for women which every American man either feels or is obliged by public sentiment to profess has a wholesome effect on his conduct and character and serves to check the cynicism which some other peculiarities of the country foster. The nation as a whole owes to the active benevolence of its women and their zeal in promoting social reforms, benefits which the customs of continental Europe would scarcely have permitted women to confer. Europeans have of late years begun to render a well-deserved admiration to the brightness and vivacity of American ladies. Those who know the work they have done and are doing in many a noble cause will admire still more their energy, their courage, their self-devotion. No country seems to owe more to its women than America does nor to owe to them so much of what is best in social institutions and in the beliefs that govern conduct. By permission of James Bryce and the Macmillan Company. End of section 37. Section 38 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors, Section 38, The Ascent of Ararat, and the Work of the Roman Empire, by James Bryce. The Ascent of Ararat, from Transcaucasia and Ararat. About 1 a.m. we got off, 13 in all, and made straight across the grassy hollows for the ridges which trend up towards the Great Cone, running parallel in a west-northwesterly direction, and enclosing between them several long, narrow depressions, hardly deep enough to be called valleys. The Kurds led the way, and at first we made pretty good progress, the Cossacks seemed fair walkers, though less stalwart than the Kurds. The pace generally was better than that with which Swiss guides start. However, we were soon cruelly undeceived. In twenty-five minutes there came a steep bit, and at the top of it they flung themselves down on the grass to rest. So did we all. Less than half a mile farther, down they dropped again, and this time we were obliged to give the signal for resuming the march. In another quarter of an hour they were down once more, and so it continued for the rest of the way. Every ten minutes walking, it was seldom steep enough to be called actual climbing, was followed by seven or eight minutes of sitting still, smoking and chattering. 
how they did chatter. It was to no purpose that we continued to move on when they sat down, or that we rose to go before they had sufficiently rested. They looked at one another, so far as I could make out by the faint light, and occasionally they laughed, but they would not and did not stir till such time as pleased themselves. We were helpless, impossible to go on alone, impossible also to explain to them why every moment was precious, for the acquaintance who had acted as interpreter had been obliged to stay behind at Sardarbulak, and we were absolutely without means of communication with our companions. One could not even be angry, had there been any use in that, for they were perfectly good-humoured. It was all very well to beckon them, or pull them by the elbow, or clap them on the back. They thought this was only our fun, and sat still and chattered all the same. When it grew light enough to see the hands of a watch, and mark how the hours advanced, while the party did not, we began for a second time to despair of success. About three a.m., there suddenly sprang up from behind the Median mountains the morning star, shedding a light such as no star ever gave in these northern climes of ours, a light that almost outshone the moon. An hour later, it began to pale in the first faint flush of yellowish light that spread over the eastern heaven, and first the rocky masses above us, then little Ararat, throwing behind him a gigantic shadow. Then the long lines of mountains beyond the Araxes became revealed, while the wide Araxes plain still lay dim and shadowy below. One by one the stars died out as the yellow turned to a deeper glow that shot forth in long streamers, the rosy fingers of the dawn from the horizon to the zenith. Cold and ghostly lay the snows on the mighty cone, till at last there came upon their topmost slope, six thousand feet above us, a sudden blush of pink. Swiftly it floated down the eastern face, and touched and kindled the rocks just above us. Then the sun flamed out, and in a moment the Araxes Valley and all the hollows of the savage ridges we were crossing were flooded with overpowering light. It was nearly six o'clock, and progress became easier now that we could see our way distinctly. The Cossacks seemed to grow lazier, halting as often as before, and walking less briskly. In fact, they did not relish the exceeding roughness of the jagged lava ridges, along whose tops or sides we toiled. I could willingly have lingered here myself, for in the hollows, wherever a little soil appeared, some interesting plants were growing, whose similarity to, and difference from the alpine species of Western Europe alike, excited one's curiosity. Time allowed me to secure only a few. I trusted to get more on the way back, but this turned out to be impossible. As we scrambled along a ridge above a long, narrow, winding glen filled with loose blocks, one of the Kurds suddenly swooped down like a vulture from the height on a spot at the bottom, and began peering and grubbing among the stones. In a minute or two he cried out, and the rest followed. He had found a spring, and by scraping in the gravel had made a tiny basin out of which we could manage to drink a little. Here was a fresh cause of delay. Everybody was thirsty, and everybody must drink. Not only the water which, as we afterwards saw, trickled down hither under the stones from a snow-bed seven hundred feet higher, but the water mixed with some whiskey from a flask my friend carried which, even in this highly diluted state, the Cossacks took to heartily. When at last we got them up and away again, they began to waddle and strangle. After a while, two or three sat down, 
and plainly gave us to see they would go no farther. By the time we had reached a little snow-bed, whence the now strong sun was drawing a stream of water, and halted on the rocks beside it for breakfast, there were only two Cossacks and the four Kurds left with us, the rest having scattered themselves about somewhere lower down. We had no idea what instructions they had received, nor whether indeed they had been told anything, except to bring us as far as they could, to see that the Kurds brought the baggage, and to fetch us back again, which last was essential for Jafar's peace of mind. We concluded, therefore, that if left to themselves they would probably wait our return, and the day was running on so fast that it was clear there was no more time to be lost in trying to drag them along with us. Accordingly, I resolved to take what I wanted in the way of food and start at my own pace. My friend, who carried more weight and had felt the want of training on our way up, decided to come no farther, but wait about here and look out for me towards nightfall. We noted the landmarks carefully, the little snow-bed, the head of the glen covered with reddish masses of stone and gravel, and high above it, standing out of the face of the great cone of Ararat, a bold peak, or rather projecting tooth of black rock, which our Cossacks called the monastery, and which, I suppose from the same fancied resemblance to a building, is said to be called in Tatar, Tak Kilisa, the church rock. It is doubtless an old cone of eruption, about 13,000 feet in height, and is really the upper end of the long ridge we had been following, which may perhaps represent a lava flow from it, or the edge of a fissure, which at this point found a vent. It was an odd position to be in, guides of two different races, unable to communicate either with us or with one another, guides who could not lead and would not follow, guides one half of whom were supposed to be there to save us from being robbed and murdered by the other half, but all of whom, I am bound to say, looked for the moment equally simple and friendly, the swarthy Iranian as well as the blue-eyed Slav, at eight o'clock I buckled on my canvas gaiters, thrust some crusts of bread, a lemon, a small flask of cold tea, four hard-boiled eggs, and a few meat lozenges into my pocket, bade good-bye to my friend, and set off. Rather to our surprise, the two Cossacks and one of the Kurds came with me, whether persuaded by a pantomime of encouraging signs, or simply curious to see what would happen. The ice-axe had hugely amused the Cossacks all through. Climbing the ridge to the left, and keeping along its top for a little way, I then struck across the semicircular head of a wide glen, in the middle of which, a little lower, lay a snow-bed over a long, steep slope of loose, broken stones and sand. This slope, a sort of talus or screen, as they say, in the lake country, was excessively fatiguing from the want of firm foothold, and when I reached the other side I was already so tired and breathless, having been on foot since midnight, that it seemed almost useless to persevere farther. However, on the other side I got upon solid rock, where the walking was better, and was soon environed by a multitude of rills bubbling down over the stones from the stone slopes above. The summit of Little Ararat, which had for the last two hours provokingly kept at the same apparent height above me, began to sink, and before ten o'clock I could look down upon its small flat top, studded with lumps of rock, but bearing no trace of a crater. Mounting steadily along the same ridge, I saw, at a height of over thirteen thousand feet, lying on the loose blocks, a piece of wood about four feet long and five inches thick, 
evidently cut by some tool, and so far above the limit of trees that it could by no possibility be a natural fragment of one. Darting on it with a glee that astonished the Cossack and the Kurd, I held it up to them, and repeated several times the word Noah. The Cossack grinned, but he was such a cheery, genial fellow that I think he would have grinned whatever I had said, and I cannot be sure that he took my meaning, and recognized the wood as a fragment of the true ark. Whether it was really gopher wood, of which material the ark was built, I will not undertake to say, but am willing to submit to the inspection of the curious the bit which I cut off with my ice axe and brought away. Anyhow, it will be hard to prove that it is not gopher wood. And if there be any remains of the ark on Ararat at all, a point as to which the natives are perfectly clear, here, rather than the top, is the place where one might expect to find them, since in the course of ages they would get carried down by the onward movement of the snow-beds along the declivities. This wood, therefore, suits all the requirements of the case. In fact, the argument is for the case of a relic exceptionally strong, the crusaders who found the holy lance at Antioch, the archbishop who recognized the holy coat at Treves, not to speak of many others, proceeded upon slighter evidence. I am, however, bound to admit that another explanation of the presence of this piece of timber on the rocks of this vast height did occur to me. But as no man is bound to discredit his own relic, and such is certainly not the practice of the Armenian church, I will not disturb my readers' minds or yield to the rationalizing tendencies of the age by suggesting it. Fearing that the ridge by which we were mounting would become too precipitous higher up, I turned off to the left and crossed a long, narrow snow slope that descended between this ridge and another line of rocks more to the west. It was firm and just steep enough to make steps cut in the snow comfortable, though not necessary, so the ice axe was brought into use. The Cossack who accompanied me, there was but one now, for the other Cossack had gone away to the right some time before, and was quite lost to view, had brought my friend's alpenstock, and was developing a considerable capacity for wielding it. He followed nimbly across, but the Kurd stopped on the edge of the snow, and stood, peering and hesitating, like one who shivers on the plank at a bathing place, nor could the jeering cries of the Cossack induce him to venture on the treacherous surface. Meanwhile, we who had crossed were examining the broken cliff which rose above us. It looked not exactly dangerous, but a little troublesome, as if it might want some care to get over or through. So after a short rest, I stood up, touched my Cossack's arm, and pointed upward. He reconnoitred the cliff with his eye and shook his head. Then, with various gestures of hopefulness, I clapped him on the back, and made as though to pull him along. He looked at the rocks again, and pointed to them, stroked his knees, turned up, and pointed to the soles of his boots, which certainly were suffering from the lava, and once more solemnly shook his head. This was conclusive, so I conveyed to him my pantomime that he had better go back to the bivouac where my friend was, rather than remain here alone, and that I hoped to meet him there in the evening, took an affectionate farewell, and turned towards the rocks. There was evidently nothing for it but to go on alone. It was half-past ten o'clock, and the height about thirteen thousand six hundred feet, little Ararat now lying nearly one thousand feet below the eye. Not knowing how far the ridge I was following might continue passable, I was obliged to stop frequently 
to survey the rocks above, and erect little piles of stone to mark the way. This not only consumed time, but so completely absorbed the attention, that for hours together I scarcely noticed the marvelous landscape spread out beneath, and felt the solemn grandeur of the scenery far less than many times before, on less striking mountains. Solitude at great heights, or among majestic rocks or forests, commonly stirs in us all deep veins of feeling, joyous or saddening, or more often of joy and sadness mingled. Here the strain on the observing senses seemed too great for fancy or emotion to have any scope. When the mind is preoccupied by the task of the moment, imagination is checked. This was a race against time, in which I could only scan the cliffs for a route, refer constantly to the watch, husband my strength by morsels of food taken at frequent intervals, and endeavor to conceive how a particular block or bit of slope which it would be necessary to recognize would look when seen the other way in descending. All the way up this rock slope, which proved so fatiguing that for the fourth time I had almost given up hope, I kept my eye fixed on its upper end to see what signs there were of crags or snowfields above but the mist lay steadily at the point where the snow seemed to begin, and it was impossible to say what might be hidden behind that soft white curtain. As little could I conjecture the height I had reached by looking around, as one so often does on mountain ascents, upon other summits, for by this time I was thousands of feet above Little Ararat, the next highest peak visible, and could scarcely guess how many thousands. From this tremendous height it looked more like a broken obelisk than an independent summit twelve thousand eight hundred feet in height. Clouds covered the farther side of the great snow basin, and were seething like waves about the savage pinnacles, the towers of the Jin Palace, which guard its lower margin and past which my upward path had lain. With mists to the left and above, and a range of black precipices cutting off all view to the right, there came a vehement sense of isolation and solitude, and I began to understand better the awe with which the mountain silence inspires the Kurdish shepherds. Overhead, the sky had turned from dark blue to an intense bright green, a color whose strangeness seemed to add to the weird terror of the scene. It wanted barely an hour to the time when I had resolved to turn back, and as I struggled up the crumbling rocks, trying now to right and now to left, where the foothold looked a little firmer. I began to doubt whether there was strength enough left to carry me an hour higher. At length the rock slope came suddenly to an end, and I stepped out upon the almost level snow at the top of it, coming at the same time into the clouds, which naturally clung to the colder surfaces. A violent west wind was blowing, and the temperature must have been pretty low, for a big icicle at once enveloped the lower half of my face, and did not melt till I got to the bottom of the cone four hours afterwards. Unluckily, I was very thinly clad, the stout tweed coat reserved for such occasions having been stolen on a Russian railway, the only expedient to be tried against a piercing cold was to tighten in my loose, light coat by winding around the waist a Spanish faja, or scarf, which I had brought up to use in case of need as a neck wrapper. Its bright purple looked odd enough in such surroundings, but as there was nobody there to notice, appearances did not much matter. In the mist, 
which was now thick. The eye could pierce only some thirty yards ahead, so I walked on over the snow five or six minutes, following the rise of its surface, which was gentle, and fancying there might still be a good long way to go. To mark the backward track, I trailed the point of the ice axe along behind me in the soft snow, for there was no longer any landmark. All was cloud on every side. Suddenly, to my astonishment, the ground began to fall away to the north. I stopped. A puff of wind drove off the mists on one side, the opposite side to that by which I had come, and showed the Araxes plain at an abysmal depth below. It was the top of Ararat. THE WORK OF THE ROMAN EMPIRE FROM THE HOLY ROMAN EMPIRE No one who reads the history of the last three hundred years, no one, above all, who studies attentively the career of Napoleon, can believe it possible for any state, however great her energy and material resources, to repeat in modern Europe the part of ancient Rome, to gather into one vast political body races whose national individuality has grown more and more marked in each successive age. Nevertheless, it is in great measure due to Rome and to the Roman Empire of the Middle Ages that the bonds of national union are on the whole both stronger and nobler than they were ever before. The latest historian of Rome, Momsen, after summing up the results to the world of his hero's career, closes his treatise with these words. Quote, there was in the world, as Caesar found it, the rich and noble heritage of past centuries, and an endless abundance of splendor and glory, but little soul still less taste, and least of all joy, in and through life. Truly it was an old world, and even Caesar's genial patriotism could not make it young again. The blush of dawn returns not until the night has fully descended. Yet with him there came to the much-tormented races of the Mediterranean a tranquil evening, after a sultry day, and when after long historical night the new day broke once more upon the peoples, and fresh nations, in free, self-guided movement, began their course toward new and higher aims, many were found among them in whom the seed of Caesar had sprung up, many who owed him, and who owe him still, their national individuality. End quote. If this be the glory of Julius, the first great founder of the empire, so is it also the glory of Charles, the second founder, and of more than one among his Teutonic successors. The work of the medieval empire was self-destructive, and it fostered, while seeming to oppose, the nationalities that were destined to replace it. It tamed the barbarous races of the North, and forced them within the pale of civilization. It preserved the arts and literature of antiquity. In times of violence and oppression, it set before its subjects the duty of rational obedience to an authority whose watchwords were peace and religion. It kept alive, when national hatreds were most bitter, the notion of a great European commonwealth, and by doing all this, it was in effect abolishing the need for a centralizing and despotic power like itself. It was making men capable of using national independence aright. It was teaching them to rise to that conception of spontaneous activity, and a freedom which is above law, but not against it to which national independence itself, 
if it is to be a blessing at all, must be only a means. Those who mark what has been the tendency of events since A.D. 1789, and who remember how many of the crimes and calamities of the past are still but half redressed, need not be surprised to see the so-called principle of nationalities advocated with honest devotion as the final and perfect form of political development. But such undistinguishing advocacy is, after all, only the old error in a new shape. If all other history did not bid us beware the habit of taking the problems and the conditions of our own age for those of all time, the warning which the empire gives might alone be warning enough. From the days of Augustus down to those of Charles V, the whole civilized world believed in its existence as a part of the eternal fitness of things, and Christian theologians were not behind heathen poets in declaring that when it perished, the world would perish with it. Yet the empire is gone, and the world remains, and hardly notes the change. End of section 38、section、39 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2015. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 39. Selected excerpts from Curiosities of Natural History. By Francis Trevelyan Buckland. Francis Trevelyan Buckland, eighteen twenty six to eighteen eighty. Certainly among the most useful of writers are the popularizers of science, those who can describe in readable, picturesque fashion those wonders and innumerable inhabitants of the world which the driest dusts discover, but which are apt to escape the attention of idlers or of the busy workers in other fields. Sometimes, not often, the same man unites the capacities of a patient and accurate investigator and of an accomplished narrator. To such men the field of enjoyment is boundless, as is the opportunity to promote the enjoyment of others. One of these two-sided men was Francis Trevelyan Buckland, popularly known as Frank Buckland, and so called in some of his books. His father, William Buckland, at the time of the son's birth canon of Christ College, Oxford, and subsequently dean of Westminster, was the well-known geologist. As the father's life was devoted to the study of the inorganic, so that of the son was absorbed in the investigation of the organic world. He never tired of watching the habits of living creatures of all kind. He lived, as it were, in a menagerie, and it is related that his numerous callers were accustomed to the most familiar and impertinent demonstrations on the part of his monkeys and various other pets. He was an expert salmon fisher, and his actual speciality was fishes, but he could not have these about him so conveniently as some other forms of life, and he extended his studies and specimens widely beyond ichthyology. Buckland was born December 17, 1826, and died December 19, 1880. Brought up in a scientific atmosphere, he was all his life interested in the same subjects. Educated as a physician and surgeon, and distinguished for his anatomical skill, his training fitted him for the careful investigation which is necessary on the part of the biologist. He was fortunate, too, in receiving, in early middle life, the government appointment of Inspector of Salmon Fisheries, and so being enabled to devote himself wholly to his favourite pursuits. 
in this position he was unwearied in his efforts to develop pisciculture and to improve the apparatus used by the fishermen interesting himself also in the condition of themselves and their families he was always writing he was a very frequent contributor to the field from its foundation in eighteen fifty six and subsequently to land and water a periodical which he started in eighteen sixty six and to other periodicals he published a number of volumes made up in great part from his contributions to periodicals most of them of a popular character and full of interesting information among those which are best known are the curiosities of natural history eighteen fifty seven through seventy two the log book of a fisherman and geologist eighteen seventy five a natural history of british fishes eighteen eighty one and notes and jottings from animal life which was not issued until eighteen eighty two though the material was selected by himself Buckland was of a jovial disposition, and always sure to see the humorous side of the facts which were presented to him, and in his social life he was extremely unconventional and inclined to merry pranks. His books are as delightful as was their writer. They are records of accurate, useful, eye-opening details as to fauna, all the world over. They are written with a brisk, sincere informality that suggests the lively talker rather than the writer. He takes us a walking in green lanes and woods, and a wading in brooks and still pools, not drawing us into a classroom or a study. He enters into the heart and life of creatures, and shows us how we should do the same. A lively humor is in all his popular pages. He instructs while smiling, and he is a savant while a light-hearted friend. Few English naturalists are as genial, not even white of Selborne, and few as wide in didactics. To know him is a profit indeed, but just as surely a pleasure. A Hunt in a Horse Pond From Curiosities of Natural History well let us have a look at the pond world choose a dry place at the side and fix our eyes steadily upon the dirty water what shall we see nothing at first but wait a minute or two a little round black knob appears in the middle gradually it rises higher and higher till at last you can make out the frog's head with his great eyes staring hard at you like the eyes of the frog in the woodcut facing Aesop's fable of the frog and the bull. Not a bit of his body do you see. He is much too cunning for that. He does not know who or what you are. You may be a heron, his mortal enemy, for aught he knows. You move your arm. He thinks it is the heron's bill coming. Down he goes again, and you see him not. A few seconds he regains courage and reappears, having probably communicated the intelligence to the other frogs, for many big heads and many big eyes appear in all parts of the pond, looking like so many hippopotami on a small scale. Soon a conversational work, work, work begins. You don't understand it. Luckily, perhaps, as from the swelling in their throats it is evident that the colony is outraged by the intrusion, and the remarks passing are not complimentary to the intruder. These frogs are all respectable, grown-up, well-to-do frogs, and they have in this pond duly deposited their spawn, and then hard-hearted creatures left it to its fate. It has, however, taken care of itself, and is now hatched, at least that part of it which has escaped the hands of the gypsies, who not unfrequently prescribe baths of this natural jelly for rheumatism. In some places, from their making this peculiar noise, frogs have been called Dutch nightingales. In Scotland, too, they have a curious name, paddock or puddock, but there is poetical authority for it. The water snake whom fish and paddocks feed with staring scales lies poisoned. Dryden. Returning from the University of Gießen, I brought with me about a dozen green tree frogs, which I had caught in the woods near the town. 
the germans call them laubfrosch or leaf frog they are most difficult things to find on account of their color so much resembling the leaves on which they live i have frequently heard one singing in a small bush and though i have searched carefully have not been able to find him the only way is to remain quite quiet till he again begins his song after much ambush work at length i collected a dozen frogs and put them in a bottle i started at night on my homeward journey by the diligence and i put the bottle containing the frogs into the pocket inside the diligence my fellow passengers were sleepy old smoke-dried germans very little conversation took place and after the first mile every one settled himself to sleep and soon all were snoring i suddenly awoke with a start and found all the sleepers had been roused at the same moment on their sleepy faces were depicted fear and anger what had woke us all up so suddenly the morning was just breaking and my frogs though in the dark pocket of the coach had found it out and with one accord all twelve of them had begun their morning song as if at a given signal they one and all of them began to croak as loud as ever they could the noise their united concert made seemed in the closed compartment of the coach quite deafening well might the germans look angry they wanted to throw the frogs bottle and all out of the window but i gave the bottle a good shaking and made the frogs keep quiet the germans all went to sleep again but i was obliged to remain awake to shake the frogs when they began to croak it was lucky that i did so for they tried to begin their concert again two or three times these frogs came safely to oxford and the day after their arrival a stupid housemaid took off the top of the bottle to see what was inside one of the frogs croaked at that instant and so frightened her that she dared not put the cover on again they all got loose in the garden where i believe the ducks ate them for i never heard or saw them again on rats from curiosities of natural history on one occasion when a boy i recollect secretly borrowing an old-fashioned flint gun from the bird-keeper of the farm to which i had been invited i ensconced myself behind the door of the pigsty determined to make a victim of one of the many rats that were accustomed to disport themselves among the straw that formed the bed of the farmer's pet bacon pigs in a few minutes out came an old patriarchal looking rat who having taken a careful survey quietly began to feed after a long aim bang went the gun i fell backwards knocked down by the recoil of the rusty old piece of artillery i did not remain prone long for i was soon roused by the most unearthly squeaks and a dreadful noise as of an infuriated animal madly rushing round and round the sty ye gods what had i done I had not surely, like the tailor in the old song of the carrion crow, shot and missed my mark, and shot the old sow right bang through the heart. But I had nearly performed a similar sportsmanlike feat. There was poor Piggy, the blood flowing in streamlets from several small punctures in that part of his body destined, at no very distant period, to become ham in vain attempting by dismal cries and by energetic waggings of its curly tail to appease the pain of the charge of small shot which had so unceremoniously awakened him from his porcine dreams of oatmeal and boiled potatoes but where was the rat he had disappeared unhurt the buttocks of the unfortunate pig the rightful owner of the premises had received the charge of shot intended to destroy the daring intruder to appease piggy's wrath i gave him a bucketful of food from the hog-tub and while he was thus consoling his inward self wiped off the blood from the wounded parts and saying nothing about it to anybody no doubt before this time some frugal housewife has been puzzled and astonished at the unwonted appearance of a charge of small shot in the centre of the breakfast ham which she procured from squire moorland of sheepstead berks 
rats are very fond of warmth and will remain coiled up for hours in any snug retreat where they can find this very necessary element of their existence the following anecdote well illustrates this point my late father when fellow of corpus college oxford many years ago on arriving at his rooms late one night found that a rat was running about among the books and geological specimens behind the sofa under the fender and poking his nose into every hiding place he could find being studiously inclined and wishing to set to work at his books he pursued them armed with the poker in one hand and a large dictionary big enough to crush any rat in the other but in vain mr rat was not to be caught particularly when such arma scholastica were used no sooner had the studies recommenced than the rat resumed his gambols squeaking and rushing about the room like a mad creature the battle was renewed and continued at intervals to the destruction of all studies till quite a late hour at night when the pursuer angry and wearied retired to his adjoining bedroom though he listened attentively he heard no more of the enemy and soon fell asleep in the morning he was astonished to find something warm lying on his chest carefully lifting up the bedclothes he discovered his tormentor of the preceding night quietly and snugly ensconced in a fold in the blanket and taking advantage of the bodily warmth of his two-legged adversary these two lay looking daggers at each other for some minutes the one unwilling to leave his warm berth the other afraid to put his hand out from under the protection of the coverlid particularly as the stranger's aspect was anything but friendly his little sharp teeth and fierce little black eyes seeming to say pause off from me if you please at length remembering the maxim that discretion is the better part of valour the truth of which i imagine rats understand as well as most creatures he made a sudden jump off the bed scuttled away into the next room and was never seen or heard of afterwards rats are not selfish animals having found out where the feast is stored they will kindly communicate the intelligence to their friends and neighbours the following anecdote will confirm this fact a certain worthy old lady named mrs oakey who resided at axminster several years ago made a cask of sweet wine for which she was celebrated and carefully placed it on a shelf in the cellar the second night after this event she was frightened almost to death by a strange unaccountable noise in the said cellar the household was called up and a search made but nothing was found to clear up the mystery the next night as soon as the lights were extinguished and the house quiet this dreadful noise was heard again this time it was most alarming a sound of squeaking crying knocking pattering feet then a dull scratching sound with many other such ghostly noises which continued throughout the livelong night the old lady lay in bed with the candle alight pale and sleepless with fright anon muttering her prayers anon determining to fire off the rusty old blunderbuss that hung over the chimney-piece at last the morning broke and the cock began to crow now thought she the ghosts must disappear to her infinite relief the noise really did cease and the poor frightened dame adjusted her nightcap and fell asleep great preparations had she made for the next night farm servants armed with pitchforks slept in the house the maids took the family dinner-bell and the tinder-box into their rooms the big dog was tied to the hall-table then the dame retired to her room not to sleep but to sit up in the armchair by the fire keeping a drowsy guard over the neighbour's loaded horse-pistols of which she was almost as much afraid as she was of the ghost in the cellar sure enough her warlike preparations had succeeded the ghost was certainly frightened not a noise not a sound except the heavy snoring of the bumpkins and the rattling of the dog's chain in the hall could be heard she had gained a complete victory the ghost was never heard again on the premises and the whole affair was soon forgotten some weeks afterward some friends dropped in to take a cup of tea and talk over the last piece of gossip 
Among other things the wine was mentioned, and the maid sent to get some from the cellar. She soon returned, and, gasping for breath, rushed into the room, exclaiming, "'Tis all gone, ma'am!' And sure enough it was all gone. "'The ghost has taken it!' Not a drop was left, only the empty cask remained, the side was half eaten away, and marks of sharp teeth were visible round the ragged margins of the newly made bungholes. This discovery fully accounted for the noise the ghost had made, which caused so much alarm. The aboriginal rats in the dame's cellar had found out the wine, and communicated the joyful news to all the other rats in the parish. They had assembled there to enjoy the fun and get very tipsy, which, judging from the noise they made, they certainly did, on this treasured cask of wine. Being quite a family party, they had finished it in two nights, and having got all they could, like wise rats, they returned to their respective homes, perfectly unconscious that their merry-making had nearly been the death of the rightful owner and founder of the feast. They had first gnawed out the cork and got as much as they could, they soon found that the more they drank, the lower the wine became. Perseverance is the motto of the rat, so they set to work and ate away the wood to the level of the wine again. This they continued till they had emptied the cask. They must then have got into it and licked up the last drains, for another and less agreeable smell was substituted for that of wine. I may add that this cask, with the side gone and the marks of the rat's teeth, is still in my possession. Snakes and their poison from Curiosities of Natural History Be it known to any person to whose lot it should fall to rescue a person from the crushing folds of a boa constrictor that it is no use pulling and hauling at the centre of the brute's body. Catch hold of the tip of his tail he then can be easily unwound he cannot help himself he must come off again if you wish to kill a snake it is no use hitting and trying to crush his head the bones of the head are composed of the densest material affording effectual protection to the brain underneath a wise provision for the animal's preservation for where his skull brittle his habit of crawling on the ground would render it very liable to be fractured the spinal cord runs down the entire length of the body. This being wounded, the animal is disabled or killed instanter. Strike therefore his tail, and not his head, for at his tail the spinal cord is but thinly covered with bone, and suffers readily from injury. This practice is applicable to eels. If you want to kill an eel, it is not much use belabouring his head strike however his tail two or three times against any hard substance and he is quickly dead about four years ago i myself in person had painful experience of the awful effects of snake's poison i have received a dose of the cobra's poison into my system luckily a minute dose or i should not have survived it the accident happened in a very curious way I was poisoned by the snake, but not bitten by him. I got the poison second-hand. Anxious to witness the effects of the poison of the cobra upon a rat, I took up a couple in a bag alive to a certain cobra. I took one rat out of the bag and put him into the cage with the snake. The cobra was coiled up among the stones in the center of the cage, apparently asleep. When he heard the noise of the rat falling into the cage, he just looked up and put out his tongue, hissing at the same time. The rat got in a corner and began washing himself, keeping one eye on the snake, whose appearance he evidently did not half like. Presently the rat ran across the snake's body, and in an instant the latter assumed his fighting attitude. As the rat passed the snake, he made a dart, but missing his aim, hit his nose a pretty hard blow against the side of the cage. This accident seemed to anger him, for he spread out his crest and waved it to and fro in the beautiful manner peculiar to his kind. The rat became alarmed and ran near him again. Again Cobra made a dart and bit him, but did not, I think, inject any poison into him, the rat being so very active, at least no symptoms of poisoning were shown. 
the bite nevertheless aroused the ire of the rat for he gathered himself for a spring and measuring his distance sprang right onto the neck of the cobra who was waving about in front of him this plucky rat determined to die hard gave the cobra two or three severe bites in the neck the snake keeping his body erect all this time and endeavouring to turn his head round so as to bite the rat who was clinging on like the old man in sindbad the sailor soon however cobra changed his tactics tired possibly with sustaining the weight of the rat he lowered his head and the rat finding himself again on terra firma tried to run away not so for the snake collecting all his force brought down his erected poison fangs making his head tell by its weight in giving vigour to the blow right on to the body of the rat this poor beast now seemed to know that the fight was over and that he was conquered he retired to a corner of the cage and began panting violently endeavouring at the same time to steady his failing strength with his feet his eyes were widely dilated and his mouth open as if gasping for breath the cobra stood erect over him hissing and putting out his tongue as if conscious of victory in about three minutes the rat fell quietly on his side and expired the cobra then moved off and took no further notice of his defunct enemy about ten minutes afterward the rat was hooked out of the cage for me to examine no external wound could i see anywhere so i took out my knife and began taking the skin off the rat i soon discovered two very minute punctures like small needle holes in the side of the rat where the fangs of the snake had entered the parts between the skin and the flesh and the flesh itself appeared as though affected with mortification even though the wound had not been inflicted above a quarter of an hour if so much anxious to see if the skin itself was affected i scraped away the parts on it with my fingernail finding nothing but the punctures i threw the rat away and put the knife and skin in my pocket and started to go away i had not walked a hundred yards before all of a sudden i felt just as if somebody had come behind me and struck me a severe blow on the head and neck and at the same time i experienced the most acute pain and sense of oppression at the chest as though a hot iron had been run in and a hundredweight put on the top of it i knew instantly from what i had read that i was poisoned i said as much to my friend a most intelligent gentleman who happened to be with me and told him if i fell to give me brandy and eau de luce words which he kept repeating in case he might forget them at the same time i enjoined him to keep me going and not on any account to allow me to lie down i then forgot everything for several minutes and my friend tells me i rolled about as if very faint and weak he also informs me that the first thing i did was to fall against him asking if i looked seedy he most wisely answered no you look very well i don't think he thought so for his own face was as white as a ghost i recollect this much he tells me my face was of a greenish yellow colour after walking or rather staggering along for some minutes i gradually recovered my senses and steered for the nearest chemist's shop rushing in i asked for eau de luce of course he had none but my eye caught the words spirit amon co or hartshorn on a bottle I reached it down myself and pouring a large quantity into a tumbler with a little water both of which articles I found on a soda water stand in the shop drank it off though it burned my mouth and lips very much instantly I felt relief from the pain at the chest and head the chemist stood aghast and on my telling him what was the matter recommended a warm bath if I had then followed his advice these words would never have been placed on record after a second draught at the hartshorn bottle i proceeded on my way feeling very stupid and confused on arriving at my friend's residence close by he kindly procured me a bottle of brandy of which i drank four large wine glasses one after the other but did not feel the least tipsy after the operation feeling nearly well i started on my way home 
and then for the first time perceived a most acute pain under the nail of the left thumb this pain also ran up the arm i set to work to suck the wound and then found out how the poison had got into the system about an hour before I examined the dead red, I had been cleaning the nail with a penknife and had slightly separated the nail from the skin beneath. Into this little crack the poison had got when I was scraping the red skin to examine the wound. How virulent, therefore, must the poison of the cobra be? It had already been circulating in the body of the rat, from which I had imbibed it second hand. My Monkey Jacko From Curiosities of Natural History After some considerable amount of bargaining, in which amusing, sometimes animated, not to say exciting exhibition of talent, Englishmen generally get worsted by the Frenchmen, as was the case in the present instance, Jacko became transferred, chain, tail and all, to his new English master. Having arrived at the hotel, it became a question as to what was become of Jacko while his master was absent from home. A little closet opening into the wall of the bedroom offered itself as a temporary prison. Jacko was tied up securely, alas, how vain are the thoughts of man, to one of the row of pegs that were fastened against the wall. As the door closed on him, his wicked eyes seemed to say, I'll do some mischief now. And sure enough he did, for when I came back to release him, like Aeneas, obstupni steteruntke come et vox fancibus hesit. Aghast, astonished, and struck dumb with fear, I stood, like bristles rose my stiffened hair. Dryden The walls that but half an hour previously were covered with a finely ornamented paper, now stood out in the bold nakedness of lath and plaster. The relics on the floor showed that the little wretch's fingers had by no means been idle. The pegs were all loosened, the individual peg to which his chain had been fastened torn completely from its socket, that the destroyer's movement might not be impeded, and an unfortunate garment that happened to be hung up in the closet was torn to a thousand shreds. If ever Jack Shepherd had a successor, it was this monkey. If he had tied the torn bits of petticoat together and tried to make his escape from the window, I don't think I should have been much surprised. It was, after Jacko's misdeeds, quite evident that he must no longer be allowed full liberty, and a lawyer's blue bag, such as may be frequently seen in the dreaded neighbourhood of the Court of Chancery, filled however more frequently with papers and parchment than with monkeys was provided for him and this receptacle which some hay placed at the bottom for a bed became his new abode it was a movable home and therein lay the advantage for when the strings of it were tied there was no mode of escape he could not get his hands through the aperture at the end to unfasten them the bag was too strong for him to bite his way through and his ineffectual efforts to get out only had the effect of making the bag roll along the floor and occasionally make a jump up into the air, forming altogether an exhibition which if advertised in the present day of wonders as Le Bag Vivant would attract crowds of delighted and admiring citizens. In the bag aforesaid he travelled as far as Southampton on his road to town. While taking the ticket at the railway station, Jacko, who must needs see everything that was going on, suddenly poked his head out of the bag and gave a malicious grin at the ticket-giver. This much frightened the poor man, but with great presence of mind, quite astonishing under the circumstances, he retaliated the insult. Sir, that's a dog. You must pay for it accordingly. In vain was the monkey made to come out of the bag and exhibit his whole person. In vain were arguments in full accordance with the views of Cuvier and Owen urged eagerly, vehemently, and without hesitation, for the train was on the point of starting, to prove that the animal in question was not a dog, but a monkey. A dog it was in the peculiar views of the official, and three and sixpence was paid. 
thinking to carry the joke further there were just a few minutes to spare i took out from my pocket a live tortoise i happened to have with me and showing it said what must i pay for this as you charge for all animals the employee adjusted his specs withdrew from the desk to consult with his superior then returning gave the verdict with a grave but determined manner no charge for them sir them be insects End of section thirty nine. Section forty of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors, Section 40. Moral versus Intellectual Principles in Human Progress. From the History of Civilization in England, by Henry Thomas Buckle. 1821 through 1862 henry thomas buggle was born at lee in kent on november twenty fourth eighteen twenty one the son of a wealthy london merchant a delicate child he participated in none of the ordinary sports of children but sat instead for hours listening to his mother's reading of the bible and the arabian nights she had a great influence on his early development she was a calvinist deeply religious and buckle himself in after years acknowledged that to her he owed his faith in human progress through the dissemination and triumph of truth as well as his taste for philosophic speculations and his love for poetry his devotion to her was lifelong owing to his feeble health he passed but a few years at school and did not enter college nor did he know much in the scholar's sense of books till he was nearly eighteen the arabian nights the pilgrim's progress and shakespeare constituted his chief reading but he was fond of games of mental skill and curiously enough first gained distinction not in letters but at the chessboard and in the course of his subsequent travels he challenged and defeated the champions of europe he was concerned for a short time in business but being left with an independent income after the death of his father he resolved to devote himself to study he travelled for a year on the continent learning on the spot the languages of the countries he passed through in time he became an accomplished linguist reading nineteen languages and conversing fluently in seven by the time he was nineteen he had resolved to write a great historic work of a nature not yet attempted by any one to prepare himself for this monumental labor and to make up for past deficiencies he settled in london and apparently single-handed and without the advice or help of tutors or professional men entered upon that course of voluminous reading on which his erudition rests he is a singular instance of a self-taught man without scientific or academic training producing a work that marks an epoch in historical literature with a wonderful memory he had like macaulay the gift of getting the meaning and value of a book by simply glancing over the pages on an average he could read with intelligent comprehension three books in a working day of eight hours and in time mastered his library of twenty two thousand volumes indexing every book on the back and transcribing many pages into his commonplace books in this way he spent fifteen years of study in collecting his materials the first volume of his introduction to the history of civilization in england appeared in eighteen fifty seven and aroused an extraordinary interest because of the novelty and audacity of its statements it was both bitterly attacked and enthusiastically praised as it antagonized or attracted its readers buckle became the intellectual hero of the hour the second volume appeared in may eighteen sixty one and now worn out by overwork his delicate nerves completely unstrung by the death of his mother who had remained his first and only love he left england for the east in company with the two young sons of a friend 
in palestine he was stricken with typhoid fever and died at damascus on may twenty ninth eighteen sixty two his grave is marked by a marble tomb with the inscription from the arabic the written word remains long after the writer the writer is resting under the earth but his works endure three volumes of miscellanies and posthumous works edited by helen taylor were published in eighteen seventy two among these are a lecture on women delivered before the royal institution buckle's single and very successful attempt at public speaking and a review of mill's liberty one of the finest contemporary appreciations of that thinker but he wrote little outside his history devoting himself with entire singleness of purpose to his life work the introduction to the history of civilization in england has been aptly called the fragment of a fragment when as a mere youth he outlined his work he overestimated the extremest accomplishment of a single mind and did not clearly comprehend the vastness of the undertaking he had planned a general history of civilization but as the material increased on his hands he was forced to limit his project and finally decided to confine his work to a consideration of england from the middle of the sixteenth century in february eighteen fifty three he wrote to a friend quote, i have been long convinced that the progress of every people is regulated by principles or as they are called laws as regular and as certain as those which govern the physical world to discover these laws is the object of my work i propose to take a general survey of the moral intellectual and legislative peculiarities of the great countries of europe and i hope to point out the circumstances under which these peculiarities have risen this will lead to a perception of certain relations between the various stages through which each people have progressively passed of these general relations i intend to make a particular application and by a careful analysis of the history of england to show how they have regulated our civilization and how the successive and apparently the arbitrary forms of our opinions our literature our laws and our manners have naturally grown out of their antecedents End quote this general scheme was adhered to in the published history and he supported his views by a vast array of illustrations and proofs the main ideas advanced in the introduction for he did not live to write the body of the work the future volumes to which he often pathetically refers these ideas may be thus stated first nothing had yet been done toward discovering the principles underlying the character and destiny of nations to establish a basis for a science of history a task which buckle proposed to himself second experience shows that nations are governed by laws as fixed and regular as the laws of the physical world third climate soil food and the aspects of nature are the primary causes in forming the character of a nation fourth the civilization within and without europe is determined by the fact that in europe man is stronger than nature and here alone has subdued her to his service whereas on the other continents nature is the stronger and man has been subdued by her fifth the continually increasing influence of mental laws and the continually diminishing influence of physical laws characterize the advance of european civilization sixth the mental laws regulating the progress of society can only be discovered by such a comprehensive survey of facts as will enable us to eliminate disturbances namely by the method of averages seventh human progress is due to intellectual activity which continually changes and expands rather than to moral agencies which from the beginnings of society have been more or less stationary eighth in human affairs in general individual efforts are insignificant the great men work for evil rather than for good and are moreover merely incidental to their age ninth religion literature art and government instead of being causes of civilization are merely its products tenth the progress of civilization varies directly as skepticism the disposition to doubt or the protective spirit the disposition to maintain without examination established beliefs and practices predominates 
the new scientific method of darwin and mill were just then being eagerly discussed in england and buckle an alert student and great admirer of mill in touch with the new movements of the day proposed quote, by adapting to the history of man those methods of investigation which have been found successful in other branches of knowledge and rejecting all preconceived notions which could not bear the test of those methods end quote to remove history from the condemnation of being a mere series of arbitrary facts or a biography of famous men or the small beer chronicle of court gossip and intrigues and to raise it to the level of an exact science subject to mental laws as rigid and infallible as the laws of nature Quote, instead of telling us of those things which alone have any value instead of giving us information respecting the progress of knowledge and the way in which mankind has been affected by the diffusion of that knowledge the vast majority of historians fill their works with the most trifling and miserable details in other great branches of knowledge observation has preceded discovery first the facts have been registered and then their laws have been found but in the study of the history of man the important facts have been neglected and the unimportant ones preserved the consequence is that whoever now attempts to generalize historical phenomena must collect the facts as well as conduct the generalization End quote. buckle's ideal of the office and acquirements of the historian was of the highest he must indeed possess a synthesis of the whole range of human knowledge to explain the progress of man by connecting history with political economy and statistics he strove to make it exact and he exemplified his theories by taking up branches of scientific investigation hitherto considered entirely outside the province of the historian he first wrote history scientifically pursuing the same methods and using the same kinds of proofs as the scientific worker the first volume excited as much angry discussion as darwin's origin of species had done in its day the boldness of its generalizations its uncompromising and dogmatic tone irritated more than one class of readers the chapters on spain and on scotland with their strictures on the religions of those countries containing some of the most brilliant passages in the book brought up in arms against him both catholics and presbyterians trained scientists blame him for encroaching on their domains with an insufficient knowledge of the phenomena of the natural world whence resulted a defective logic and vague generalizations it is true that buckle was not trained in the methods of the schools that he labored under the disadvantage of a self-taught solitary worker not receiving the friction of other vigorous minds and that his reading if extensive was not always wisely chosen and from its very amount often ill-digested he had knowledge rather than true learning and taking this knowledge at second hand often relied on sources that proved either untrustworthy or antiquated for he lacked the true relator's fine discrimination that weighs and sifts authorities and rejects the inadequate malicious critics declared that all was grist that came to his mill yet his popularity with that class of readers whom he did not shock by his disquisitions on religions and morals or make distrustful by his sweeping generalizations and scientific inaccuracies is due to the fact that his book appeared at the right moment for the time was really come to make history something more than a chronicle of detached facts and antidotes the scientific spirit was awake and demanded that human action like the processes of nature be made the subject of general law the mind of buckle proved fruitful soil for those germs of thought floating in the air and he gave them visible form in his history if he was not a leader he was a brilliant formulator of thought and he was the first to put before the reading world then ready to receive them ideas and speculations till now belonging to the student for he wrote with the determination to be intelligible to the general reader it detracts nothing from the permanent value of his work thus to state its genesis for this is merely to apply to it his own methods moreover a perpetual charm lies in his clear limpid english a medium perfectly adapted to calm exposition or to impassioned rhetoric 
whatever the defects of buckle's system whatever the inaccuracies that the advance of thirty years of patient scientific labors can easily point out however sweeping his generalization or however dogmatic his assertions the book must be allowed high rank among the works that set men thinking and must thus be conceded to possess enduring value now this excerpt from buckle's history of civilization in england moral versus intellectual principles in human progress there is unquestionably nothing to be found in the world which has undergone so little change as those great dogmas of which moral systems are composed to do good to others to sacrifice for their benefit your own wishes to love your neighbor as yourself to forgive your enemies to restrain your passions to honor your parents to respect those who are set over you these and a few others are the sole essentials of morals but they have been known for thousands of years and not one jot or tittle has been added to them by all the sermons homilies and textbooks which moralists and theologians have been able to produce but if we contrast this stationary aspect of moral truths with the progressive aspect of intellectual truths the difference is indeed startling all the great moral systems which have exercised much influence have been fundamentally the same all the great intellectual systems have been fundamentally different in reference to our moral conduct there is not a single principle now known to the most cultivated europeans which was not likewise known to the ancients in reference to the conduct of our intellect the moderns have not only made the most important additions to every department of knowledge that the ancients ever attempted to study but besides this they have upset and revolutionized the old methods of inquiry they have consolidated into one great scheme all those resources of induction which aristotle alone dimly perceived and they have created sciences the faintest idea of which never entered the mind of the boldest thinker antiquity produced these are to every educated man recognized and notorious facts and the inference to be drawn from them is immediately obvious since civilization is the product of moral and intellectual agencies and since that product is constantly changing it evidently cannot be regulated by the stationary agent because when surrounding circumstances are unchanged a stationary agent can only produce a stationary effect the only other agent is the intellectual one and that this is the real mover may be proved in two distinct ways first because being as we have already seen either moral or intellectual and being as we have also seen not moral it must be intellectual and secondly because the intellectual principle has an activity and a capacity for adaptation which as i undertake to show is quite sufficient to account for the extraordinary progress that during several centuries europe has continued to make such are the main arguments by which my view is supported but there are also other and collateral circumstances which are well worthy of consideration the first is that the intellectual principle is not only far more progressive than the moral principle but is also far more permanent in its results the acquisitions made by the intellect are in every civilized country carefully preserved registered in certain well understood formulas and protected by the use of technical and scientific language they are easily handed down from one generation to another and thus assuming an accessible or as it were a tangible form they often influence the most distant posterity they become the heirlooms of mankind the immortal bequest of the genius to which they owe their birth but the good deeds affected by our moral faculties are less capable of transmission they are of a more private and retiring character while as the motives to which they owe their origin are generally the result of self-discipline and of self-sacrifice they have to be worked out by every man for himself and thus begun by each anew they derive little benefit from the maxims of preceding experience nor can they well be stored up for the use of future moralists the consequence is that although moral excellence is more amiable and to most persons more attractive than intellectual excellence still it must be confessed that looking at ulterior results it is far less active less permanent 
and as i shall presently prove less productive of real good indeed if we examine the effects of the most active philanthropy and of the largest and most disinterested kindness we shall find that those effects are comparatively speaking short-lived that there is only a small number of individuals they come in contact with and benefit that they rarely survive the generation which witnessed their commencement and that when they take the more durable form of founding great public charities such institutions invariably fall first into abuse then into decay and after a time are either destroyed or perverted from their original intention mocking the effort by which it is vainly attempted to perpetuate the memory even of the purest and most energetic benevolence these conclusions are no doubt very unpalatable and what makes them peculiarly offensive is that it is impossible to refute them for the deeper we penetrate into this question the more clearly shall we see the superiority of intellectual acquisitions over moral feeling there is no instance on record of an ignorant man who having good intentions and supreme power to enforce them has not done far more evil than good and whenever the intentions have been very eager and the power very extensive the evil has been enormous but if you can diminish the sincerity of that man if you can mix some alloy with his motives you will likewise diminish the evil which he works if he is selfish as well as ignorant it will often happen that you may play off his vice against his ignorance and by exciting his fears restrain his mischief if however he has no fear if he is entirely unselfish if his sole object is the good of others if he pursues that object with enthusiasm upon a large scale with a disinterested zeal then it is that you have no check upon him you have no means of preventing the calamities which in an ignorant age an ignorant man will be sure to inflict how entirely this is verified by experience we may see in studying the history of religious persecution to punish even a single man for his religious tenets is assuredly a crime of the deepest dye but to punish a large body of men to persecute an entire sect to attempt to extirpate opinions which growing out of the state of society in which they arise are themselves a manifestation of the marvellous and luxuriant fertility of the human mind to do this is not only one of the most pernicious but one of the most foolish acts that can possibly be conceived nevertheless it is an undoubted fact that an overwhelming majority of religious persecutors have been men of the purest intentions of the most admirable and unsullied morals it is impossible that this should be otherwise for they are not bad-intentioned men who seek to enforce opinions which they believe to be good still less are they bad men who are so regardless of temporal considerations as to employ all the resources of their power not for their own benefit but for the purpose of propagating a religion which they think necessary to the future happiness of mankind such men as these are not bad they are only ignorant ignorant of the nature of truth ignorant of the consequences of their own acts but in a moral point of view their motives are unimpeachable indeed it is the very ardor of their sincerity which warms them into persecution it is the holy zeal by which they are fired that quickens their fanaticism into a deadly activity if you can impress any man with an absorbing conviction of the supreme importance of some moral or religious doctrine if you can make him believe that those who reject that doctrine are doomed to eternal perdition if you then give that man power and by means of his ignorance blind him to the ulterior consequences of his own act he will infallibly persecute those who deny his doctrine and the extent of his persecution will be regulated by the extent of his sincerity diminish the sincerity and you will diminish the persecution in other words by weakening the virtue you may check the evil this is a truth of which history furnishes such innumerable examples that to deny it would be not only to reject the plainest and most conclusive arguments but to refuse the concurrent testimony of every age i will merely select two cases which from the entire difference in their circumstances are very apposite as illustrations the first being from the history of paganism 
the other from the history of christianity and both proving the inability of moral feeling to control religious persecution one the roman emperors as is well known subjected the early christians to persecutions which though they have been exaggerated were frequent and very grievous but what to some persons must appear extremely strange is that among the active authors of these cruelties we find the names of the best men who ever sat on the throne while the worst and most infamous princes were precisely those who spared the christians and took no heed of their increase the two most thoroughly depraved of all the emperors were certainly commodus and elagabalus neither of whom persecuted the new religion or indeed adopted any measures against it they were too reckless of the future too selfish too absorbed in their own infamous pleasures to mind whether truth or error prevailed and being thus indifferent to the welfare of their subjects they cared nothing about the progress of a creed which they as pagan emperors were bound to regard as a fatal and impious delusion they therefore allowed christianity to run its course unchecked by those penal laws which more honest but more mistaken rulers would assuredly have enacted we find accordingly that the great enemy of christianity was marcus aurelius a man of kindly temper and of fearless unflinching honesty but whose reign was characterized by a persecution from which he would have refrained had he been less in earnest about the religion of his fathers and to complete the argument it may be added that the last and one of the most strenuous opponents of christianity who occupied the throne of the caesars was julian a prince of eminent probity whose opinions are often attacked but against whose moral conduct even calumny itself has hardly breathed a suspicion two the second illustration is supplied by spain a country of which it must be confessed that in no other have religious feelings exercised such sway over the affairs of men no other european nation has produced so many ardent and disinterested missionaries zealous self-denying martyrs who have cheerfully sacrificed their lives in order to propagate truths which they thought necessary to be known nowhere else have the spiritual classes been so long in the ascendant nowhere else are the people so devout the churches so crowded the clergy so numerous but the sincerity and honesty of purpose by which the spanish people taken as a whole have always been marked have not only been unable to prevent religious persecution but have proved the means of encouraging it if the nation had been more lukewarm it would have been more tolerant as it was the preservation of the faith became the first consideration and everything being sacrificed to this one object it naturally happened that zeal begat cruelty and the soil was prepared in which the inquisition took root and flourished the supporters of that barbarous institution were not hypocrites but enthusiasts hypocrites are for the most part too subtle to be cruel for cruelty is a stern and unbending passion while hypocrisy is a fawning and flexible art which accommodates itself to human feelings and flatters the weakness of men in order that it may gain its own ends in spain the earnestness of the nation being concentrated on a single topic carried everything before it and hatred of heresy becoming a habit persecution of heresy was thought a duty the conscientious energy with which that duty was fulfilled is seen in the history of the spanish church indeed that the inquisitors were remarkable for an undeviating and uncorruptible integrity may be proved in a variety of ways and from different and independent sources of evidence this is a question to which i shall hereafter return but there are two testimonies which i cannot omit because from the circumstances attending them they are peculiarly unimpeachable laurent the great historian of the inquisition and its bitter enemy had access to its private papers and yet with the fullest means of information he does not even insinuate a charge against the moral character of the inquisitors but while execrating the cruelty of their conduct he cannot deny the purity of their intentions 
thirty years earlier townsend a clergyman of the church of england published his valuable work on spain and though as a protestant and an englishman he had every reason to be prejudiced against the infamous system which he describes he also can bring no charge against those who upheld it but having occasion to mention its establishment at barcelona one of its most important branches he makes the remarkable admission that all its members are men of worth and that most of them are of distinguished humanity these facts startling as they are form a very small part of that vast mass of evidence which history contains and which decisively proves the utter inability of moral feelings to diminish religious persecution the way in which the diminution has been really effected by the mere progress of intellectual acquirements will be pointed out in another part of this volume when we shall see that the great antagonist of intolerance is not humanity but knowledge it is to the diffusion of knowledge and to that alone that we owe the comparative cessation of what is unquestionably the greatest evil men have ever inflicted on their own species for that religious persecution is a greater evil than any other is apparent not so much from the enormous and almost incredible number of its known victims as from the fact that the unknown must be far more numerous and that history gives no account of those who have been spared in the body in order that they might suffer in the mind we hear much of martyrs and confessors of those who were slain by the sword or consumed in the fire but we know little of that still larger number who by the mere threat of persecution have been driven into an outward abandonment of their real opinions and who thus forced into an apostasy the heart abhors have passed the remainder of their lives in the practice of a constant and humiliating hypocrisy it is this which is the real curse of religious persecution for in this way men being constrained to mask their thoughts there arises a habit of securing safety by falsehood and of purchasing impunity with deceit in this way fraud becomes a necessary of life insincerity is made a daily custom the whole tone of public feeling is vitiated and the gross amount of vice and of error fearfully increased surely then we have reason to say that compared to all this all other crimes are of small account and we may well be grateful for that increase of intellectual pursuits which has destroyed an evil that some among us would even now willingly restore end of section forty Section 41 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6 by various authors section forty one the mythical origin of history from the history of civilization in england by henry thomas buckle at a very early period in the progress of a people and long before they are acquainted with the use of letters they feel the want of some resource which in peace may amuse their leisure and in war may stimulate their courage this is supplied to them by the invention of ballads which form the groundwork of all historical knowledge and which in one shape or another are found among some of the rudest tribes of the earth they are for the most part sung by a class of men whose particular business it is thus to preserve the stock of traditions indeed so natural is this curiosity as to past events that there are few nations to whom these bards or minstrels are unknown thus to select a few instances it is they who have preserved the popular traditions not only of europe but also of china tibet and tartary likewise of india of Sindh, of belichistan of western asia of the islands of the black sea of egypt of western africa of north america of south america and of the islands in the pacific 
in all these countries letters were long unknown and as people in that state have no means of perpetuating their history except by oral tradition they select the form best calculated to assist their memory and it will i believe be found that the first rudiments of knowledge consist always of poetry and often of rhyme the jingle pleases the ear of the barbarian and affords a security that he will hand it down to his children in the unimpaired state in which he received it this guarantee against error increases still further the value of these ballads and instead of being considered as a mere amusement they rise to the dignity of judicial authorities the allusions contained in them are satisfactory proofs to decide the merits of rival families or even to fix the limits of those rude estates which such a society can possess we therefore find that the professed reciters and composers of these songs are the recognized judges in all disputed matters and as they are often priests and believed to be inspired it is probably in this way that the notion of the divine origin of poetry first arose these ballads will of course vary according to the customs and temperaments of the different nations and according to the climate to which they are accustomed in the south they assume a passionate and voluptuous form in the north they are rather remarkable for their tragic and warlike character but notwithstanding these diversities all such productions have one feature in common they are not only founded on truth but making allowance for the colorings of poetry they are all strictly true men who are constantly repeating songs which they constantly hear and whose appeal to the authorized singers of them as final umpires in disputed questions are not likely to be mistaken on matters in the accuracy of which they have so lively an interest this is the earliest and most simple of the various stages through which history is obliged to pass but in the course of time unless unfavorable circumstances intervene society advances and among other changes there is one in particular of the greatest importance i mean the introduction of the art of writing which before many generations are past must effect a complete alteration in the character of the national traditions the manner in which this occurs has so far as i am aware never been pointed out and it will therefore be interesting to attempt to trace some of its details the first and perhaps the most obvious consideration is that the introduction of the art of writing gives permanence to the national knowledge and thus lessens the utility of that oral information in which all the acquirements of an unlettered people must be contained hence it is that as a country advances the influence of tradition diminishes and traditions themselves become less trustworthy besides this the preservers of these traditions lose in this stage of society much of their former reputation among a perfectly unlettered people the singers of ballads are as we have already seen the sole depositories of those historical facts on which the fame and often the property of their chieftains principally depend but when this same nation becomes acquainted with the art of writing it grows unwilling to entrust these matters to the memory of itinerant singers and avails itself of its new art to preserve them in a fixed and material form as soon as this is effected the importance of those who repeat the national trends are sensibly diminished they gradually sink into an inferior class which having lost its old reputation no longer consists of those superior men to whose abilities it owed its former fame thus we see that although without letters there can be no knowledge of much importance it is nevertheless true that their introduction is injurious to historical traditions in two distinct ways first by weakening the traditions and secondly by weakening the class of men whose occupation it is to preserve them but this is not all not only does the art of writing lessen the number of traditionary truths but it directly encourages the propagation of falsehoods this is effected by what may be termed a principle of accumulation to which all systems of belief have been deeply indebted in ancient times for example the name of hercules was given to several of those great public robbers who scourged mankind and who if their crimes were successful as well as enormous were sure after their death to be worshipped as heroes 
how this appellation originated is uncertain but it was probably bestowed at first on a single man and afterwards on those who resembled him in the character of their achievements this mode of extending the use of a single name is natural to a barbarous people and would cause little or no confusion as long as the tradition of the country remained local and unconnected but as soon as these traditions became fixed by a written language the collectors of them deceived by the similarity of name assembled the scattered facts and ascribing to a single man these accumulated exploits degraded history to the level of a miraculous mythology in the same way soon after the use of letters was known in the north of europe there was drawn up by saxo grammaticus the life of the celebrated ragnar lodbrock either from accident or design this great warrior of scandinavia who had taught england to tremble had received the same name as another ragnar who was prince of jutland about a hundred years earlier this coincidence would have caused no confusion as long as each district preserved a distinct and independent account of its own ragnar but by possessing the resource of writing men became able to consolidate the separate trains of events and as it were fuse two truths into one error and this was what actually happened the credulous saxo put together the different exploits of both ragnars and ascribing the whole of them to his favorite hero has involved in obscurity one of the most interesting parts of the early history of europe the annals of the north afford another curious instance of this source of error a tribe of finns called queens occupied a considerable part of the eastern coast of the gulf of bothnia their country was known as queenland and this name gave rise to the belief that to the north of baltic there was a nation of amazons this would easily have been corrected by local knowledge but by the use of writing the flying rumor was at once fixed and the existence of such a people is positively affirmed in some of the earliest european histories thus too abu the ancient capital of finland was called turku which in the swedish language means a market-place adam of bremen having occasion to treat of the countries adjoining the baltic was so misled by the word turku that this celebrated historian assures his readers that there were turks in finland to these illustrations many others might be added showing how mere names deceived the early historians and gave rise to relations which were entirely false and might have been rectified on the spot but which owing to the art of writing were carried into distant countries and thus placed beyond the reach of contradiction of such cases one more may be mentioned as it concerns the history of england richard i the most barbarous of our princes was known to his contemporaries as the lion an appellation conferred upon him on account of his fearlessness and the ferocity of his temper hence it was said that he had the heart of a lion and the title cour de lion not only became indissolubly connected with his name but actually gave rise to a story repeated by innumerable writers according to which he slew a lion in a single combat the name gave rise to the story the story confirmed the name and another fiction was added to that long series of falsehoods of which history mainly consisted during the middle ages the corruptions of history thus naturally brought about by the mere introduction of letters were in europe aided by an additional cause with the art of writing there was in most cases also communicated a knowledge of christianity and the new religion not only destroyed many of the pagan traditions but falsified the remainder by amalgamating them with monastic legends the extent to which this was carried would form a curious subject for inquiry but one or two instances of it will perhaps be sufficient to satisfy the generality of readers of the earliest state of the great northern nations we have little positive evidence but several of the lays in which the scandinavian poets related the feats of their ancestors or of their contemporaries are still preserved and notwithstanding their subsequent corruption it is admitted by the most competent judges that they embody real and historical events but in the ninth and tenth centuries christian missionaries found their way across the baltic and introduced a knowledge of their religion among the inhabitants of northern europe scarcely was this effected when the sources of history began to be poisoned at the end of the eleventh century 
Salmon Sigfusson, a Christian priest, gathered the popular and hitherto unwritten histories of the North into what is called the Elder Edda, and he was satisfied with adding to his compilation the corrective of the Christian hymn. A hundred years later there were made another collection of the native histories, but the principle which I have mentioned, having had a longer time to operate, now displayed its effects still more clearly. In this second collection, which is known by the name of the Younger Edda, there is an agreeable mix of Greek, Jewish, and Christian fables, and for the first time in the Scandinavian annals we meet with the widely diffused fiction of a Trojan descent if by way of further illustration we turn to other parts of the world we shall find a series of facts confirming this view we shall find that in those countries where there has been no change of religion history is more trustworthy and connected than in those countries where such a change has taken place in india brahmanism which is still supreme was established at so early a period that its origin is lost in the remotest antiquity the consequence is that the native annals have never been corrupted by any new superstition and the hindus are possessed of historic traditions more ancient than can be found among any other asiatic people in the same way the chinese have for upwards of two thousand years preserved the religion of fo which is a form of buddhism in china therefore although the civilization has never been equal to that of india there is a history not indeed as old as the natives would wish us to believe but still stretching back to several centuries before the christian era from whence it has been brought down to our own times in an uninterrupted succession on the other hand the persians whose intellectual development was certainly superior to that of the chinese are nevertheless without any authentic information respecting the early transactions of their ancient monarchy for this i can see no possible reason except the fact that persia soon after the promulgation of the koran was conquered by the mohammedans who completely subverted the parsi religion and thus interrupted the stream of the national traditions hence it is that putting aside the myths of the zendavesta we have no native authorities for persian history of any value until the appearance in the eleventh century of shah nameh in which however ferdistu has mingled the miraculous relations of those two religions by which his country has been successively subjected the result is that if it were not for the various discoveries which have been made of monuments inscriptions and coins we should be compelled to rely on the scanty and inaccurate details in the greek writers for our knowledge of the history of one of the most important of the asiatic monarchies End of section forty one Section 42 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, Section 42 selected excerpts from the natural history by georges louis leclerc buffon georges louis leclerc buffon 1707 to 1788 by spencer trotter a science becomes part of the general stock of knowledge only after it has entered into the literature of a people the bare skeleton of facts must be clothed with the flesh and blood of imagination through the humanizing influence of literary expression before it can be assimilated by the average intellectual being the scientific investigator is rarely endowed with the gift of weaving the facts into a story that will charm and the man of letters is too often devoid of that patience which is the chief virtue of the scientist these gifts of the gods are bestowed upon mankind under the guiding genius of the division of labor the name of buffon will always be associated with natural history though in the man himself the spirit of science was conspicuously absent in this respect he was in marked contrast with his contemporary linnaeus whose intellect and labor laid the foundations of much of the scientific knowledge of today georges louis leclerc buffon was born on the seventh of september seventeen o seven at montbar in burgundy 
his father benjamin le clerc who was possessed of a fortune appears to have bestowed great care and liberality on the education of his son while a youth buffon made the acquaintance of a young english nobleman the duke of kingston whose tutor a man well versed in the knowledge of physical science exerted a profound influence on the future career of the young frenchman at twenty-one buffon came into his mother's estate a fortune yielding an annual income of twelve thousand pounds but this wealth did not change his purpose to gain knowledge he travelled through italy and after living for a short period in england returned to france and devoted his time to literary work his first efforts were translations of two english works of science hale's vegetable statics and newton's fluxions and he followed these with various studies in the different branches of physical science the determining event in his life which led him to devote the rest of his years to the study of natural history was the death of his friend du fay the intendant of the jardin du roi now the jardin des plantes who on his deathbed recommended buffon as his successor a man of letters buffon saw before him the opportunity to write a natural history of the earth and its inhabitants and he set to work with a zeal that lasted until his death in seventeen eighty eight at the age of eighty one his great work l'histoire naturelle was the outcome of these years of labor the first edition being complete in thirty-six quarto volumes the first fifteen volumes of this great work published between the years seventeen forty nine and seventeen sixty seven treated of the theory of the earth the nature of animals and the history of man and viviparous quadrupeds and was the joint work of buffon and daubenton a physician of buffon's native village the scientific portion of the work was done by daubenton who possessed considerable anatomical knowledge and who wrote accurate descriptions of the various animals mentioned buffon however affected to ignore the work of his co-laborer and reaped the entire glory so that daubenton withdrew his services later appeared the nine volumes on birds in which buffon was aided by the abbe sexon then followed the history of minerals in five volumes and seven volumes of supplements the last one of which was published the year after buffon's death one can hardly admire the personal character of buffon he was vain and superficial and given to extravagant speculations he is reported to have said i know but five great geniuses newton bacon leibniz montesquieu and myself his natural vanity was undoubtedly fostered by the adulation which he received from those in authority he saw his own statue placed in the cabinet of louis the sixteenth with the inscription majestate naturae par ingenium louis the fifteenth bestowed upon him a title of nobility and crowned heads addressed him in language of the most exaggerated compliment buffon's conduct and conversation were marked throughout by a certain coarseness and vulgarity that constantly appear in his writings he was foppish and trifling and affected religion though at heart a disbeliever the chief value of buffon's work lies in the fact that it first brought the subject of natural history into popular literature probably no writer of the time with the exception of voltaire and rousseau was so widely read and quoted as buffon but the gross inaccuracy which pervaded his writings and the visionary theories in which he constantly indulged gave the work a less permanent value than it might otherwise have attained buffon detested the scientific method preferring literary finish to accuracy of statement although the work was widely translated and was the only popular natural history of the time there is little of it that is worthy of a place in the world's best literature it is chiefly as a relic of a past literary epoch and as the pioneer work in a new literary field that buffon's writings appeal to us they awakened for the first time a wide interest in natural history though their author was distinctly not a naturalist 
arabella buckley has said of buffon and his writings that though he often made great mistakes and arrived at false conclusions still he had so much genius and knowledge that a great part of his work will always remain true cuvier has left us a good memoir of buffon in the biographique universelle nature from the natural history so with what magnificence nature shines upon the earth a pure light extending from east to west gilds successively the hemispheres of the globe an airy transparent element surrounds it a warm and fruitful heat animates and develops all its germs of life living and salutary waters tend to their support and increase high points scattered over the lands by arresting the airy vapours render these sources inexhaustible and always fresh gathered into immense hollows they divide the continents the extent of the sea is as great as that of the land it is not a cold and sterile element but another empire as rich and populated as the first the finger of god has marked the boundaries when the waters encroach upon the beaches of the west they leave bare those of the east this enormous mass of water itself inert follows the guidance of heavenly movements balanced by the regular oscillations of ebb and flow it rises and falls with the planet of night rising still higher when concurrent with the planet of day the two uniting their forces during the equinoxes cause the great tides our connection with the heavens is nowhere more clearly indicated from these constant and general movements result others variable and particular removals of earth deposits at the bottom of water forming elevations like those upon the earth's surface currents which following the direction of these mountain ranges shape them to corresponding angles and rolling in the midst of the waves as waters upon the earth are in truth the rivers of the sea the air too lighter and more fluid than water obeys many forces the distant action of sun and moon the immediate action of the sea that of rarefying heat and of condensing cold produce in it continual agitations the winds are its currents driving before them and collecting the clouds they produce meteors transport the humid vapors of maritime beaches to the land surfaces of the continents determine the storms distribute the fruitful rains and kindly dews stir the sea agitate the mobile waters arrest or hasten the currents raise floods excite tempests the angry sea rises toward heaven and breaks roaring against immovable dikes which it can neither destroy nor surmount the land elevated above sea level is safe from these eruptions its surface enameled with flowers adorned with ever fresh verdure peopled with thousands and thousands of differing species of animals is a place of repose an abode of delights where man placed to aid nature dominates all other things the only one who can know and admire god has made him spectator of the universe and witness of his marvels he is animated by a divine spark which renders him a participant in the divine mysteries and by whose light he thinks and reflects sees and reads in the book of the world as in a copy of divinity nature is the exterior throne of god's glory the man who studies and contemplates it rises gradually towards the interior throne of omniscience made to adore the creator he commands all the creatures vassal of heaven king of earth which he ennobles and enriches he establishes order harmony and subordination among living beings he embellishes nature itself cultivates extends and refines it suppresses its thistles and brambles and multiplies its grapes and roses look upon the solitary beaches and sad lands where man has never dwelt covered or rather bristling with thick black woods on all their rising ground stunted barkless trees bent twisted falling from age 
nearby others even more numerous rotting upon heaps already rotten stifling burying the germs ready to burst forth nature young everywhere else is here decrepit the land surmounted by the ruins of these productions offers instead of flourishing verdure only an encumbered space pierced by aged trees loaded with parasitic plants lichens agarics impure fruits of corruption in the low parts is water dead and stagnant because undirected or swampy soil neither solid nor liquid hence unapproachable and useless to the habitants both of land and of water here are swamps covered with rank aquatic plants nourishing only venomous insects and haunted by unclean animals between these low infectious marshes and these higher ancient forests extend plains having nothing in common with our meadows upon which weeds smother useful plants there is none of that fine turf which seems like down upon the earth or of that enamelled lawn which announces a brilliant fertility but instead an interlacement of hard and thorny herbs which seem to cling to each other rather than to the soil and which successively withering and impeding each other form a coarse mat several feet thick there are no roads no communications no vestiges of intelligence in these wild places man obliged to follow the paths of savage beasts and to watch constantly lest he become their prey terrified by their roars thrilled by the very silence of these profound solitudes turns back and says primitive nature is hideous and dying i i alone can make it living and agreeable let us dry these swamps converting into streams and canals animate these dead waters by setting them in motion let us use the active and devouring element once hidden from us and which we ourselves have discovered and set fire to this superfluous mat to these aged forests already half consumed and finish with iron what fire cannot destroy soon instead of rush and water-lily from which the toad compounds his venom we shall see buttercups and clover sweet and salutary herbs herds of bounding animals will tread this once impracticable soil and find abundant constantly renewed pasture they will multiply to multiply again let us employ the new aid to complete our work and let the ox submissive to the yoke exercise his strength in furrowing the land then it will grow young again with cultivation and a new nature shall spring up under our hands how beautiful is cultivated nature when by the cares of man she is brilliantly and pompously adorned he himself is the chief ornament the most noble production in multiplying himself he multiplies her most precious gem she seems to multiply herself with him for his art brings to light all that her bosom conceals what treasures hitherto ignored what new riches flowers fruits perfected grains infinitely multiplied useful species of animals transported propagated endlessly increased harmful species destroyed confined banished gold and iron more necessary than gold drawn from the bowels of the earth torrents confined rivers directed and restrained the sea submissive and comprehended crossed from one hemisphere to the other the earth everywhere accessible everywhere living and fertile in the valleys laughing prairies in the plains rich pastures or richer harvests the hills loaded with vines and fruits their summits crowned by useful trees and young forests deserts changed to cities inhabited by a great people who ceaselessly circulating scatter themselves from centres to extremities frequent open roads and communications established everywhere like so many witnesses of the force and union of society a thousand other monuments of power and glory 
proving that man master of the world has transformed it renewed its whole surface and that he shares his empire with nature however he rules only by right of conquest and enjoys rather than possesses he can only retain by ever renewed efforts if these cease everything languishes changes grows disordered enters again into the hands of nature she retakes her rights effaces man's work covers his most sumptuous monuments with dust and moss destroys them in time leaving him only the regret that he has lost by his own fault the conquests of his ancestors these periods during which man loses his domain ages of barbarism when everything perishes are always prepared by wars and arrive with famine and depopulation man who can do nothing except in numbers and is only strong in union only happy in peace has the madness to arm himself for his unhappiness and to fight for his own ruin incited by insatiable greed blinded by still more insatiable ambition he renounces the sentiments of humanity turns all his forces against himself and seeking to destroy his fellow does indeed destroy himself and after these days of blood and carnage when the smoke of glory has passed away he sees with sadness that the earth is devastated the arts buried the nations dispersed the races enfeebled his own happiness ruined and his power annihilated the hummingbird from the natural history of all animated beings this is the most elegant in form and the most brilliant in colors the stones and metals polished by our arts are not comparable to this jewel of nature she has placed it least in size of the order of birds maxime miranda in minimus her masterpiece is the little hummingbird and upon it she has heaped all the gifts which the other birds may only share lightness rapidity nimbleness grace and rich apparel all belong to this little favorite the emerald the ruby and the topaz gleam upon its dress it never soils them with the dust of earth and in its aerial life scarcely touches the turf an instant always in the air flying from flower to flower it has their freshness as well as their brightness it lives upon their nectar and dwells only in the climates where they perennially bloom all kinds of hummingbirds are found in the hottest countries of the new world they are quite numerous and seem to be confined between the two tropics for those which penetrate the temperate zones in summer only stay there a short time they seem to follow the sun in its advance and retreat and to fly on the wing of zephyrs after an eternal spring the smaller species of the hummingbirds are less in size than the great fly wasp and more slender than the drone their beak is a fine needle and their tongue a slender thread their little black eyes are like two shining points and the feathers of their wings so delicate that they seem transparent their short feet which they use very little are so tiny one can scarcely see them they alight only at night resting in the air during the day they have a swift continual humming flight the movement of their wings is so rapid that when pausing in the air the bird seems quite motionless one sees him stop before a blossom then dart like a flash to another visiting all plunging his tongue into their hearts flattening them with his wings never settling anywhere but neglecting none he hastens his inconstancies only to pursue his loves more eagerly and to multiply his innocent joys for this light lover of flowers lives at their expense without ever blighting them he only pumps their honey and to this alone his tongue seems destined the vivacity of these small birds is only equalled by their courage or rather their audacity sometimes they may be seen chasing furiously birds twenty times their size fastening upon their bodies letting themselves be carried along in their flight while they peck them fiercely until their tiny rage is satisfied 
sometimes they fight each other vigorously impatience seems their very essence if they approach a blossom and find it faded they mark their spite by hasty rending of the petals their only voice is a weak cry screp screp frequent and repeated which they utter in the woods from dawn until at the first rays of the sun they all take flight and scatter over the country End of section 42section forty three of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six section forty three biographical note on edward bulwer lytton eighteen o three to eighteen seventy three by julian hawthorne the patrician in literature is always an interesting spectacle we are prone to regard his performance as a test of the worth of long descent and high breeding if he does well he vindicates the claims of his caste if ill we infer that inherited estates and blue blood are but surface advantages leaving the effective brain unimproved or even causing deterioration but the argument is still open and whether genius be the creature of circumstance or divinely independent is a question which prejudice rather than evidence commonly decides certainly literature tries men's souls the charlatan must betray himself genius shines through all cerements on the other hand genius may be nourished and the charlatan permeates all classes the truth probably is that an aristocrat is quite as apt as a plebeian to be a good writer only since there are fewer of the former than of the latter and since unlike the last the first are seldom forced to live by their brains there are more plebeian than aristocratic names on the literary roll of honour admitting this the instance of the writer known as bulwer proves nothing one way or the other at all events not was he a genius because he was a patrician but was he a genius at all is the inquiry most germane to our present purpose an aristocrat of aristocrats undoubtedly he was though it concerns us not to determine whether the blood of plantagenet kings and norman conquerors really flowed in his veins on both father's and mother's side he was thoroughly well connected Hayden Hall in Norfolk was the hereditary home of the Norman Bulwers. The Saxon Littons had, since the conquest, lived at Nebworth in Derbyshire. The historic background of each family was honourable, and when the marriage of William Earl Bulwer with Elizabeth Barbara Lytton united them, it might be said that in their offspring England found her type Edward, being the youngest son, had little money, but he happened to have brains he began existence delicate and precocious culture with him set in almost with what he would have termed the consciousness of his own identity and the process never intermitted in fact appearances to the contrary notwithstanding his spiritual and intellectual emancipation was hindered by many obstacles for an ailing child he was petted by his mother and such germs of intelligence verses at seven years old and the like as he betrayed were trumpeted as prodigies he was spoilt so long before he was ripe that it is a marvel he ever ripened at all many years must pass before vanity could be replaced in him by manly ambition a vein of silliness is traceable through his career almost to the end he expatiated in the falsetto key almost never do we hear in his voice that hearty bass note so dear to plain humanity in his pilgrimage toward freedom he had to wrestle not only with flesh and blood mothers uncles and wives et id genus omne but with the more subtle and vital ideas superstitions and prejudices appertaining to his social station his worst foes were not those of his household merely but of his heart the more arduous achievement of such a man is to see his real self and believe in it 
there are so many misleading purple velvet waistcoats gold chains superfine sentiments and blue-blooded affiliations in the way that the true nucleus of so much decoration becomes less accessible than the needle in the haystack it is greatly to bulwer's credit that he stuck valiantly to his quest and nearly if not quite ran down his game at last his intellectual record is one of constant progress from childhood to age whether his advance in other respects was as uniform does not much concern us he was unhappy with his wife and perhaps they even threw things at each other at table the servants looking on nothing in his matrimonial relations so much became him as his conduct after their severance he held his tongue like a man in spite of the poor lady's shrieks and clapper clawings his whimsical hair-splitting conscientiousness is less admirable a healthy conscience does not whine it creates no one cares to know what a man thinks of his own actions no one is interested to learn that bulwer meant paul clifford to be an edifying work or that he married his wife from the highest motives we do not take him so seriously we are satisfied that he wrote the story first and discovered its morality afterwards and that lofty motives would not have united him to miss rosina doyle wheeler had she not been pretty and clever his hectic letters to his mamma his byronic struttings and mouthings over the grave of his schoolgirl lady-love his eighteenth-century comedy scene with caroline lamb his starched frill participation in the fred villiers duel at boulogne how silly and artificial is all this there is no genuine feeling in it he attires himself in tawdry sentiment as in a flowered waistcoat what a difference between him at this period and his contemporary benjamin disraeli who indeed committed similar inanities but with a saturnine sense of humour cropping out at every turn which altered the whole complexion of the performance we laugh at the one but with the other of course however there was a man hidden somewhere in edward bulwer's perfumed clothes and mincing attitudes else the world had long since forgotten him amidst his dandyism he learned how to speak well in debate and how to use his hands to guard his head he paid his debts by honest hard work and would not be dishonorably beholden to his mother or any one else he posed as a blighted being and invented black evening dress but he lived down the scorn of such men as tennyson and thackeray and won their respect and friendship at last he aimed high according to his lights meant well and in the long run did well too the main activities of his life and from start to finish his energy was great were in politics and in literature his political career covers about forty years from the time he took his degree at cambridge till lord darby made him a peer in eighteen sixty six he accomplished nothing of serious importance but his course was always creditable he began as a sentimental radical and ended as a liberal conservative he advocated the crimean war the corn laws found him in a compromising humor his record as colonial secretary offers nothing memorable in statesmanship the extraordinary brilliancy of his brother henry's diplomatic life throws edward's achievements into the shade there is nothing to be ashamed of but had he done nothing else he would have been unknown but literature first seriously cultivated as a means of livelihood outlasted his political ambitions and his books are to-day his only claim to remembrance they made a strong impression at the time they were written and many are still read as much as ever by a generation born after his death their popularity is not of the catchpenny sort thoughtful people read them as well as the great drove of the undiscriminating for they are the product of thought they show workmanship they have quality they are carefully made if the literary critic never finds occasion to put off the shoes from his feet as in the sacred presence of genius he is constantly moved to recognize with a friendly nod the presence of sterling talent he is even inclined to think that nobody else ever had so much talent as this little red-haired blue-eyed high-nosed dandified edward bulwer the mere mass of it lifts him at times to the levels where genius dwells 
though he never quite shares their nectar and ambrosia he as it were catches echoes of the talk of the immortals the turn of their phrase the intonation of their utterance and straightway reproduces it with the fidelity of the phonograph but as in the phonograph we find something lacking our mind accepts the report as genuine but our ear affirms an unreality this is reproduction indeed but not creation bulwer himself when his fit is past and his critical faculty reawakens probably knows as well as another that these labored and meritorious pages of his are not graven on the eternal adamant but they are the best he can do and perhaps there is none better of their kind they have a right to be for while genius may do harm as well as good bulwer never does harm and in spite of sickly sentiment and sham philosophy is uniformly instructive amusing and edifying to love her wrote dick steele of a certain great dame is a liberal education and we might almost say the same of the reading of bulwer's romances he was learned and he put into his books all his learning as well as all else that was his they represent artistically grouped ingeniously lighted with suitable accompaniments of music and illusion the acquisitions of his intellect the sympathies of his nature and the achievements of his character he wrote in various styles making deliberate experiments in one after another and often hiding himself completely in anonymity he was versatile not deep robert louis stevenson also employs various styles but with him the changes are intuitive they are the subtle variations in touch and timbre which genius makes in harmony with the subject treated stevenson could not have written dr jekyll and mr hyde in the same tune and key as treasure island and the music of marxheim differs from both the reason is organic the writer is inspired by his theme and it passes through his mind with a lilt and measure of its own it makes its own style just as a human spirit makes its own features and gait and we know stevenson through all his transformations only by dint of the exquisite distinction and felicity of word and phrase that always characterize him now with bulwer there is none of this lovely inevitable spontaneity he costumes his tale arbitrarily like a stage haberdasher and invents a voice to deliver it withal the last days of pompeii shall be mouthed out grandiloquently the incredibilities of the coming race shall wear the guise of naive and artless narrative the humours of the caxtons and what will he do with it shall reflect the mood of the sagacious affable man of the world gossiping over the nuts and wine the marvels of zanoni and a strange story must be portrayed with a resonance and exaltation of diction fitted to their transcendental claims but between the stark mechanism of the englishman and the lithe inspired felicity of the scot what a difference bulwer's work may be classified according to subject though not chronologically he wrote novels of society of history of mystery and of romance in all he was successful and perhaps felt as much interest in one as in another in his own life the study of the occult played a part he was familiar with the contemporary fads in mystery and acquainted with their professors ancient history also attracted him and he even wrote a couple of volumes of a history of athens in all his writing there is a tendency to lapse into a discussion of the ideal and the real aiming always at the conclusion that the only true real is the ideal it was this tendency which chiefly aroused the ridicule of his critics and from the threadward lytton bulwig of thackeray to the condensed novels burlesque of bret harte they harp upon that facile string the thing satirized is after all not cheaper than the satire the ideal is the true real the only absurdity lies in the pomp and circumstance wherewith that simple truth is introduced there is a dweller on the threshold but it or he is nothing more than that doubt concerning the truth of spiritual things which assails all beginners in higher speculation 
and there was no need to call it or him by so formidable a name a sense of humour would have saved bulwer from almost all his faults and have endowed him with several valuable virtues into the bargain but it was not born in him and with all his diligence he never could beget it the domestic series of which the caxtons is the type are the most generally popular of his works and are likely to be so longest the romantic vein ernest maltravers alice or the mysteries etc are in his worst style and are only now in existence as books because they are members of the edition it is doubtful if any human being has read one of them through in twenty years such historical books as the last days of pompeii are not only well constructed dramatically but are painfully accurate in details and may still be read for information as well as for pleasure the zanoni species is undeniably interesting the weird traditions of the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life can never cease to fascinate human souls and all the paraphernalia of magic are charming to minds weary of the matter of factitude of current existence the stories are put together with bulwer's unfailing cleverness and in all external respects neither dumas nor balzac has done anything better in this kind the trouble is that these authors compel our belief while bulwer does not for once more he lacks the magic of genius and the spirit of style which are immortally and incommunicably theirs without which no other magic can be made literarily effective pelham written at twenty-five years of age is a creditable boy's book it aims to portray characters as well as to develop incidents and in spite of the dreadful silliness of its melodramatic passages it has merit conventionally it is more nearly a work of art than that other famous boy's book disraeli's vivian gray though the latter is alive and blooming with the original literary charm which is denied to the other other characteristic novels of his are the last days of pompeii ernest maltravers zanoni the caxtons my novel what will he do with it a strange story the coming race and kenelm chillingly the last of which appeared in the year of the author's death eighteen seventy three the student who has read these books will know all that is worth knowing of bulwer's work he wrote upwards of fifty substantial volumes and left a mass of posthumous material besides of all that he did the most nearly satisfactory thing is one of the last kenelm chillingly in style persons and incidents it is alike charming it subsides somewhat into the inevitable bulwer sentimentality towards the end a silk purse cannot be made out of a sow's ear but the miracle was never nearer being accomplished than in this instance here we see the thoroughly equipped man of letters doing with apparent ease what scarce five of his contemporaries could have done at all the book is lightsome and graceful yet it touches serious thoughts most remarkable of all it shows a suppleness of mind and freshness of feeling more to be expected in a youth of thirty than in a veteran of threescore and ten bulwer never ceased to grow and what is better still to grow away from his faults and towards improvement but in comparing him with others we must admit that he had better opportunities than most his social station brought him in contact with the best people and most pregnant events of his time and the driving poverty of youth having established him in the novel writing habit he thereafter had leisure to polish and expand his faculty to the utmost no talent of his was folded up in a napkin he did his best and utmost with all he had whereas the path of genius is commonly tortuous and hard beset and while we are always saying of shakespeare or thackeray or shelley or keats or poe what wonders they would have done had life been longer or fate kinder to them of bulwer we say no help was wanting to him and he profited by all he got out of the egg more than we had believed was in it instead of a great faculty hobbled by circumstance we have a small faculty magnified by occasion and enriched by time certainly as men of letters go bulwer must be accounted fortunate 
the long inflamed row of his domestic life apart all things went his way he received large sums for his books at the age of forty his mother dying he succeeded to the nebworth estate three and twenty years later his old age if such a man could be called old was consoled by the title of lord lytton his health was never robust and occasionally failed but he seems to have been able to accomplish after a fashion everything that he undertook he was thorough as the english say he lived in the midst of events he was a friend of the men who made the age and saw them make it lending a hand himself too when and where he could he lived long enough to see the hostility which had opposed him in youth die away and honour and kindness take its place let it be repeated his aims were good he would have been candid and unself-conscious had that been possible for him and perhaps the failure was one of manner rather than of heart yes he was a fortunate man his most conspicuous success was as a play-writer in view of his essentially dramatic and historic temperament it is surprising that he did not altogether devote himself to this branch of art but all his dramas were produced between his thirty-third and his thirty-eighth years the first la duchesse de la valliere was not to the public liking but the lady of lyon written in two weeks is in undiminished favour after nearly sixty years and so are richelieu and money there is no apparent reason why bulwer should not have been as prolific a stage author as moliere or even lope de vega but we often value our best faculties least the coming race published anonymously and never acknowledged during his life was an unexpected product of his mind but is useful to mark his limitations it is a forecast of the future and proves as nothing else could so well do the utter absence in bulwer of the creative imagination it is an invention cleverly conceived mechanically and rather tediously worked out and written in a style astonishingly commonplace the man who wrote that book one would say had no heaven in his soul nor any pinions whereon to soar heavenward yet it is full of thought and ingenuity and the central conception of vril has been much commended but the whole concoction is tainted with the deadness of stark materialism and we should be unjust after all to deny bulwer something loftier and broader than is discoverable here in inventing the narrative he depended upon the weakest element in his mental make-up and the result could not but be dismal we like to believe that there was better stuff in him than he himself ever found and that when he left this world for the next he had sloughed off more dross than most men have time to accumulate end of section forty three section forty four of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors. Section 44. The Amphitheatre, From the Last Days of Pompeii, Part 1. On the upper tier, but apart from the male spectators, sat the women their gay dresses resembling some gaudy flower-bed it is needless to add that they were the most talkative part of the assembly and many were the looks directed up to them especially from the benches appropriated to the young and the unmarried men on the lower seats round the arena sat the more high-born and wealthy visitors the magistrates and those of senatorial or equestrian dignity the passages which by corridors at the right and left gave access to these seats at either end of the oval arena were also the entrances for the combatants strong palings at these passages prevented any unwelcome eccentricity in the movements of the beasts and confined them to their appointed prey around the parapet which was raised above the arena 
and from which the seats gradually rose were gladiatorial inscriptions and paintings wrought in fresco typical of the entertainments for which the place was designed throughout the whole building wound invisible pipes from which as the day advanced cooling and fragrant showers were to be sprinkled over the spectators the officers of the amphitheatre were still employed in the task of fixing the vast awning or valeria which covered the whole and which luxurious invention the campanians arrogated to themselves it was woven of the whitest apulian wool and variegated with broad stripes of crimson owing either to some inexperience on the part of the workmen or to some defect in the machinery the awning however was not arranged that day so happily as usual indeed from the immense space of the circumference the task was always one of great difficulty and art so much so that it could seldom be adventured in rough or windy weather but the present day was so remarkably still that there seemed to the spectators no excuse for the awkwardness of the artificers and when a large gap in the back of the awning was still visible from the obstinate refusal of one part of the valeria to ally itself with the rest the murmurs of discontent were loud and general the sedile panza at whose expense the exhibition was given looked particularly annoyed at the defect and vowed bitter vengeance on the head of the chief officer of the show who fretting puffing perspiring busied himself in idle orders and unavailing threats the hubbub ceased suddenly the operators desisted the crowd was stilled the gap was forgotten for now with a loud and warlike flourish of trumpets the gladiators marshalled in ceremonious procession entered the arena they swept round the oval space very slowly and deliberately in order to give the spectators full leisure to admire their stern serenity of feature their brawny limbs and various arms as well as to form such wagers as the excitement of the moment might suggest oh cried the widow fulvia to the wife of pansa as they leaned down from their lofty bench do you see that gigantic gladiator how drolly he is dressed yes said the aedile's wife with complacent importance for she knew all the names and qualities of each combatant he is a richarius or netter he is armed only you see with a three-pronged spear like a trident and a net he wears no armor only the fillet and the tunic he is a mighty man and is to fight with sporus yon thick-set gladiator with a round shield and drawn sword but without body armor he has not his helmet on now in order that you may see his face how fearless he is by and by he will fight with his visor down but surely a net and a spear are poor arms against a shield and sword well that shows how innocent you are my dear fulvia the richarius has generally the best of it but who is yon handsome gladiator nearly naked is it not quite improper by venus but his limbs are beautifully shaped it is lidon a young untried man he has the rashness to fight yon other gladiator similarly dressed or rather undressed tetrides they fight first in the greek fashion with the cestus afterward they put on armor and try sword and shield he is a proper man this lydon and the women i am sure are on his side so are not the experienced betors Clodius offers three to one against him. Oh, Jove, how beautiful, exclaimed the widow, as two gladiators, armed Kapapi, rode around the arena on light and prancing steeds, resembling much the combatants in the tilts of the Middle Age. They bore lances and round shields beautifully inlaid. Their armor was woven intricately with bands of iron, but it covered only the thighs and the right arms, short cloaks extending to the seat gave a picturesque and graceful air to their costume their legs were naked with the exception of sandals which were fastened a little above the ankle oh beautiful who are these asked the widow the one is named burbix he has conquered twelve times the other assumes the arrogant nobilior they are both gauls while thus conversing the first formalities of the show were over 
to these succeeded a feigned combat with wooden swords between the various gladiators matched against each other among these the skill of two roman gladiators hired for the occasion was the most admired and next to them the most graceful combatant was lidon this sham contest did not last above an hour nor did it attract any very lively interest except among those connoisseurs of the arena to whom art was preferable to more coarse excitement the body of the spectators were rejoiced when it was over and when the sympathy rose to terror the combatants were now arranged in pairs as agreed beforehand their weapons examined and the grave sport of the day commenced amid the deepest silence broken only by an exciting and preliminary blast of warlike music it was often customary to begin the sports by the most cruel of all and some bestiarius or gladiator appointed to the beasts was slain first as an initiatory sacrifice but in the present instance the experienced panza thought better that the sanguinary drama should advance not decrease in interest and accordingly the execution of olynthus and glaucus was reserved for the last it was arranged that the two horsemen should first occupy the arena that the foot gladiators paired off should then be loosed indiscriminately on the stage that glaucus and the lion should next perform their part in the bloody spectacle and the tiger and the nazarene be the grand finale and in the spectacles of pompeii the reader of roman history must limit his imagination nor expect to find those vast and wholesale exhibitions of magnificent slaughter with which a nero or a caligula regaled the inhabitants of the imperial city the roman shows which absorbed the more celebrated gladiators and the chief proportion of foreign beasts were indeed the very reason why in the lesser towns of the empire the sports of the amphitheatre were comparatively humane and rare and in this as in other respects pompeii was the miniature the microcosm of rome still it was an awful and imposing spectacle with which modern times have happily nothing to compare a vast theatre rising row upon row and swarming with human beings from fifteen to eighteen thousand in number intent upon no fictitious representation no tragedy of the stage but the actual victory or defeat the exultant life or the bloody death of each and all who entered the arena the two horsemen were now at either extremity of the lists if so they might be called and at a given signal from pansa the combatants started simultaneously as in full collision each advancing his round buckler each poising on high his sturdy javelin but just when within three paces of his opponent the steed of burbix suddenly halted wheeled round and as nobilior was borne rapidly by his antagonist spurred upon him the buckler of nobilior quickly and skilfully extended received a blow which otherwise would have been fatal well done nobilior cried the pretar giving the first vent to the popular excitement bravely struck my burbix answered clodius from his seat and the wild murmur swelled by many a shout echoed from side to side the visors of both the horsemen were completely closed like those of the knights in after times but the head was nevertheless the great point of assault and nobilior now wheeling his charger with no less adroitness than his opponent directed his spear full on the helmet of his foe burbix raised his buckler to shield himself and his quick-eyed antagonist suddenly lowering his weapon pierced him through the breast burbix reeled and fell nobilior nobilior shouted the populace i have lost ten sestertia said clodius between his teeth habe he has it said pansa deliberately the populace not yet hardened into cruelty made the signal of mercy but as the attendants of the arena approached they found the kindness came too late the heart of the gaul had been pierced and his eyes were set in death it was his life's blood that flowed so darkly over the sand and sawdust of the arena it is a pity it was so soon over there was little enough for one's trouble said the widow fulvia yes i have no compassion for burbix 
anyone might have seen that nobilior did but faint mark they fix the fatal hook to the body they drag him away to the spolarium they scatter new stand over the stage pansa regrets nothing more than that he is not rich enough to strew the arena with borax and cinnabar as nero used to do well if it had been a brief battle it is quickly succeeded see my handsome lidon in the arena ay and the net-bearer too and the swordsman oh charming there were now on the arena six combatants niger and his net matched against sporus with his shield and his short broadsword lidon and tetrades naked save by a cincture round the waist each armed only with a heavy greek cestus and two gladiators from rome clad in complete steel and evenly matched with immense bucklers and pointed swords the initiatory contest between lidon and tetrades being less deadly than that between the other combatants no sooner had they advanced to the middle of the arena than as by common consent the rest held back to see how that contest should be decided and wait till fiercer weapons might replace the cestus ere they themselves commenced hostilities they stood leaning on their arms and apart from each other gazing on the show which if not bloody enough thoroughly to please the populace they were still inclined to admire because its origin was of their ancestral greece no persons could at first glance have seemed less evenly matched than the two antagonists tetrades though no taller than lidon weighed considerably more the natural size of his muscles was increased to the eyes of the vulgar by masses of solid flesh for as it was a notion that the contest of the cestus fared easiest with him who was plumpest Tetrades had encouraged to the utmost his hereditary predisposition to the portly his shoulders were vast and his lower limbs thick-set double-jointed and slightly curved outward in that formation which takes so much from beauty to give so largely to strength but lidon except that he was slender even almost to meagerness was beautifully and delicately proportioned and the skilful might have perceived that with much less compass of muscle than his foe that which he had was more seasoned iron and compact in proportion to as he wanted flesh he was likely to possess activity and a haughty smile on his resolute face which strongly contrasted with the solid heaviness of his enemies gave assurance to those who beheld it and united their hope to their pity so that despite the disparity of their seeming strength the cry of the multitude was nearly as loud for lidon as for tetrides whoever is acquainted with a modern prize ring whoever has witnessed the heavy and disabling strokes which the human fist skilfully directed hath the power to bestow may easily understand how much that happy facility would be increased by a band carried by thongs of leather round the arm as high as the elbow and terribly strengthened about the knuckles by a plate of iron and sometimes a plummet of lead yet this which was meant to increase perhaps rather diminished the interest of the fray for it necessarily shortened its duration a very few blows successfully and scientifically planted might suffice to bring the contest to a close and the battle did not therefore often allow full scope for the energy fortitude and dogged perseverance that we technically style pluck which not unusually wins the day against superior science and which heightens to so painful a delight the interest in the battle and the sympathy for the brave guard thyself growled tetrades moving nearer and nearer to his foe who rather shifted round him then receded lidon did not answer save by a scornful glance of his quick vigilant eye tetrides struck it was as the blow of a smith on a vice lidon sank suddenly on one knee the blow passed over his head not so harmless was lidon's retaliation he quickly sprang to his feet and aimed his cestus full on the broad chest of his antagonist tetrades reeled the populace shouted you are unlucky to-day said lepidus to clodius you have lost one bet you will lose another by the gods my bronzes go to the auctioneer if that is the case i have no less than a hundred sestertia upon tetrades ha ha 
See how he rallies. That was a home stroke. He has cut open Lidon's shoulder. Eh, hey, Tetrades! Eh, hey, Tetrades! But Lidon is not disheartened. By Pollux, how well he keeps his temper. See how dexterously he avoids those hammer-like hands, dodging now here, now there, circling round and round. Ah, poor Lidon, he has it again. Three to one still on Tetrades. What say you, Lepidus? Well, nine Testertia to three, be it so. What? Again, Lidon? He stops. He gasps for breath. By the gods, he is down. No, he is again on his legs. Brave Lidon! Tetrades is encouraged. He laughs loud. He rushes on him. Fool! Success blinds him. He should be cautious. Lidon's eye is like a lynx's, said Clodius between his teeth. Ha! Clodius, saw you that? Your man totters. Another blow. He falls. He falls. Earth revives him then. He's once more up, but the blood rolls down his face. By the thunder, Lidon wins it. See how he presses on him. That blow on the temple would have crushed an ox. It has crushed Tetrides. He falls again. He cannot move. Habe! 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 repeated Pansa. Take them out and give them the armor and swords. While the contest in the amphitheatre had thus commenced, there was one in the loftier benches for whom it had assumed, indeed, a poignant, a stifling interest. The aged father of Lidon, despite his Christian horror of the spectacle, in his agonized anxiety for his son, had not been able to resist being the spectator of his fate. Once amid a fierce crowd of strangers, the lowest rabble of the populace, the old man saw, felt nothing but the form, the presence of his brave son. Not a sound had escaped his lips when twice he had seen him fall to the earth. Only he had turned paler, and his limbs trembled. But he had uttered one low cry when he saw him victorious, unconscious, alas, of the more fearful battle to which that victory was but a prelude. "'My gallant boy,' said he, and wiped his eyes. Is he thy son? said a brawny fellow to the right of the Nazarene. He has fought well. Let us see how he does by and by. Hark, he is to fight the first victor. Now, old boy, pray to the gods that that victor be neither of the Romans, nor next to them the giant Niger. The old man sat down again and covered his face. The fray for the moment was indifferent to him. Lidon was not one of the combatants. Yet yet the thought flashed across him the fray was indeed of deadly interest the first who fell was to make way for lidon he started and bent down with straining eyes and clasped hands to view the encounter the first interest was attracted toward the combat of niger with sporus for the spectacle of contest from the fatal result which usually attended it and from the great science it required in either antagonist was always peculiarly inviting to the spectators. They stood at a considerable distance from each other. The singular helmet which Sporus wore, the visor of which was down, concealed his face. But the features of Niger attracted a fearful and universal interest from their compressed and vigilant ferocity. And thus they stood for some moments, each eyeing each until Sporus began slowly and with great caution to advance, holding his sword pointed like a modern fencer's at the breast of his foe. Niger retreated as his antagonist advanced, gathering up his net with his right hand, and never taking his small glittering eye from the movements of the swordsman. Suddenly, when Sporus had approached nearly at arm's length, the Risharius threw himself forward and cast his net. A quick inflection of body saved the gladiator from the deadly snare. He uttered a sharp cry of joy and rage, and rushed upon Niger. But Niger had already drawn in his net, thrown it across his shoulders, and now fled around the lists with a swiftness which the secutor, so called from the office of that tribe of gladiators, in following the foe the moment the net was cast, in order to smite him ere he could have time to rearrange it in vain endeavored to equal. The people laughed and shouted aloud to see the ineffectual efforts of the broad-shouldered gladiator to overtake the flying giant. When at that moment their attention was turned from these to the two Roman combatants. They had placed themselves at the onset face to face, 
at the distance of modern fencers from each other with the extreme caution which both evinced at first had prevented any warmth of engagement and allowed the spectators full leisure to interest themselves in the battle between sporus and his foe but the romans were now heated into full and fierce encounter they pushed returned advanced on retreated from each other with all that careful yet scarcely perceptible caution which characterizes men well experienced and equally matched but at this moment Amopolis, the older gladiator by that dexterous backstroke which was considered in the arena so difficult to avoid had wounded napimus on the side the people shouted lepidus turned pale ho oh, said claudius the game is nearly over if Amopolis writes now the quiet fight the other will gradually bleed himself away but thank the gods he does not fight the backward fight see he presses hard upon napimus by mars but napimus had him there the helmet rang again clodius i shall win why do i ever bet but at the dice groaned clodius to himself or why cannot one cog a gladiator a sporus a sporus shouted the populace as niger now having suddenly paused had again cast his net and again unsuccessfully he had not retreated this time with sufficient agility the sword of sporus had inflicted a severe wound upon his right leg and incapacitated to fly he was pressed hard by the fierce swordsman his great height and length of arm still continued however to give him no despicable advantages and steadily keeping his trident at the front of his foe he repelled him successfully for several minutes sporus now tried by great rapidity of evolution to get round his antagonist who necessarily moved with pain and slowness in so doing he lost his caution he advanced too near to the giant raised his arm to strike and received the three points of the fatal spear full in his breast he sank on his knee in a moment more the deadly net was cast over him he struggled against its meshes in vain again 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 he writhed mutely beneath the fresh strokes of the trident his blood flowed fast through the net and redly over the sand he lowered his arms in acknowledgment of defeat the conquering wishirius withdrew his net and leaning on his spear looked to the audience for their judgment slowly too at the same moment the vanquished gladiator rolled his dim and despairing eyes around the theatre from row to row from bench to bench there glared upon him but merciless and unpitying eyes hushed was the roar the murmur the silence was dread for in it was no sympathy not a hand no not even a woman's hand gave the signal of charity and life sporus had never been popular in the arena and lately the interest of the combat had been excited on behalf of the wounded niger people were warmed into blood the mimic fight had ceased to charm the interest had mounted up to the desire of sacrifice and the thirst of death the gladiator felt that his doom was sealed he uttered no prayer no groan the people gave the signal of death in dogged but agonized submission he bent his neck to receive the fatal stroke and now as the spear of the rishirius was not a weapon to inflict instant and certain death there stalked into the arena a grim and fatal form brandishing a short sharp sword and with features utterly concealed beneath its visor with slow and measured step this dismal headsman approached the gladiator still kneeling laid the left hand on his humbled crest drew the edge of the blade across his neck turned round to the assembly lest in the last moment remorse should come upon them the dread signal continued the same the blade glittered brightly in the air fell and the gladiator rolled upon the sand his limbs quivered were still he was a corpse his body was dragged at once from the arena through the gate of death and thrown into the gloomy den termed technically the spoliarium and ere it had well reached that destination the strife between the remaining combatants was decided the sword of Imolpus had inflicted the death wound upon the less experienced combatant a new victim was added to the receptacle of the slain throughout that mighty assembly there now ran a universal movement 
the people breathed more freely and settled themselves in their seats a grateful shower was cast over every row from the concealed conduits in cool and luxurious pleasure they talked over the late spectacle of blood Emulpus removed his helmet and wiped his brows his close curled hair and short beard his noble roman features and bright dark eye attracted the general admiration he was fresh unwounded and unfatigued the aedile paused and proclaimed aloud that as niger's wound disabled him from again entering the arena didon was to be the successor to the slaughtered nepimus and the new combatant of Emulpus. yet Ledon added he if thou wouldst decline the combat with one so brave and tried thou mayst have full liberty to do so Emulpus is not the antagonist that was originally decreed for thee thou knowest best how far thou canst cope with him if thou failest thy doom is honorable death if thou conquerest out of my own purse i will double the stipulated prize the people shouted applause Leden stood in the lists he gazed around high above he beheld the pale face the straining eyes of his father he turned away irresolute for a moment no the conquest of the cestus was not sufficient he had not yet won the prize of victory his father was still a slave noble aedile he replied in a firm and deep tone i shrink not from this combat for the honor of pompey i demand that one trained by its long celebrated lanista shall do battle with this roman the people shouted louder than before four to one against Leden said clodius to lepidus i would not take twenty to one why Emulpus is a very achilles and this poor fellow is but a tyro Emulpus gazed hard on the face of Lidon. he smiled and yet the smile was followed by a slight and scarce audible sigh a touch of compassionate emotion which custom conquered the moment the heart acknowledged it and now both clad in complete armor the sword drawn the visor closed the two last combatants of the arena ere man at least was matched with beast stood opposed to each other it was just at this time that a letter was delivered to the praetor by one of the attendants of the arena he removed the cincture glanced over it for a moment his countenance betrayed surprise and embarrassment he re-read the letter and then muttering tush it is impossible the man must be drunk even in the morning to dream of such follies threw it carelessly aside and gravely settled himself once more in the attitude of attention to the sports the interest of the public was wound up very high Emulpus had at first won their favor but the gallantry of Lidon and his well-timed allusion to the honor of the pompeian lanista had afterward given the latter the preference in their eyes hola old fellow said maiden's neighbor to him your son is hardly matched but never fear the editor will not permit him to be slain no nor the people neither he has behaved too bravely for that ha that was a home thrust well averted by pollux at him again Lidon. they stopped to breathe what art thou muttering old boy prayers answered midon with a more calm and hopeful mien than he had yet maintained prayers trifles the time for gods to carry a man away in a cloud is gone now ha jupiter what a blow thy side thy side take care of thy side Lydon. there was a convulsive tremor throughout the assembly a fierce blow from Emulpus, full on the crest had brought Lydon to his knee habe he has it cried a shrill female voice he has it it was the voice of the girl who had so anxiously anticipated the sacrifice of some criminal to the beasts be silent child said the wife of pansa haughtily non habe he is not wounded i wish he were if only to spite old surly maiden muttered the girl meanwhile Lydon, who had hitherto defended himself with great skill and valor began to give way before the vigorous assaults of the practiced roman his arm grew tired his eye dizzy he breathed hard and painfully the combatants paused again for breath young man said Emulpus in a low voice desist i will wound thee slightly then lower thy arm thou hast propitiated the editor and the mob 
thou wilt be honorably saved and my father still enslaved groaned Leiden to himself no death or his freedom at that thought and seeing that his strength not being equal to the endurance of the roman everything depended on a sudden and desperate effort he threw himself fiercely on Imolpus. the roman warily retreated Leiden thrust again Imolpus drew himself aside the sword grazed his cuirass Leiden's breast was exposed the roman plunged his sword through the joints of the armor not meaning however to inflict a deep wound Lidon, weak and exhausted fell forward fell right on the point it passed through and through even to the back Imolpus drew forth his blade Lidon still made an effort to regain his balance his sword left his grasp he struck mechanically at the gladiator with his naked hand and fell prostrate on the arena with one accord aedile and assembly made the signal of mercy the officers of the arena approached they took off the helmet of the vanquished he still breathed his eyes rolled fiercely on his foe the savageness he had acquired in his calling glared from his gaze and lowered upon the brow darkened already with the shades of death then with a convulsive groan with a half start he lifted his eyes above they rested not on the face of the aedile nor on the pitying brows of the relenting judges he saw them not they were as if the vast space was desolate and bare one pale agonizing face alone was all he recognized one cry of a broken heart was all that amid the murmurs and the shouts of the populace reached his ear the ferocity vanished from his brow a soft tender expression of sanctifying but despairing filial love played over his features played waned darkened his face suddenly became locked and rigid resuming its form of fierceness and he fell upon the earth look to him said the aedile he has done his duty the officers dragged him off to the spoliarium a true type of glory and of its fate murmured arbaces to himself and his eye glancing around the amphitheater betrayed so much of disdain and scorn that whoever encountered it felt his breath suddenly arrested and his emotions frozen into one sensation of abasement and of awe again rich perfumes were wafted around the theater the attendants sprinkled fresh sand over the arena bring forth the lion and glaucus the athenian said the aedile and a deep and breathless hush of overwrought interest and intense yet strange to say not unpleasing terror lay like a mighty and awful dream over the assembly end of section 44section 45 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 by various authors section 45 the amphitheater from the last days of pompeii part two the door swung gratingly back the gleam of spears shot along the wall glaucus the athenian thy time has come said a loud and clear voice the lion awaits thee i am ready said the athenian brother and co-mate one last embrace bless me and farewell the christian opened his arms he clasped the young heathen to his breast he kissed his forehead and cheek he sobbed aloud his tears flowed fast and hot over the features of his new friend oh could i have converted thee i had not wept oh that i might say to thee we too shall sup this night in paradise it may be so yet answered the greek with a tremulous voice they whom death parts now may yet meet beyond the grave on the earth oh the beautiful the beloved earth farewell forever where the officer i attend you 
Locus tore himself away, and when he came forth into the air, its breath, which, though sunless, was hot and arid, smote withering upon him. His frame, not yet restored from the effects of the deadly draught, shrank and trembled. The officers supported him. Courage, said one. Thou art young, active, well-knit. They give thee a weapon. Despair not, and thou mayest yet conquer. Glaucus did not reply, but ashamed of his infirmity, he made a desperate and convulsive effort and regained the firmness of his nerves. They anointed his body, completely naked, save by a cincture round the loins, placed the stylus, vain weapon, in his hand, and led him into the arena. And now when the Greek saw the eyes of thousands and tens of thousands upon him, he no longer felt that he was mortal. All evidence of fear, all fear itself, was gone. A red and haughty flush spread over the paleness of his features. He towered aloft to the full of his glorious stature. In the elastic beauty of his limbs and form, in his intent but unfrowning brow, in the high disdain, and in the indomitable soul which breathed visibly, which spoke audibly from his attitude, his lip, his eye, he seemed the very incarnation, vivid and corporeal, of the valor of his land, of the divinity of its worship, at once a hero and a god. The murmur of hatred and horror at his crime, which had greeted his entrance, died into the silence of involuntary admiration and half compassionate respect, and with a quick and convulsive sigh that seemed to move the whole mass of life as if it were one body, the gaze of the spectators turned from the Athenian to a dark, uncouth object in the center of the arena. It was the grated den of the lion. "'By Venus, how warm it is!' said Fulvia. "'Yet there is no sun. Would that those stupid sailors could have fastened up that gap in the awning!' "'Oh, it is warm indeed. I turn sick. I faint,' said the wife of Pansa. Even her experienced stoicism giving way at the struggle about to take place. The lion had been kept without food for twenty-four hours, and the animal had, during the whole morning, testified a singular and restless uneasiness which the keeper had attributed to the pangs of hunger, and yet its bearing seemed rather that of fear than of rage. Its roar was painful and distressed. It hung its head, snuffed the air through the bars, then lay down, started again, and again uttered its wild and far-resounding cries and now in its den it lay utterly dumb and mute with distended nostrils forced hard against the grating and disturbing with a heaving breath the sand below on the arena the editor's lip quivered and his cheek grew pale he looked anxiously around hesitated delayed the crowd became impatient slowly he gave the sign the keeper who was behind the den cautiously removed the grating and the lion leaped forth with a mighty and glad roar of release. The keeper hastily retreated through the grated passage leading from the arena, and left the lord of the forest and his prey. Glaucus had bent his limbs so as to give himself the firmest posture at the expected rush of the lion, with his small and shining weapon raised on high, in the faint hope that the one well-directed thrust for he knew that he should have time but for one, might penetrate through the eye to the brain of his grim foe. But to the unutterable astonishment of all, the beast seemed not even aware of the presence of the criminal. At the first moment of its release, it halted abruptly in the arena, raised itself half on end, snuffing the upward air with impatient signs, and then suddenly it sprang forward, but not on the Athenian. At half speed it circled round and round the space, turning its vast head from side to side with an anxious and perturbed gaze, as if seeking only some avenue of escape. Once or twice it endeavored to leap up on the parapet that divided it from the audience, and on falling uttered rather a baffled howl than its deep-toned and kingly roar. It evinced no sign either of wrath or hunger its tail drooped along the sand instead of lashing its gaunt sides and its eye though it wandered at times to glaucus rolled again listlessly from him at length as if tired of attempting to escape it crept with a moan into its cage and once more laid itself down to rest 
the first surprise of the assembly at the apathy of the lion soon grew converted into resentment at its cowardice and the populace already merged their pity for the fate of glaucus into angry compassion for their own disappointment the editor called to the keeper how is this take the goad prick him forth and then close the door of the den as the keeper with some fear but more astonishment was preparing to obey a loud cry was heard at one of the entrances of the arena there was a confusion a bustle voices of remonstrance suddenly breaking forth and suddenly silence at the reply all eyes turned in wonder at the interruption toward the quarter of the disturbance the crowd gave way and suddenly sallust appeared on the senatorial benches his hair disheveled breathless heated half exhausted he cast his eyes hastily round the ring remove the athenian he cried haste he is innocent arrest arbaces the egyptian he is the murderer of apicides art thou mad o sallust said the praetor rising from his seat what means this raving remove the athenian quick or his blood be on your head praetor delay and you answer with your own life to the emperor i bring with me the eye-witness to the death of the priest apicides room there stand back give way people of pompeii fix every eye upon arbaces there he sits room there for the priest Calenus. pale haggard fresh from the jaws of famine and of death his face fallen his eyes dull as a vulture's his broad frame gaunt as a skeleton Calenus was supported into the very row in which arbaces sat his releasers had given him sparingly of food but the chief sustenance that nerved his feeble limbs was revenge the priest Calenus Calenus cried the mob it is he no it is a dead man it is the priest Calenus said the praetor gravely what hast thou to say Arbaces of Egypt is the murderer of Apicides the priest of Isis these eyes saw him deal the blow it is from the dungeon into which he plunged me it is from the darkness and horror of a death by famine that the gods have raised me to proclaim his crime release the athenian he is innocent it is for this then that the lion spared him a miracle a miracle cried the panza a miracle a miracle shouted the people remove the athenian our bases to the lion and that shout echoed from hill to vale from coast to sea our bases to the lion officers remove the accused glaucus remove but guard him yet said the praetor the gods lavish their wonders upon this day as the praetor gave the word of release there was a cry of joy a female voice a child's voice and it was of joy it rang through the heart of the assembly with electric force it was touching it was holy that child's voice and the populace echoed it back with sympathizing congratulation silence said the grave praetor who is there the blind girl Nidia, answered sallust it is her hand that has raised Calenus from the grave and delivered glaucus from the lion of this hereafter said the praetor Calenus, priest of isis thou accusest our basis of the murder of apicides i do thou didst behold the deed praetor with these eyes enough at present the details must be reserved for more suiting time and place our bases of egypt thou hearest the charge against thee thou hast not yet spoken what hast thou to say the gaze of the crowd had been long riveted on our bases but not until the confusion which he had betrayed at the first charge of sallust and the entrance of Calenus had subsided at the shout our bases to the lion he had indeed trembled and the dark bronze of his cheek had taken a paler hue but he had soon recovered his haughtiness and self-control proudly he returned the angry glare of the countless eyes about him and replying now to the question of the praetor he said in that accent so peculiarly tranquil and commanding which characterized his tones praetor this charge is so mad that it scarcely deserves reply my first accuser is the noble sallust the most intimate friend of glaucus my second is a priest i revere his garb and calling but people of pompeii ye know somewhat of the character of Calenus. 
he is gripping and gold thirsty to a proverb the witness of such men is to be bought pretor i am innocent sallust said the magistrate where found you calenus in the dungeons of arbasis egyptian said the pretor frowning thou didst then dare to imprison a priest of the gods and wherefore hear me answered arbaces rising calmly but with agitation visible in his face this man came to threaten that he would make against me the charge he has now made unless i would purchase his silence with half my fortune i remonstrated in vain peace there let not the priest interrupt me noble praetor and ye o people i was a stranger in the land i knew myself innocent of crime but the witness of a priest against me might yet destroy me in my perplexity i decoyed him to the cell whence he has been released on pretence that it was the coffer-house of my gold i resolved to detain him there until the fate of the true criminal was sealed and his threats could avail no longer but i meant no worse i may have erred but who among ye will not acknowledge the equity of self-preservation were i guilty why was the witness of this priest silent at the trial then i had not detained or concealed him why did he not proclaim my guilt when i proclaimed that of glaucus praetor this needs an answer for the rest i throw myself on your laws i demand their protection remove hence the accused and the accuser i will willingly meet and cheerfully abide by the decision of the legitimate tribunal this is no place for further parley he says right said the praetor ho guards remove our bases guard calenus sallust we hold you responsible for your accusation let the sports be resumed what cried calenus turning round to the people shall isis be thus condemned shall the blood of apicides yet cry for vengeance shall justice be delayed now that it may be frustrated hereafter shall the lion be cheated of the lawful prey a god a god i feel the god rush to my lips to the lion to the lion with our bases his exhausted frame could support no longer the ferocious malice of the priest he sank on the ground in strong convulsions the foam gathered to his mouth he was as a man indeed whom a supernatural power had entered the people saw and shuddered it is a god that inspires the holy man to the lion with the egyptian with that cry upsprang unmoved thousands upon thousands they rushed from the heights they poured down in the direction of the egyptian in vain did the aedile command in vain did the praetor lift his voice and proclaim the law the people had been already rendered savage by the exhibition of blood they thirsted for more their superstition was aided by their ferocity aroused inflamed by the spectacle of their victims they forgot the authority of their rulers it was one of those dread popular convulsions common to crowds wholly ignorant half free and half servile and which the peculiar constitution of the roman provinces so frequently exhibited the power of the praetor was a reed beneath the whirlwind still at his word the guards had drawn themselves along the lower benches on which the upper classes sat separate from the vulgar they made but a feeble barrier the waves of the human sea halted for a moment to enable our basis to count the exact moment of his doom in despair and in a terror which beat down even pride he glanced his eye over the rolling and rushing crowd when right above them through the wide chasm which had been left in the valeria he beheld a strange and awful apparition he beheld and his craft restored his courage he stretched his hand on high over his lofty brow and royal features there came an expression of unutterable solemnity and command behold he shouted with a voice of thunder which still the roar of the crowd behold how the gods protect the guiltless the fires of the avenging orcus burst forth against the false witness of my accusers 
the eyes of the crowd followed the gesture of the egyptian and beheld with dismay a vast vapor shooting from the summit of vesuvius in the form of a gigantic pine tree the trunk blackness the branches fire a fire that shifted and wavered in its hues with every moment now fiercely luminous now of a dull and dying red that again blazed terrifically forth with intolerable glare there was a dead heart-sunken silence through which there suddenly broke the roar of the lion which was echoed back from within the building by the sharper and fiercer yells of its fellow beast dread seers were they of the burden of the atmosphere and wild prophets of the wrath to come then there arose on high the universal shrieks of women the men stared at each other but were dumb at that moment they felt the earth shake under their feet the walls of the theatre trembled and beyond in the distance they heard the crash of falling roofs an instant more and the mountain clouds seemed to roll toward them dark and rapid like a torrent at the same time it cast forth from its bosom a shower of ashes mixed with vast fragments of burning stone over the crushing vines over the desolate streets over the amphitheatre itself far and wide with many a mighty splash in the agitated sea felt that awful shower no longer thought the crowd of justice or of our bases safety for themselves were their sole thought each turned to fly each dashing pressing crushing against the other trampling recklessly over the fallen amid groans and oaths and prayers and sudden shrieks the enormous crowd vomited itself forth through the numerous passages whither should they fly some anticipating a second earthquake hastened to their homes to load themselves with their more costly goods and escape while it was yet time others dreading the showers of ashes that now fell fast torrent upon torrent over the streets rushed under the roofs of the nearest houses or temples or sheds shelter of any kind for protection from the terrors of the open air but darker and larger and mightier spread the cloud above them it was a sudden and more ghastly night rushing upon the realm of noon end of section forty five Section 46 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jyoti Taravanath. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6 by various authors section 46 kenam and lily from kenam chillingly the children have come some thirty of them pretty as english children generally are happy in the joy of the summer sunshine on the flower lawns on the feast under cover of an awning suspended between chestnut trees and carpeted with sward no doubt Kenham held his own at the banquet, and did his best to increase the general gaiety, for whenever he spoke the children listened eagerly, and when he had done they laughed mirthfully. The fair face I promised you, whispered Mrs. Brayfield, is not here yet. I have a little note from the young lady to say that Mrs. Cameron does not feel very well this morning, but hopes to recover sufficiently to come later in the afternoon and pray who is mrs cameron ah i forgot that you are a stranger to the place mrs cameron is the aunt with whom lily resides is it not a pretty name lily very emblematic of the spinster that does not spin with a white head and a thin stock then the name belies my lily as you will see the children now finished their feast and betook themselves to dancing in an alley smoothened for a croquet ground under the sound of a violin 
played by the old grandfather of one of the party while mrs brayfield was busying herself with forming the dance kenham seized the occasion to escape from a young nymph of the age of twelve who had sat next to him at the banquet and taken so great a fancy to him that he began to fear she would vow never to forsake his side and stole away undetected there are times when the mirth of others only saddens us especially the mirth of children with high spirits that jar on our own quiet mood gliding through a dense shrubbery in which though the lilacs were faded the laburnum still retained here and there the waning gold of its clusters kenham came into the recess which bounded his steps and invited him to repose it was a circle so formed artificially by slight trellises to which clung parasite roses heavy with leaves and flowers in the midst played a tiny fountain with a silvery murmuring sound at the background dominating the place rose the crests of stately trees on which the sunlight shimmered but which rampired out all horizon beyond even as in life do the great dominant passions love ambition desire of power or gold or fame or knowledge form the proud background to the brief-lived flowerets of our youth lift our eyes beyond the smile of their bloom catch the glint of a loftier sunbeam and yet and yet exclude our sight from the lengths and widths of the space which extends behind and beyond them kenham threw himself on the turf beside the fountain from afar came the whoop and the laugh of the children in their sports or their dance at the distance their joy did not sadden him he marvelled why and thus in musing reverie thought to explain the why to himself the poet so ran his lazy thinking has told us that distance lends enchantment to the view and thus compares to the charm of distance the illusion of hope but the poet narrows the scope of his own illustration distance lends enchantment to the ear as well as to the sight nor to these bodily senses alone memory no less than hope owes its charm to the far away i cannot imagine myself again a child when i am in the midst of yon noisy children but as the noise reaches me here subdued and mellowed and knowing thank heaven that the urchins are not within reach of me i could readily dream myself back into childhood and into sympathy with the lost playfields of school so surely it must be with grief how different the terrible agony for a beloved one just gone from earth to the soft regret for one who disappeared into heaven years ago so with the art of poetry how imperatively when it deals with the great emotions of tragedy it must remove the actors from us in proportion as the emotions are to elevate and the tragedy is to please us by the tears it draws imagine our shock if a poet were to place on the stage some wise gentleman with whom we dined yesterday and who was discovered to have killed his father and married his mother but when oedipus commits those unhappy mistakes nobody is shocked oxford in the nineteenth century is a long way off from thebes three thousand or four thousand years ago and continued kenham plunging deeper into the maze of metaphysical criticism even where the poet deals with persons and things close upon our daily sight if he would give them poetic charm he must resort to a sort of moral or psychological distance the nearer they are to us in external circumstance the farther they must be in some internal peculiarities water and clarissa harlow are described as contemporaries of their artistic creation and with the minutest details of an apparent realism yet 
they are at once removed from our daily lives by their idiosyncrasies and their fates we know that while Werther and clarissa are so near to us in much that we sympathize with them as friends and kinsfolk they are yet as much remote from us in the poetic and idealized side of their natures as if they belong to the age of homer and this it is that invests with charm the very pain which their fate inflicts on us thus i suppose it must be in love if the love we feel is to have the glamour of poetry it must be love for someone morally at a distance from our ordinary habitual selves in short differing from us in attributes which however near we draw to the possessor we can never approach never blend in attributes of our own so that there is something in the loved one that always remains an ideal a mystery a sun-bright summit mingling with the sky from this state half comatose half unconscious kenham was roused slowly reluctantly something struck softly on his cheek again a little less softly he opened his eyes they fell first upon two tiny rosebuds which on striking his face had fallen on his breast and then looking up he saw before him in an opening of the trellised circle a female child's laughing face her hand was still uplifted charged with another rosebud but behind the child's figure looking over her shoulder and holding back the menacing arm was a face as innocent but lovelier far the face of a girl in her first youth framed round with the blossoms that festooned the trellis how the face became the flowers it seemed the fairy spirit of them kenham started and rose to his feet the child the one whom he had so ungallantly escaped from ran towards him through a wicket in the circle her companion disappeared is it you said kenham to the child you who pelted me so cruelly ungrateful creature did i not give you the best strawberries on the dish and all my own cream but why did you run away and hide yourself when you ought to be dancing with me replied the young lady evading with the instinct of her sex all answers to the reproach she had deserved i did not run away and it is clear that i did not mean to hide myself since you so easily found me out but who was the young lady with you i suspect she pelted me too for she seems to have run away to hide herself no she did not pelt you she wanted to stop me and you would have had another rosebed oh so much bigger if she had not held back my arm don't you know her don't you know lily no so that is lily you shall introduce me to her by this time they had passed out of the circle through the little wicket opposite the path by which kenham had entered and opening at once on the lawn here at some distance the children were grouped some reclined on the grass some walking to and fro in the interval of the dance before he had reached the place mrs brayfield met him lily is come i know it i have seen her is not she beautiful i must see more of her if i am to answer critically but before you introduce me may i be permitted to ask who and what is lily mrs brayfield passed a moment before she answered and yet the answer was brief enough not to need much consideration she is a miss mordaunt an orphan and as i before told you resides with her aunt mrs cameron a widow they have the prettiest cottage you ever saw on the banks of the river or rather rivulet about a mile from this place mrs cameron is a very good simple-hearted woman as to lily i can praise her beauty only with safe conscience 
for as yet she is a mere child, her mind quite unformed. Did you ever meet any man, much less any woman, whose mind was formed? muttered Kenham. I am sure mine is not, and never will be on this earth. Mrs. Brayfield did not hear this low-voiced observation. She was looking about for Lily, and perceiving her at last as the children who surrounded her were dispersing to renew the dance, she took Kenham's arm, led him to the young lady, and a formal introduction took place. Formal as it could be on those sunlit awards, amidst the joy of summer and the laugh of children, in such scene and such circumstance, formality does not last long. I know not how it was, but in a very few minutes, Kenham and Lily had ceased to be strangers to each other. They found themselves seated apart from the rest of the merry-makers, on the bank shadowed by lime-trees, the man listening with downcast eyes, the girl with mobile shifting glances, now on earth, now on heaven, and talking freely, gaily, like the babble of a happy stream, with a silvery dulcet voice and a sparkle of rippling smiles. No doubt this is a reversal of the formalities of well-bred life and conventional narrating thereof. According to them, no doubt it is for the man to talk and the maid to listen, but I state the facts as they were, honestly. And Lily knew no more of the formalities of drawing-room life than a skylark fresh from its nest knows of the song-teacher in the cage. She was still so much of a child. Mrs. Brayfield was right. Her mind was still so unformed. What she did talk about in that first talk between them that could make the meditative Kenham listen so mutely, so intently, I know not. At least I could not jot it down on paper. I fear it was very egotistical, as the talk of children generally is, about herself and her aunt and her home and her friends, all her friends seemed children like herself, though younger, Clemmy the chief of them. Clemmy was the one who had taken a fancy to Kenham, and amidst all the ingenious prattle there came flashes of a quick intellect, a lively fancy, nay, even a poetry of expression of sentiment. It might be the talk of a child, but certainly not of a silly child. But as soon as the dance was over, the little ones again gathered around Lily. Evidently she was the prime favourite of them all, and as her companions had now become tired of dancing, new sports were proposed, and Lily was carried off to prisoners' bays. "'I am very happy to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Chillingly,' said a frank, pleasant voice, and a well-dressed, good-looking man held out his hand to Kenham. "'My husband,' said Mrs. Brayfield, with a certain pride in our look. Kenham responded cordially to the civilities of the master of the house, who had just returned from the city office, and left all his cares behind him. You had only to look at him to see that he was prosperous and deserved to be so. There were in his countenance the signs of strong sense, of good humour, above all, of an active, energetic temperament. A man of broad, smooth forehead, keen hazel eyes, firm lips and jaw, with a happy contentment in himself, his house, the world in general, mantling over his genial smile, and outspoken in the metallic ring of his voice. "'You will stay and dine with us, of course,' said Mr. Brayfield, "'and unless you want very much to be in town to-night, I hope uh, you will take a bed here.' Kenham hesitated. "'Do stay at least till to-morrow,' said Mrs. Brayfield. Kenham hesitated still, and while hesitating his eyes rested on Lily, leaning on the arm of a middle-aged lady, and approaching the hostess, evidently, to take leave. "'I cannot resist so tempting an invitation,' said Kenham. 
and he fell back a little behind Lily and her companion. "'Thank you very much for so pleasant a day,' said Mrs. Cameron to the hostess. "'Lily has enjoyed herself extremely. I only regret we could not come earlier.' If you are walking home, said Mrs. Brayfield, let me accompany you. I want to speak to your gardener about his heart's ease. It is much finer than mine. If so, said Kenham to Lily, may I come too? Of all flowers that grow, heart's ease is the one I most prize. A few minutes afterward, Kenham was walking by the side of Lily along the banks of a little stream tributary to the Thames, Mrs. Cameron and Mr. Brayfield in advance, for the path only held two abreast. Suddenly Lily left his side, allured by a rare butterfly, I think it is called the Emperor of Morocco, that was sunning its yellow wings upon a group of wild reeds. She succeeded in capturing this wanderer in her straw hat over which she drew her son veil. After this notable capture, she returned demurely to Kenham's side. "'Do you collect insects?' said that philosopher, as much surprised as it was his nature to be at anything. "'Only butterflies,' answered Lily. "'They are not insects, you know. They are souls.' "'Emblems of souls, you mean?' at least so the greek prettily represented them to be no real souls the souls of infants that die in their cradles unbaptized and if they are taken care of and not eaten by birds and live a year then they pass on into fairies it is a very poetical idea miss mordaunt and founded on evidence quite as rational as other assertions of the metamorphosis of one creature into another perhaps you can do what the philosophers cannot tell me how you learned a new idea to be an incontestable fact i don't know replied lily looking very much puzzled perhaps i learned it in a book or perhaps i dreamed it you could not make a wiser answer if you were a philosopher. But you talk of taking care of butterflies. How do you do that? Do you impale them on pins stuck into a glass case? Impale them? How can you talk so cruelly? You deserve to be pinched by the fairies. I am afraid, thought Kenham compassionately that my companion has no mind to be formed what is euphoniously called an innocent he shook his head and remained silent lily resumed i will show you my collection when we get home they seem so happy i am sure there are some of them who know me they will feed from my hand I have only had one die since I began to collect them last summer. Then you must have kept them a year. They ought to have turned into fairies. I suppose many of them have. Of course, I let out all those that had been with me twelve months. They don't turn into fairies in the cage, you know. Now I have only those I caught this year or last autumn. The prettiest don't appear till the autumn. The girl here bent her uncovered head over the straw hat, her tresses shadowing it, and uttered loving words to the prisoner. Then again she looked up and around her, and abruptly stopped and exclaimed, "'How can people live in towns? How can people say they are ever dull in the country? Look,' she continued, gravely and earnestly, "'look at that tall pine tree.' with its long branch sweeping over the water. See how, as a breeze catches it, it changes its shadow, and how the shadow changes the play of the sunlight on the brook. Wave your tops, ye pines, with every plant in sign of worship wave. 
what an interchange of music there must be between nature and a poet kenham was startled this an innocent this a girl who had no mind to be formed in that presence he could not be cynical could not speak of nature as a mechanism a lying humbug as he had done to the man poet he replied gravely the creator has gifted the whole universe with language but few are the hearts that can interpret it happy those to whom it is no foreign tongue acquired imperfectly with care and pain but rather a native language learned unconsciously from the lips of the great mother to them the butterfly's wing may well buoy into heaven a fairy soul when he had thus said lily turned and for the first time attentively looked into his dark soft eyes then instinctively she laid her light hand on his arm and said in a low voice talk on talk thus i like to hear you but kenham did not talk on they had now arrived at the garden gate of mrs cameron's cottage and the elder persons in advance paused at the gate and walked with them to the house end of volume 6 end of section 46 recording by jyoti taravnat end of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6